understood. It was going to be just another normal day, another day of living the American dream, of being rich, still pretty young, and living in a Beverly Hills mansion. And then, of course, their day would suddenly come to uh, anything but a normal end. Their lives would end unexpectedly in an incredibly violent fashion. The couple were relaxing in their living room, watching a movie, and eating some ice cream that night. They seemed to be in the midst of a fairy tale life, wealthy, seemingly destined for so much more wealth, still only in their mid 40s. Jose, just 45. Kitty, only 47. They'd spent the day before on a shark hunting expedition on a chartered yacht with their two sons, Lyle, 21, and Eric, 18. Jose was an upper level entertainment exec who made millions a year. He'd worked hard to get there. He'd come to America from Cuba as a teenager after the Cuban Revolution, determined to succeed in our massive free market economy. He'd worked as a dishwasher in the early days of his marriage, truly started at the bottom. From the outside, the two of them seemed to embody the American dream. Their hard work paid off. Their young, attractive sons were primed for careers in the same industry as their dad if they wanted it. Their surroundings luxurious, more than comfortable, and then in a flash, it was all over. When police got to the house, they found a gruesome crime scene. Jose and Kitty had been shot over a dozen times in the head and body. They'd been shot through their kneecaps. It looked like a professional execution. Their American dream had come to a bloody end. And at the center of it all was Lyle and Eric, two young men who seemed to be grieving initially, but quickly went and spent around $700,000 of their inheritance on anything they wanted. A restaurant, multiple cars, Rolexes, expensive vacations, and all that seemed suspicious to the police especially when they couldn't find anyone on the outside of the family who would have wanted Jose and Kitty dead. And when the crime scene evidence did not suggest a professional execution, but rather murder staged to look like professional executions, they started to wonder, could it be that Lyle and Eric had killed their own parents? It was well known that Lyle and Eric had their struggles, both with the law, which Jose's money had always stepped in to fix, and also in their personal lives. Was it really possible that the Menendez brothers were true sociopaths capable of killing their parents for their inheritance. A lot of evidence would point to yes. But a few years after Lyle and Eric were charged with the crimes, after confessing to a psychiatrist who taped the conversations, a different story would suddenly emerge at the trial. Lyle and Eric would say that they had to kill their parents. It was self-defense, essentially, because Kitty and Jose had been sexually abusing them for years. The abuse was going to continue. Eric would even say that he snuck cinnamon into his father's coffee because he'd heard it made semen taste better. Was that the truth? What was actually going on inside the Menendez home? Could it be that Jose and Kitty's American dream was a whole lot darker than anyone thought? Or were the sexual abuse allegations part of a web of lies told by two true sociopaths who thought that their money and privilege could get them out of anything? The full twisted story of the Menendez brothers told right here today on another true crime edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, you beautiful bastards. How's life? How's 2021 treating you? How's 2022 looking? Good, I hope. Happy Thanksgiving, by the way, to my American suckers. I hope you get some solid turkey. I hope it isn't dry. I hope whoever cooked it, you know, didn't get lazy and not make the gravy. And if you don't like turkey, well, eat some ham then. Put a pineapple glaze on it. Feast. You don't eat meat? You know what? Well, fuck you then. Get your toe furky and eat it alone, sitting in a porta potty like the piece of shit you are. I'm sorry. That was too much. That was uncalled for. What do I care what you eat? It's none of my business, frankly, and I'm ashamed of myself for overstepping like that. Uh, but I do hope you get some pumpkin pie because I love you. And if my mom's taught me anything, it's that food is love, especially sugary food. Anyway, uh, I'm Dan Cummins, Master Sucker. Mushmouth King, turkey eater, gravy lover, cranberry sauce connoisseur. I was going to say cranberry sauce connoisseur because, of course, I was. The cheap canned jelly is the best. And this is Time Suck. Uh, hail Nimrod, may we uh, all live forever in your balls. Hail Lucifina, may we come in this life and the next. Praise Mojangles, you're a good boy. And I hope you get all the mashed potatoes you want, but stay away from the turkey bones because they can splinter. They can choke you. And Triple M. Thank you for the many holiday classics you've recorded that we can tastefully begin to listen to on Friday after Thanksgiving, but not a moment before. It's too much. Amen or something. How about no announcements today, huh? Other than I hope I had fun in Denver and Loveland, recorded this show before I flew to Denver. Thanks to all of you who bought tickets. Uh, appreciate it. I had to add a, uh, an extra show in Denver because a lot of you wanted to come laugh. And uh, yeah. the show in Loveland a while back. So hot damn. Next. That's been fun. And now I got Dear a lot God. of information. 
to throw at you. Oh I hope my you find God. it as interesting as I do. This big old oh, true sure. crime suck. That is a loud. I haven't noticed. You know what? I know how to lower it. While the murders of Jose and Kitty Menendez happened in 1989, it was a 1993 trial that made this case a national sensation. 89 and 93. Turn it the biggest two years for today's here. episode. Let's let's learn about the youth culture in America. I didn't even know it was so loud. 1989, later, Michael no. Keaton's Batman. <laughs> this is the year's top box office draw. This is the movie Lyle and Eric initially claimed to be watching it. while they're... The parents were I knew killed. you'd love it. That man took in just over two hundred fifty oh million dollars in the box office. How have you been, Jack Nicholson, Joker, Kim Basinger? I mean, I knew you draw. You drew. Actually, Kim Basinger. Uh, uh, Rain but Man, Indiana I hope Jones, Last well. Crusade, Dead Poet Society, Pet Cemetery, Lethal Weapon Two, Honey, I Shrunk the Good Kids, choice. Ghostbusters <laughs> Two, <laughs> Halloween Five, The Burbs, several other noteworthy nineteen eighty nine movies, and The Burbs. One of one of my favorite eighties movies. A Tom Hanks hidden. Gem. I have actually watched Hanks the Burbs. Uh, I Tom I would say it's a, of, uh, it's Tom an all right movie. movie. It's, it's not, not the greatest Tom movie Hanks movie. movie. Ricky Butler, the pervy meatball next door. Uh, Bobby Brown's "Don't Be Cruel" was the year's top selling album in '89. Holy shit! That I have my prerogative memorized off that album. The video of Bobby dancing in a headset microphone. That I hope you're doing well, 89. by the way. And yes, I rock that shit. Hope everything's been going bump. well. Everybody's talking. Uh, intestinal distress, but otherwise, all right. Oh, no! Tum-tum no. problems? What happened? What'd you eat? You're not a surgeon and you board everything. That's my prerogative. It's my prerogative. And he just fucking dance. Hopefully not. Way that I want to live. It's my prerogative. Right? Fucking sliding back and forth in her poofy pants. Uh, Madonna's Like a Prayer? Another huge album. Oh, I thought she was so sexy in 1989. My God. Really knew what sexy was. She was sexy. Hail to Christina. Life is a mystery. Everyone must stand Whoa. alone. I hear you call my name, and it feels like home. So sultry. She was sexy as fuck back in 1989. Uh, thanks to Columbia House and BMG Record Clubs, I had all those albums on cassette. Put my turbo boost on in my bass button. <laughs> it was uh, feeling like I was hot shit. It only required about 75, uh, you know, D batteries to get that thing to work for about 45 minutes. Now, that was the trick with the boombox, is the batteries. 12 albums for a penny. No, no, we too much dairy to today. No! Later, which, uh, I didn't. My no, friends didn't either. too much dairy. Clubs, oh, clubs, no. You know, store houses, but we were kids, so they would give up. Too much milkies. Uh, Can't have good, it. Nine Inch Nails, Pretty Hate Machine. Tom oh, my goodness. Feet, this rabbit is too cute. I'm sorry, man. I had chocolate pudding that I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I, I want chocolate pudding. It's the holiday season. I want it. Double Dragon was the top arcade game. Super Mario Brothers 3, top Nintendo game. As far as TV went, kids were loving Family Matters, Urkel, Saved by the Bell, Screech. Those fucking nerds were on TV all the time. Uh, Major Dad, Doogie Howser. You were just, popular with the, you were having cool way too culture. much fun today. The Simpsons made their TV debut. I'm sorry your tum tum not feel good. the cool. Tracy Ullman show in December that year, the Berlin Wall came down. Big oversized bomber jackets worn over t-shirts all the rage. As were loose fitting acid wash jeans, spandex bicycle shorts. I forgot. God, I hate rings. that shit. Lots of black lace. That fucking black lace shirt, black lace gloves, black lace dresses. I hate that like eighty nine. The eighties define us so much more Shoulder than pads, uh, white leggings, the nineteen nineties. Poofy hair scrunchies, crimping irons, putting so much fucking hairspray into their hair. The infamous wall of bangs on the girls' feathered bangs, cool as fuck for the dudes. A lot of today's teen fashion, very late 80s, early 90s influenced. And then in 90, 90, uh, 93, you know, things shift a bit. Uh, mostly, it's okay. thanks Tomorrow to Michael Mother and fucking an hour McDonald's early than normal. No! Shifting, an eye out. Fuck that. So you probably have to go to bed in just a bit. Mm -hmm. Damn it. Time is a riddle. I don't know. Today was all right. It, I don't know. I, don't rush your life. Sometimes I, I read I, into things too McDonald's much. And fucking sad to think about, actually. That's I read wrong. into things too much, and uh, I'm like, they hate me. I know that. 
anything culturally in 1993. 9.30 uh, to 6 p.m. Ugh. Look, competes with like games, what? Rap, routine, fashion, Sometimes I read into youth dominance, uh, things too much, and, and I just feel like... Mid-80s. Spread nationwide uh, the thanks person to the popularity of bands like above Nirvana, me, Sound Garden, uh, hates Pearl me, Jam, and uh, hates Duck me. Martin, Combat he Boots, secretly hates me. Work, uh, worn work and jeans, I just have this feeling tones, hemp, leather, chain breaks, about it. The classic leather wallet I just have that feeling. I, was, I, was never I know cool that it's not. I wore the other shit. While a lot of 80s fashion came out of sunshine in the gym, right? Lifting weights, aerobic studios, Southern California, the beach, all bright and fun, cheery, grunge. Flip that shit around. I probably it's it's probably Darkness, not true. Right? Rain, gangster rap. You know, also I dark. I don't know. Uh, Maybe it is. Shit. You know, uh, fuck the gym, fuck my life, everything sucks. Let's go get stoned. No, no. The eighties was all about uppers, and it was cocaine. Nineties. Uh, no, no. There's we, there's no we really actual grunge, reason terrible. that he would hate me. Into the dark fashion. I vibes, just grunge, have a feeling. Sports, uh, sports team jackets and starter baseball caps. Just. You know, the last interaction we had, he was very curt with me. Huge white t-shirts, big baggy four-way And maybe it's just we were just trying to get out of there as quickly as possible. Halfway off to boxers, Fat Farm, Jenko, Echo Unlimited, Timberland boots, Tangle cap, Fubu, everything. Everyone trying to look like Tupac. And then when we walked out, the box office. Over nine. Didn't really talk to me or anything like that. Mrs. Doubtfire. Yay, Robin Williams. Uh, distant but he might have just been just tired. I don't know. $1 million. Some other notable films that year. Uh, the yeah. Fugitive. Schindler's List. Indecent Proposal. Sleepless Are in Seattle. Are they picking on you? Menace no. Society, not. Philadelphia. Not really course, picking on me. Not really uh, getting on my... Not uh, trying to... Houston soundtrack for the body Just guard. trying to... Uh, by far. It just feels uh, like they're forget? avoiding me. It actually came out in It feels like they're avoiding to talk to me. And I... And Maybe I'm just reading into I, it. Maybe I, they literally have no idea what, uh, like, if I brought this up to them, they probably, get I, I get this way some night Brown, times. I've got a good, couples. I've got a feeling, whoo that tonight's going to be a good album. night, that Pearl tonight's going to be a Don't good, good me, night. Daughter, not to They're not really picking on me. I'm just, I don't know, I just... Sometimes I just get this way. Sometimes it's literally they, like I'm like, oh, they probably hate me and stuff like that. And then they're just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's such a great album. Today is a great day. But I mean, I'm not the only one that feels that way sometimes. Some some people believe that for me. With where they're like, oh man, goat goat just hates me. Cypress Hills, Black Sunday. Snoop yeah, Dogg, I do get in a head, style, bad headspace. Tupac One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Holler if you hear me. Sitcoms, Full House, and Family Matters still going strong, but now Seinfeld is pretty popular. Street Fighter, two, five, six, seven, and Echo, Super Nintendo, aka Super No Also wildly popular in 1993, with all this other stuff going on, is the trial of the Menendez brothers. Two handsome rich kids who seem to have had it all. Uh, and kids like me, 89, 93, that era, uh, living in little towns in quote-unquote flyover states like Idaho, which is such an elitist, dismissive label, by the way. Used of course by I don't. Coastal no, there's just... Years. Uh, kids like me, there's a lot of people who think that my that my indifference means I mean, that, oh, like I didn't like their trial. thing, like or like, I don't like them anymore, or something like that. Like, uh, like LA, McChungus LA, Among Us last night, he thought that, um, that I was mad Fresh at Prince him. Beverly Hills, right? Led by young Will Smith. Uh, and I literally had no idea what he was talking about. Watched all the time. Like second show I watched, he uh, literally Hills, thought uh, he thought I was Hills, super uh, pissed at him, up. and Beverly I was Hills ending stream because of him, and so I was literally away, like, no, I'm ending stream because out. I'm tired. We were so poor, the only way I'm ending watch, stream because uh, I'm very sleepy. Using a satellite to scrambler to avoid pain. No, I like you, Nick. Another very popular show, You're a really funny guy, and you really uh you don't bother me. You you try to have fun, you try to you try to encourage me as best you can. All the best stores, latest fashion, no other city in America defined the combination of cool 
and affluence. Oh my lord, you were so Hill. sleepy goody man. Stone yeah. Throw from both Hollywood and Malibu. Fuck yeah. Yes, bro. I was very Again, sleepy. And I am a very trial. sometimes I, I become a sleepy goody man and I cannot uh, I cannot stay up forever. <laughs> You climb up from humble beginnings. Neither one of them came from wealth to accomplish I need to set up my Kofi. Uh, I really do need to set up my Kofi here so that people. But I, I want to put shit up there and not just be like, yeah, go there, send me money. It's like I want to, I want to put things there so that people don't feel like they have to give me money. Or does something else go on? America was just starting to get truly fascinated with true crime in 1993. Weird to think now, with true crime coverage being so pervasive, uh, that not long ago there wasn't nearly as much interest as there currently is. Of course, oh, yeah. TV and their coverage of the Menendez brothers really uh, helped establish that interest. Court TV, which televised the trial, had just debuted in the summer of 1991. It was America's first true crime network, focusing on true crime documentaries, legal dramas, coverage of prominent criminal cases all day, every day. In the Menendez Brothers murder trial, that was Court TV's first big hit. I set up a coffee by accident show, when I wanted to send Olivia network. Munns. Ah, oh, so that trial, happened. Which would have been an but you got a Kofi? Or which would be? You've got a Kofi? I've uh, got a Kofi. Set the stage for the media hype around Simpson's trial. The Menendez trial proved that people would tune in day in and day out, right, for a sensational trial. By the time the Simpsons trial came along, uh, for Simpson, mm, hello, the little bunny. Uh, There's a bunny under my feet, I mean, and he wants pets. He is demanding pets. Unscripted entertainment. The Menendez trial helped pave the way for the popularity we have now of reality TV, alongside MTV's The Real World. That I'm not year, posting it. Before, not until I get affiliate and a PC uh, streaming rate. Televised real That's life. totally fine. It's more compelling than televised fiction. That's By totally fine. More than 1.3 million people were tuning in daily to watch <laughs> hour after hour after hour of testimony and legal minutia in the courtroom. Coverage that turned judges, lawyers, and witnesses into celebrities, making the coverage part of the overall memory of the case. Court TV's tagline at the time was, if Court TV were any more addictive, it would be illegal. Noice. A certain trial moments became a part of 1993 pop culture. October of 1993, Saturday Night Live. Hey, just wondering if you got your brother, photos printed. Dedicated an almost eight-minute-long sketch for the coverage. John Malkovich played Lyle. Rob Schneider played Eric. Young Rob Schneider. Mike Myers played a court TV reporter. Julia Sweeney from nearby Spokane, Washington, actually, uh, played an attorney. In this sketch, Malkovich mocks Lyle crying and blames the murder of their parents on previously unknown fellow brothers, Danny and Jose Menendez. Is it true your father never allowed your other two brothers, Danny and Jose Jr., out of the house? Mm. Yes. And that he never allowed them to go to school? Yes. Never had them in family pictures or mentioned them to friends? Yes. No driver's licenses, no birth certificates, no social security cards? My father said Danny and Jose Jr. didn't deserve to have any official records of their existence because they were weak and not good tennis players. <sighs> that sketch kills me. Uh, the Brothers would show up again in pop culture, uh, later parodied in the 1996 dark comedy The Cable Guy. Ben Stiller, plain brother Sam and Stan Sweet, the former of whom is accused of murdering the latter in an ongoing background gag and the Jim Carrey, Matthew Broderick, dark comedy. And while uh, never stated, tonight, you know, uh, but just uh, officially, me. the character strongly appeared to be based on <laughs> Lyle Merritt. Uh, uh, director and writer Oliver Stone me was fascinated so by the media obsession that, uh, with the uh, Menendez trial, just right, and it would influence uh, his I creation of the cult motivation. classic no! Woody Harrelson, Juliette Lewis film, Natural no! Born Killers. God, I also love Juliette no! Lewis. Hell, no! Lewis Athena. She just seems so no! good. The Don't lose motivation. January of 1994, the general public for the most part lost interest in the brothers. Your no cameras taken. were allowed in the courtroom for their second trial, Let, uh, which began on October 11, 1995. The public's morbid curiosity could no longer be continually fed. No. And I don't know they wouldn't hungry for the case anyway. They'd already moved on to O.J. Simpson and his double homicide trial. 
Fled on the freeway and that infamous Take Bronco on June 17th, 94. Your incredible this controversial, not guilty verdict will be handed down on October so 5th nice. the following year after infamous moments People like, you know, trying to get the glove you, on, the fit, you Just quit. hanging out with you. Other theatrics. They love it. Hugh Menendez documentaries, melodramas, and true crime episodes followed in the last years of the 20th century. Early years of the 21st century, they've you know continued to trickle in over like the years. Me, but real just, widespread uh, pop know, culture interest would not return until earlier this year, when the Menendez brothers went viral on TikTok. While Lyle and Eric's accusations of sexual abuse were widely mocked by young and old alike back in '93, like uh, they were mocked in this uh, you know Saturday Night Live sketch, the 2021 TikTok crowd seems to view things very differently. The overwhelming majority of TikTok users weighing in on accusations seem to think that a the brothers were for sure, sexually abused by their parents, especially their father, yeah, uh -huh. significantly for a long uh, period TikTok of time. TikTok knows that the, B, all. Jose and Kitty deserve getting murdered because of the sexual abuse. A few moments later. And C, the brothers served too much time behind bars uh, or have served too much time already and should be freed immediately. Several media outlets have recently uh, written about numerous influential TikTokers coming to the defense fuck. of Lyle and Eric. Fuck, no. The majority of my generation tended to see them as greedy sociopaths and proven liars. Willing to kill their own parents to avoid the possibility of being cut out of their parents' will. Holy of, uh, the current shit, generation TikTok is fucking see them as stupid. Definitely being the victims of years of sexual abuse. And killing their parents, you know, was a violent and justified reaction to that abuse. Murder is a way to protect themselves. No. And put an end to the abuse once and for all. As of November 15th, 2021, uh, Change.org uh, petition asking for a new trial for the brothers has 288 uh, one thousand. Oh my God. Two hundred eighty-eight hundred thousand. One hundred eighty-eight yeah, electronic and, signatures. Yeah, and I had numbers work. You shouldn't uh, follow any of it. TikTok is filled with moment, people unlikely. that are just trying to get uh, viewed Since immediately. Since we visited Matt's side or Matt's side no, here on Time Stuff, I don't post on and it. And Kemper killed but it's uh, there. Said grandparents when he was a teenager. Yeah. And he killed his mom. You know, several years later. Mother, why do you make me so angry? Lizzie Borden. Even though she was found not guilty, likely killed her father and stepmom with an axe. Yeah. We looked at that back in October of 2018. There are numerous theories as to why she did that back in August of 1892. One is that her dad had been sexually abusing her and that her stepmom turned a blind eye towards the abuse. Very similar to the Menendez brothers' defense team's main strategy no. in that first trial, employed almost exactly 100 years later. Matricide. The killing of one's mother. Patricide. The killing of one's father. Very okay. rare crimes. And killing both almost never happens. Very hard to find an example of a child killing both their mother and father. One of the only other examples in modern American history I could find actually occurred right here in Idaho. Sarah Marie Johnson. She grew up in Belgium now, near Ketchum and okay. the Sun Valley Ski Resort. So the same neck of the woods. Where the I Dr. think Joe Pace people in TikTok How weird is that? are they knew each other, went to school together. mentally ill. She was in the class below Joe. They were in the same communion class. Don't about know what the fuck they're talking Crazy about. Crazy that he actually knew her on September second. There are so-called experts she took on there. Uh, that are full of shit. Winchester model, seven uh, volt axe and our children. Her parents' guest house. They don't know what they're Walked talking about. Bedroom, shot her mom in the head. They don't know sleeping, who they are. And shot her dad in the chest. And they're just following trends to get popular. And why? Because they had forbid her and, from dating local 19 year old. Uh, they should not Santos. be influencing Seriously. our culture that at all. The only reason. They or should not be connected to our culture and, in know, the slightest. He was living. And I think 100, it's just and, like you know, the YouTube uh, craze. We were talking a lot of that time. But and there faster are a lot of holes. And more and annoying. No confirmed whereabouts. Like so many. I'm not saying he should be investigated, but I do think just it might like be. Just like you didn't you know, follow for, uh, people that did dumb you shit watch. on YouTube. But seriously, why are you now following them in prison, on uh, TikTok? Women's Correctional Center just like the, such a fucking the people crime. who pointed a Never fucking Glock. Maybe it or, no, maybe, what know. was it? No, it was a deagle, still have a hard time uh, which, which is not actually a desert eagle. I don't actually know the term. They want him to have more of a motive. But Lady Sarah killed her pointed parents for forbidding her from dating loaded a dude. Deagle she, uh, at her you know, boyfriend would have likely just been able to keep on dating on the sly until she turned 18 anyway. While and just he was holding out a phone wanted. book. Joe says her ex-boyfriend, you know, Bruno, and, piece of shit. Uh, decided to she got into uh, be like, him in yep, the face, this makes sense. Locker, and she and shot him with the, uh, with the deagle. The following week. He asked for it. Like Joe maybe and uh, killed him. 
Sarah killed, killed him instantaneously. You probably would have broken up with. I know. Anyway. Pop him up. Joe says she always seemed like a nice uh, kid. No record of Alder crazy behavior previous. Make decent content she for TikTok, that. as does Olivia Murr. I think Murr as a, uh, a, as a means of, money. of expressing themselves Sometimes and engaging their viewers. Sometimes with no history of violence or randomly uh, or seemingly randomly commit the most cold-blooded crimes. There's exceptions to the sludge. Yes, there is exceptions to the sludge. I'm not saying that all TikTokers are fucking idiots. for years. Gave them Most a, TikTokers you know, a, a are much fucking stronger idiots. motive to kill. Sexual abuse at the hands of a parent. I mean, that is literally a horrific. Violation. People have been hurt. I think of Fred and Rose West by uh, TikTok abuse, trends. You know, their children. There was a trend savagely, but even uh, to get rid of those of us with uh, good parents. Man, female we are lucky. neck fat. None of us get to pick who our parents are. Uh, and it was by the doing hands were dealt, slight right? little my, how neck exercises. Some of us born into homes uh, ran by adults which who are intelligent, put pe- uh, women supportive. in hospitals, nurturing. I'm not kidding. Financially this successful, did happen. Able to provide incredible opportunities. Uh, Some and it was homes a ran TikTok by people who were judgmental, cruel, ignorant, dangerous, negative, it was, emotionally or physically it's abusive, so sometimes sexually ludicrous. abusive. Also, that, that parents, people would follow this. It's so dog. crazy. Other side of the same coin. It doesn't get talked about nearly as much. I mean, sure, you can steer them a considerable right? amount towards being good citizens right? of the world, it but nurture only goes so far. Nature is also powerful. Because they were trying to get rid of their neck hand. fat. Every once in a while, they were following TikTok. True fucking sociopath. What if Jose and Kitty Menendez were dealt two sociopaths? Two kids who saw them at the end of the day. TikTok has done much more, more harm than, than good. And when they and thought they were going to stop spitting out cash unless they took a fucking <laughs> shotgun to them. What if that's what happened? How tragic is that? Work your ass off, build an amazing life for not just yourselves but your children, then have those children kill you in your home. Is that what happened here? For most of their lives, at least, it doesn't appear that Jose and Kitty Menendez were afraid of their sons, Eric and Lyle. They had no reason for uh, the majority of their childhoods to think that they're to worry about them killing them. They must have been so shocked when they walked up on them, and fired those shotguns. They'd been disappointed in them in moments previously, for sure. Uh, quite a few, actually. What parent isn't uh, from time to time disappointed with their kids' choices? Right? They were disappointed when Lyle got suspended from Princeton, uh, when he damaged property, got into legal trouble. They were concerned that the boy they thought they'd raised to become a big-time exec, like his dad, seemed more interested in partying with his buddies, buying luxury goods with mommy and daddy's money, and playing tennis. They were concerned that their younger son, Eric, was a weak-willed pushover. They weren't scared of him. They did think their sons were way too entitled to money they hadn't made, to a lifestyle they hadn't worked for, the respect they hadn't earned. You know, They created those entitled monsters, in my opinion. And they were now, uh, you know, concerned about how entitled they seemed to be. Years of getting their sons out of scrapes, paying people off to protect their brothers' reputations had not, of course, created two responsible young men with a lot of integrity, self-discipline, and respect for the world around them. They've been taught that they could just get away with anything they wanted, with a combination of charm, appearances, and, of course, money. Did that lesson tragically backfire on the people who taught them that lesson? Maybe. It seems whether the abuse was real or not, oh, they become I'll so entitled they thought they could get away with their parents' no, murder. I'll see you later. It's Jose and Kitty um, finally to learn, the ultimatum but I'm here to keep your viewer count up and, and get you closer Lyle to your Eric, dreams. 21, Thank you, Nick. 18, not quite 19. Get some rest, man. To react to that ultimatum I hope that my murder. sweet, the night of August 20th, angelic 1989, they came into the living room where Jose and Kitty were dozing, watched the movie, started firing. Jose and Kitty, not so much killed as rendered nearly completely unidentifiable. 15 rounds of two 12 gauge shotguns. Then for the following months, Lyle and Eric would pretend you know, to be grieving sons while they pointed fingers at the mafia. Usual the things. murders went on ridiculous spending sprees, racking up, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in bills for watches, luxury cars, pro tennis coaches, and more. They behaved as if they'd committed the perfect crime and they'd never get caught. They spent money, lots of money. Didn't seem to care if it made them look suspicious or not. Despite all the lavish spending, they probably would have gotten away with the murders. I don't know what then this Eric is confessed for. to his therapist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. And then right. that uh, guy uh, told his mistress, and then she told the cops, and then Lyle and Eric's big spending spree and lavish living came to a grinding halt. That's the overview. Let's get into the nitty-gritty now. Let's meet the main players involved. I'm curious if you'll come to the same conclusion I did about Lyle and Eric. Manipulative and murderous sociopaths willing to kill their parents just to get unsupervised access to all that money, or traumatized victims murdering their abusers in some version of self-defense. Or some combination of both of those. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, let's dive into today's Time Suck Timeline. Try to answer these questions. Uh, before uh, I do, note that uh, for much of the timeline information, we relied on one source. I mean, definitely looked at a variety of other sources, but there was one main source uh, that details you know, what happened behind closed doors in the Menendez family more than any other source. It's the uh, book, The Menendez Murders, 
the shocking untold story of the Menendez family and the killings that stunned the nation by Robert Rand. Journalist Rand, who originally reported on the case for the Miami Herald and Playboy, followed the Menendez murders from the beginning, has continued investigating and interviewing key sources to this day. The only reporter who covered the original investigation as well as the later trial and continues to cover them, you know, now. So if there's any information hmm. where you're like, how could you have known that? Well, I probably got it from Bobby Randy. I mean, Bobby Randy. I mean, Handy Randy. I mean, Robert Randy. Now let's dive in. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On May 6, 1944, Jose Enrique Menendez, a man who became the father of Eric Lau Menendez, born into a prosperous family in Havana, Cuba. His father, Jose Francisco Pepin Menendez, uh, Pepin, like his, his nickname, was a well known soccer player in Cuba who owned his own accounting firm. Ma Maria Carlotta uh, Yanio Navarro Menendez was a swimmer, He'd been elected to Cuba's Sports Hall of Fame. Good athletes. Jose himself would become an elite swimmer, all kinds of crazy athletes in the Menendez family tree. Uh, poor Maria. She would uh, live until 2009, long enough to know her son would be murdered by her grandkids. Jose would die in 1987 and be spared this tragedy. He would die only knowing that his son, daughter in law, and grandkids were crushing it. Although his family were not among the upper crust, a.k.a. Cuba's political elite, Jose's parents were celebrity athletes, and he and his two sisters wanted for nothing growing up. In 1959, when Jose was just 14, his uh, seemingly idyll idyllic life turned upside down when Cuba was turned upside down. After six years of fighting, the communists had won the Cuban Revolution. And the Cuban Revolution, oh, is a complex topic. Way too much to try and unpack here. I will say, though, that most historians seem to agree that... Uh, Castro did not improve life for the average citizen. Castro's human rights record, uh, not great, tracked by groups like Amnesty International. On February 16th, 1959, Fidel Castro sworn in as prime minister of Cuba after leading the guerrilla campaign that forced right-wing dictator uh, Fulgencio Batista into exile. Castro would make some big changes to Cuba in the name of communism. And those changes would not benefit Lyle and Eric's grandparents. Uh, honestly, they would uh, not benefit many people. Literacy rates improved. That's good. Access to health care for the poor improved. That's very good. But under Castro, the upper and middle classes lost property, and the lower classes faced higher prices for goods, and the government grew hey, far more repressive in prison and Hello. Is this anyone going to work today? To speak out hey, their I think it's working. So if you're scared all the time and can harbor little to no help, or little to no hope, excuse me, for true economic prosperity at some point. Looks like it's are you really working. That about having the government Hell pay your yeah. broken leg so you can do you want me to unmod you? To keep living in poverty and I continue being afraid that Castro or, you know, or some, sorry, one of his goons as I is going to drag you off to the detention center slash torture room. Well, Jankel is shaking his head no. A, yeah, no, I can not going to be that pump. I can message you. Yeah, 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 yeah. See? Uh, the United States initially it's recognized working. this new Cuban dictator, but then withdrew its support working. after Castro launched a program of agrarian reform. But if you need me to unmod you, I can. US assets on the island and declared a Don't Marxist feel uh, pressure to stay a mod. Class, wealthier I just fled. The I US, knew it worked once. someone joined the CIA in their efforts to overthrow Castro. I know regime. it worked once. Jose would become. So uh, I was Jose just like, okay, so if I mod you. That we know of. They would flee I don't know what happened. Castro came to power. Jose's parents saw their lives in Cuba, you know, were uh, forever Who changed. Their first step they made uh, in their decision to leave Who Cuba was knows? to send their son over before them. Jose flew to the U.S. with his sister's fiance, uh, first date with the cousin. Then but he quickly yeah, settled no, the, in uh, Cuba more. Uh, Fidel Castro, Scranton, an bad actor. person. Even though he had no money, no support system, he was determined to succeed in a new country. Mm, Jose let's studied see. Dilig let's try. diligently in high school. Worked if part it time does, to earn if you steady immediately money. Stop, Due to financial hardship, Jose we'll was see. not able to I'm achieve not. one of his dreams, which was to attend uh, an Ivy League college. Even. Due to uprooting, changing the entire school system, etc., he didn't have the money or the academic resume to chase that dream. Instead, he attended Southern Illinois University mm. in Carbondale, the Salukis, where many years ago, I had one of the worst stand-up comedy shows of my life. All right. Holy shit. Now, let's see if it still works. If I had 10 shows in a row that bad, I would have fucking quit. Uh... Then he'll later pressure his sons to attain the Ivy League education he was not able to. In uh, Carbondale, Jose will meet his future wife, Mary Louise Anderson. Kitty, to those who knew her. And to those who knew her real well, Sugar Puss. Tell Lucifina, JK of course. Kitty, not Sugar Puss. She's three years older than Jose and from Oak Lawn, Chicago, middle class suburb. 
Let's learn about Katie Shogun Close now. Uh, who is the woman who gave birth to the Menendez bros? Say bros instead of brothers. I picture the Mario brothers. But instead of Mario and Luigi going down pipes and battling Koopa Troopas, I, I picture little animations of Lyle and Eric, tiny shotguns in hand. And instead of trying to save the princess, they're trying to shoot her and inherit her kingdom. Here we go! Kitty was born in 1941, youngest of four children, Charles and May Anderson. Uh, during her early childhood, Kitty's family solidly middle class. Her dad owned a heat and air conditioning business that did well. Mom stayed at home to care for Kitty and her two older brothers, Milt and Brian. Oh, Milt. It was really That's weird as nice, I could watch the stream, older brother. but Milt, couldn't see chat Milt, or type drunk. in it. Damn. He's at home studying. Damn, uh, that Kitty's is older sister, very weird. Joni Sweet Cheeks. Sugar Plus and Sweet happened. Cheeks, the most popular girls in school. Gosh dang. But you're here I now, know, Joan, and that Joan. is what matters. Although the Anderson family appeared to be loving and close behind closed doors. So struggle. once this page is Kitty's done, father beat uh, mother. it'll be good. Sometimes I'm off children, tomorrow. Chuck also beat the kids. Which is nice. Sadly, both child uh, abuse I'm and probably spousal going to be abuse, painting particularly orcs wife abuse, and uh, much going more to my mother's house and Kitty's cleaning it up. Than it is now. Uh, to because my brother is going to go see her in the hospital, until uh, and it's I've got crazy. shit to do on Thanksgiving. Back in the 50s, a husband I'm like, wife well, I guess a I will matter. see her when More she's out of the fucking sure. hospital. Shit like that right there. That's, That's all I why can I will do. always advocate for strong law enforcement presence in society. Too many fucking idiots, right, doing dumb shit. Shitheads who just aren't responsible enough to manage their freedom yeah. appropriately. And the reason we end up with more law I'm like together. Bad fuck things up for the rest. What are we going to do? Trust hey, what husband. are we going to do on our or day wives, off? Or good parents. What are we and going to do? Sometimes Uncle Sam some enforcers over to step in, <laughs> throw them on their stomach, cuff them, take them oh away. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, take away some of the rights. Oh, you know, heaven. Tell them right. Those who risk their know. personal safety to protect been, personal safety. I've been so alone. anxious. Uh, before I don't Kitty know why I get so anxious. School, it doesn't even guts, fucking matter left her mom if uh, somebody and likes you know me it? at work. He did not send I a just lot of get, money back to take care of the family. Uh, when I'm just people. like... Chuck seems like a real winner. In I don't care. Family, Kitty's mom now works for United There's Airlines, a few people Midway that Airport I like and don't Chicago, like. I don't even for, by the way. hate this don't person. Like I just don't care for them. Or like, they're just kind of boring to me. They're kind of like pretty laid back and stuff like that. But I feel like the, one of my coworkers doesn't like me. After the divorce with I have no evidence uh, of this, except that to, uh, he was a lot kind of curt with me. That. Possible she was taking her mom, who never like remarried. interaction. Uh, she was kind of curt. Later remembered as being bitter and depressed. But that could also be believing that divorce is tired. Of all of he is trying to go problems. home. Convinced that divorce and was the worst thing. He just doesn't to really want to interact beat. at all. What a sad belief to have. And I am overthinking uh, this it. This belief would play into Kitty's relationship with Jose down the line. And my brain is Luckily just Kitty, telling me. Get out of this uncomfortable family situation. Make her own life. That he doesn't like me. She applied to. I don't understand what it is. Illinois University. And also, what does it matter if he likes me or not? Who gives a shit? I don't. Where she learned to produce I don't actually radio like him. TV. I don't hate him. Something gave her a lot of confidence. But I genuinely and don't. Year, 1962, like, she if come out of so much, I was asked, "Hey, hey do you want to hang out with this person?" Beauty I'd be pageant. like, "Well, it was sponsored by the VFW." Like if I and was, that was when told she started to asking him to be pick called between sugar plus maybe. Uh, I certain know. people, probably not. Uh, I would pick I him over a few other people, a, but in all honesty, reason, right, seems kind be. of like a wet blanket. Hey, yeah, yeah. In all honesty, Please. call me sugar plus. Doesn't seem uh, like sorry? a very fun sugar guy. Plus, call me sugar, sugar plus. I don't uh, hate him. Do I have to? I just I mean, it's don't. Funny. But it doesn't like him that much. Much. So why does it bother me uh, no, after the confidence that boost if of he the doesn't pageant, like me? Uh, she like, to imagine after she graduates, she's I don't move get that. City. Like, who gives Start a shit? Producing and directing radio and TV. Oh, no, he doesn't out, like uh, me. You know, oh, no, what will I do? Enter Jose. Like, who he cares? also is attending Southern Illinois University on a swimming scholarship. They meet during Kitty's senior I'm year in 1962. The Jose's freshman out. year on the surface. Uh, like Christmas decorations. Yeah, Kitty's you better watch out for those Jose. Christmas He's decorations. I've heard that and this uh, still, kids you know, put them uh, in front of uh, windows. Couples. Better watch you know, out now. Cuban. Kitty is primarily stuff. of Scandinavian heritage. Hangy bangy. Oof. Ah. Ah. in a short time to become inseparable. Investigative journalist oh. Robert Rand speculated that Jose must have loved Kitty, but also hug, loved uh, what she represents. As well. Physically attractive beauty pageant winner, the daughter of business owner, softly yeah, upper hug. middle class. By winning Kitty, Jose had instantly raised. Uh, I mean, that's what Robert Rand says. I don't yeah, know if she was upper middle class, Nicks. more like middle middle. But uh, by winning Kitty, Jose had instantly raised his social status in, yeah, in his new country. As for Kitty, maybe she saw depth to Jose yeah, that other people lack. Jose was a hard worker, always a hard worker. Well. Uh, he'd already overcome hardships. 
not someone who's content to lie back on family probably connections he, and money like uh, because it's a nice with. feeling to feel like Side someone doesn't totally like you yeah to make it big in the corporate world to yeah i know his pride but and ambition. like who gives a they shit like i don't so even know why my anxiety is Canada. making me bother even though the civil it. rights movement had been underway whatever for several years carbondale isolated conservative Illinois 181 town. Opened, people uh, you know here maybe not quite as much as or they had so in people have Chicago. stated they like me back enough to actually uh, put family the follow was, uh, button on surprise alarm Maybe so why do work. i give a shit about one person at work Jose's family also not happy that i genuinely her social could, standing her parents know, were divorced take her uh, common, take her more leave. stigma around it. that's good also thought that at that's 19 good, Jose was too young to get married glad you're doing okay neither was gonna let their parents stop them. they were in love they had big plans they want to get started on it. 1963 after kitty graduates jose and kitty they get married Immediately moved to New York City. Jose's parents uh, had moved there after after fleeing I'm Castro's glad that you're regime doing a few good. years after he did. They made it there in 1961. Uh, Jose gives up his athletic scholarship at Southern Illinois, transfers to Queens College, Let City University of New York. This. This is to study annoying to me. His dad's trade. Well, Kitty finds a job teaching grade school. During the early years of her marriage, Kitty's dream of working in broadcasting begins to fade. She discards, excuse me, her plans to obtain a master's degree in order to support Jose in his career. A lot, lot of uh, moms do that, right? A lot of wives, moms, they uh, give up on their dreams when they have uh, families to uh, support a husband or husband and kids. I feel like that sacrifice often overlooked in our society. Uh, my wife, Lindsay, abandoned her production career to uh, follow my career to help raise Kyler Monroe, help me pursue podcasting and stand-up dreams. Hail Lindsay and anyone else who sacrifices like that for others. A lot of dickheads in the world, but also a lot of selfless, courageous motherfuckers who uh, give up a lot in the name of love. What a crazy, brave, awe-inspiring thing to do. So much respect to anyone who's done this. No, without you, those whose names often show up in the history books, well, those names don't get written anymore. Uh, Jose gets, it's uh, probably a combination of everything going college, on and your head also, uh, just being dishwasher a bomb, at the uh, a bomb, no Club offense. In yeah. That place was still around just a year ago. Offense is taken. 100% offense is taken. But I, I get the sentiment. In I, I am completely offended by it, but... Uh, how sad. Just, uh, but I get Just where you're coming from. Back up. After graduating in 1967, Jose passed a CPA exam, started kicking ass in business. <laughs> uh, for the duration of his career, he was credited with being highly intelligent and diligent. Also widely disliked and labeled by many as arrogant and rude to Abrasive to subordinates. He would pass those traits along <laughs> to his kids who would not get the highly intelligent and diligent parts. Uh, just seemed to get the arrogant, uh, rude, and abrasive parts. I'm he sorry. Was, uh, to quote one source, aggressive I'm his ambition. I'm sorry, Haven. No, I'm not son, offended Lyle at Menendez, all. Soon to be known to the world as Lyle. Born on January 10th, I'm 1968. I'm not offended at all. Soon after, Jose is sent to Chicago to audit Lion no, Entertainment. No, I'm, I'm so of Cooper's sorry. Library. Didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, oh, the last the library. How many times have they showed up in, started. in the time since Since COVID started? Damn. Since COVID started? So impressed the management of Lion like Entertainment, they asked him to come humanity, to work for them full uh, time as the company's control. Since COVID, Jose Kitty, their infant son, now moves to Hinsdale, Illinois, small suburb west of Chicago. Kitty becomes been full time mom. Jose works hard to turn Lion Entertainment into a heavily profitable happened, company. And I'm like, wow. 1970, just two years later, Jose, 26 years old, named president of Lion Container. Holy shit. That's no, I have not. Sure I have not gained any talent. respect for humanity. The would not last but long. Jose, the I've accepted the that I love them, the the company, but also hate termination. them. He's, he he's fiery. He's a fiery guy. And it has nothing to do with he goes uh, to work at germs. As an executive in the car leasing division. If COVID existed or not, family now I would Illinois, still uh, uh, dislike Central most Jersey, of humanity. They will remain for many but years. still love them Jose deep down inside. Born on November 27, Because it's the right thing to do. 1973. Just two years even after it, his hire, even Jose becomes her chief bags. financial officer. Hot damn! He's only 29. <laughs> Jose rose through Hertz's ranks in uh, 1979. When even he was only 35, he becomes the worldwide general manager. Dude is fucking crushing it. Not sure much he was, how, oh, not also, sure how much he was paid uh, for that position. And there's no position the other day, that title now, I was driving to I my mom's tell. house well, because uh, to check up on her company, dog, if you do a make digging, sure he's still alive, you can figure out and how feed him, top feed him and water him. Angela Bra, and uh, uh, some guy, without his hazard, son, son, you know, close uh, to uh, was, what his was waving to me. me down. Uh, please send it an update. Is this uh, info beside as well? his Angela, truck, uh, in she's not one of the top three positions, but part of like the next tier of executives. And in 2020, she had a base salary of six hundred dollars uh, I'm pretty because sure he has a cell phone and uh, don't wait people the, down. Higher. 
An additional allowance Don't wait people down. A month, no, no, no. Just no. another 108,000. Plus, and this is big, bonus structure. Yeah. Hertz hit 60% of the company's profit and performance so, expectations like, for the year. I love uh, humanity. Expectations made clear to her when she took the job. I'm also it's fucking scared of humanity. And I know that some older gentleman uh, it's, uh, in a giant bonus, truck that he can hide behind. K, almost a million. Uh, uh, that, that if like, I stop, uh, you know, there is a possibility that anything could happen. $1.7 million. Plus a 401k. Maybe if it was and shares of company a younger stock, lady, a lot of shares, a million dollars I might a year slow worth down so and be like, hey, hey do you need me to call 911? You know, uh, almost $2.7 million. No? Okay. Bye bye. Uh, and drive off. $222,000 a month. But an First, older gentleman? No. I'm not even going to slow down. So maybe she's I'm not going to slow down. But they restructured, and now she might be killing it. And Hertz was doing great in the 70s. I've, I've seen Jose Menendez too many horror movies of what to Angela, know. You know makes I don't want to be money. anywhere near what is going on. Jose's career ends at Hertz. Uh, another man brought in, made president, and yeah, Jose exactly. is reassigned to the entertainment division. Fucking RCA, exa it, exactly my that fucking time point. Hertz. RCA, Jose would, uh, once and again, it's happened before positions, where some guy, uh, was a major some American uh, company, bigger gentleman, uh, was waving me down and trying to get in front of my car. Was absorbed in 1986 by General Electric, and I'm like, nope, 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 nope. Firm in the US. And I Over immediately called 911. Uh, the iconic 30 Rock, New York, and I was like, please, Center, please known as the go RCA help this building. person. I don't know what their uh, what their thing is. And they're like, can you stay by it? And I was like, no. Radio no. and TV broadcaster studios they made the first fucking vinyl record and vinyl <laughs> no. record players in the sense and science. I don't you know, know what they're today. doing, and I don't uh, know what they're doing out there. Label. No. And in 1991, Jose I'm not about RCA's to become a victim. Division, which was sadly no. overpaid aging Fuck recording that. stars. He tried to turn the division around by signing big bands like the Eurythmics. Well, somebody could be Dude, in, the Eurythmics. in grave danger. That's exactly. Think, uh, Go help Annie them. fucking Lennox. Sweet dreams are made of these. Jose Menendez signed her. Uh, numerous platinum records for RCA. Uh, by 1985, at the age of 41, I'm not Jose paid had to risen look to become the executive That's vice president, chief operating <laughs> yeah, officer exactly. for RCA Records but I, worldwide. But I mean, I, I totally he understand. Made a year. No, he made so much. Money. Like I totally uh, trying to get, get it. A lot of people are like, "Well, you don't know what, uh, what Brothers Brothers could have happened." Records execs. Uh, well, what label I normally can with, happen a company is that there's a 50/50 chance that they could just kill me. And Each then the police come and just over 10, 10 minutes, annually. 20 minutes, 30 so again, minutes. I'm betting Jose's making And low uh, nobody's there. Uh, he my car is gone. For ruthlessness and uh, my uh, body has been allegedly extended to his family life as well. Let's talk about how he and Kitty interacted this a time. A slasher uh, the or killer. Marriage, Kitty always gave Jose the freedom a, to A psychopath can in your life well, in less we'll than move where we need to move. You know, do whatever minute. you need to do to sacrifice for your career. Of meeting he you. seems to have taken uh, to have taken advantage of some of that power. No, uh, and freedom. no, no. And no. he had several mistresses. No, no, no. Jose had apparently many affairs. The longest I'm not last about one to become the next a victim. Louise. Of, of Jose and something. Louise traveled together, even entertained others as a couple in her but townhouse like, in Manhattan. I totally understand. Uh, one I, I love humanity. One of Jose's relationships. I'm not going to lie. Moved out of the house for several days. I love days, humanity. Managed to convince humanity her, begged her to brings... come home. A Apparently lot of things just barely, to the table. Uh, 1986, Without humanity, at about the same time, uh, many of RCA these was coming to an evolutionary end. Uh, uh, leaves, like leaps and then Jose came that about, uh, normally a bunch of leave and sent other animals in the dust so severe, that she literally lets them suicide. die off. So they were humanity is like, no, we don't want, we want to preserve these, uh, these species. Sure There's a lots file, of species but, uh, that, come uh, as that we're going to go to extinct, not because of humanity, but because of just but also maybe general a fucking, uh, that's how evolution days, happens. But I also don't know their marriage. I don't know you either die, you either uh, live or die. Uh, let's go back to seventies, early eighties. Now the years nature is not nice. Now that we know a bit it about it, it is not going to hold your. Uh, it's not going to hold any species hand. It's gonna let you 10, fucking 68, die. November twenty seventh, seventy one. Lyle born. And right humanity born has helped out job. a lot of Eric species the, uh, that Eric were born going born to previously die and now aren't. And they grew up watching their dad, you know, making making that, that sweet Kurtz money. Humanity's in done early a lot. Childhoods. 
Humanity is way, now trying to fix a lot of the problems the that, that we Menendez, may have uh, created, executor, but also that, uh, like, yeah, volcanoes and other things attention, that naturally uh, you know, happen that uh, uh, spread a lot of pollution uh, into the air, right the family we Chicago are trying to fix. Yeah, Black, Which is Jersey. very good. Blackwood, 53 miles Humanity's done family doing that. No, I don't see any wolves coming out here trying to fix things. Uh, another tuition, or I'm sorry, annual tuition at this school today. Humanity tries to bring multiple species together. To fourth grade. Right, That's something hu only for, uh, humanity can do. $220 for grades five and six. And then for other species, for grades seven they're right well. bastards. I'm sure it's a fantastic. In the, in the wild. Come on. Over 33 k a year for kindergarten? For kindergarten? Come on. Gosh dang. No coloring books are that good. But we're what like, kind of oh, let eat? the bunny Caviar and the dog and hang out crackers, together. Artesian handcrafted food. Let's cups, let the, uh, let's see what a, a donkey and the chicken nuggets uh, made by a chef who studied in Let's see what a donkey is the recess and monitor, one a of the snake American Ninja are Warriors. together. Uh, pretty cool. Pretty uh, the chill. Remembered as being in wild, average uh, fucking Most death. Mostly remembered later for death, being exceptionally death, close. Death, 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 death. Inseparable. Teachers at the school also felt that both boys were immature for their ages. Is pretty problems. incredible. Uh, when these reports made their way back we're to Jose, also he continually insisted monsters. that his sons so, were nothing you know, short of brilliant. You know, of course they were. They were also his huge assholes. He didn't dominate at you know, We told his sons without the cream of the crop, they, they had to be elite. It. They came from his elite balls. Because also not fucking perfect. Because feedback from their teachers, Jose effectively prevented them from getting any help with their learning issues. Uh, the boy's home life was, by all accounts, Ran by dad, like who ruled chimney. the house with an iron fist. That chimney's fist. a nice chimney right there. Jose was incredibly strict. Yep, it's and a tight uh, ship at the, the office and, the and a tight ship at home. Yep. He basically dictated every aspect of yep, his yep, family's yep. lives, including what uh, they could eat, what they could spend time with, what they were allowed to read. If he asked, uh, you know, they had to be able to tell him so where they, they were, what they were doing every minute of every I day. But I totally understand yes, and those that, kids didn't get to eat as many uh, that COVID not to see has made uh, Jose, a lot of people kind of a realize dick. how shitty when the humanity were in can school, be. Jose would uh, pose questions about current events at the dinner table, make sure his kids were kept abreast of world affairs. I already knew uh, sure humanity was shitty answers. in a lot of ways. I don't hate that dinner policy, actually. Uh, occasionally, Eric was allowed to answer, but it's most of the questions fell online. It's just good that it confirms it. As the brothers it. grew older, the questions became more complex. Not answering them meant humiliation. Investigative journalist, Menendez expert Robert Rand, uh, didn't expand on what kind of humiliation they received. My mind goes to their dad uh, mocking them when they're young children, not knowing things that young, but young kids would never know. if you're know. still there, Fluffy oh, Snow, yeah, I mean, you can tell me play. how, uh, how COVID uh, uh, ruined humanity for you. To their left. The invasion is a tremendous threat to global security and to Pakistan's sovereignty, Eric. What about oil supply in the nearby Persian Gulf, Eric? How much do Soviet hostilities fuck things up for our oil-based economy? No more private school for you! If our factories close... Not the gas for our cars. The economy collapses, Eric. Pass me the potatoes. Wake the fuck up. And if you're going to cry, do not spill your juice. Please leave the table. Your tears. Mix it with your mac and cheese. God, wipe that up with a napkin. Make you look like a goddamn fool. Uh, Jose also decided that the boys should be uh, sports prodigies, like he and his parents. Jose chose tennis for his sons. I guess they didn't choose it. He was like, you're playing tennis. Uh, when they were 12 and 9. While from the outside, it looked like these kids had it made. Inside the Menendez home, even if molestation was not occurring, the pressure to perform at a high level made and make their dad proud uh, was taking his toll. They began to grind their teeth. They developed stomach pains. began to stutter. Uh, their schools reported them having anger issues. By age 14, Lyle is still playing with stuffed animals, wet in his bed, which is not necessarily age-appropriate. Uh, were these issues stemming from living in a rigid auth authoritarian home run by an emotionally abusive perfectionist, or was something more insidious occurring? Was Jose physically and sexually abusing the boys, like the uh, boys would later claim? Three first cousins who spent a lot of time in the Menendez home in the 70s and early 80s would testify at their first highly publicized trial that they believed Jose was more than just an asshole. For several summers, beginning in 1976, the boys' first cousin, Diane Vandermolen, who was 17 in 1976, came to stay with the Menendez family to help out around the house, watch the boys, help Kitty, you know, kind of like be a nanny, etc., uh, Diane was one of Kitty's sister's daughters. And Vandermolen said that there were all sorts of weird sexuality in the Menendez house. One night after dinner, Jose was with the boys upstairs before eight-year-old Lyle came down to her basement room and said he wanted to touch her down there, mm. indicating her genitals. Then he said that he and his dad had been touching each other 
uh, on the genitals. She later said at the trial, I went to get Kitty and tell her, but Kitty didn't believe me. After that, Kitty dragged Lyle upstairs to bed, and it was never discussed after that. You know, she told, uh, you know, um, uh, Vandermolen that, you know, he was a liar. Obviously, that doesn't look good. Vandermolen remains convinced to this day that Lyle and Eric were molested by their parents. Uh, on another occasion, Diane said that she and Lyle were watching television together. He suddenly climbed on top of her, fondled her breasts, pushed him away, and he stopped. Signs of molestation? Possibly, yeah. Uh, another cousin who would later testify, and I only kind of like hesitate because of some things you're going to find out about the, their accusations later. Uh, another cousin who would later testify about abuse in Menendez's home was one of Kitty's brother's sons, Alan Anderson. He spent three now, summers. I'm with trying to make seven. sure that this Anderson feels said that cold. Eric and Lyle were instructed by their parents that not this to show feels emotion. cold so right now. So I'm adding He's a lot of Jose snow. Kitty I'm himself, adding a lot of ice and stuff like that. Just a little, little Kitty got bits angry. She clenched her knuckles, like her teeth until her neck veins bulged. Uh, standing up, Anderson demonstrated her rage yeah. for the jurors. Uh, sometimes, in a frenzy, he said she'd walk into the kitchen, smash glass cups and saucers. He'd yell, "Kitty!" She'd snap out of it. He said it was frightening. Jose, he said, would whip his sons with the belt until, until they were bruised. He'd drag them into their rooms, leave them locked inside for hours. Uh, he'd testify, as soon as Jose took either one of the boys into their rooms, the door was locked behind them, and Kitty made it clear you didn't go down the hallway. I saw him grab the brothers when they didn't want to go, just lifted them off their feet. Then Kitty would turn the TV up, and then you'd hear the, you know, the sound of the belt. Anderson also heard many late-night emotional fights between Jose and Kitty, and then the next morning he said he noticed bruises on her arms and neck. Anderson did not witness any sexual abuse, though. But after playing tennis, he said he sometimes uh, he said sometimes they would all shower together. I know that sounds super weird. I believe, though, he's referring to them showering in a big locker room shower designed for many people. I still wouldn't want to do that. I <laughs> still don't do that uh, with the kids. But I know it's somewhat common. It used to be more common. And that on its own, not necessarily an indicator of sexual abuse. Uh, the most damning testimony regarding someone not named Lyle or Eric Menendez saying that the uh, boys have been sexually abused, would come from another cousin, Andy Kano. He's the uh, son of one of Jose's brothers. Andy said that during the summer of 82, when Eric was 12 and Andy was 10, the two of them were playing war games in a field nearby, when Eric, or near the house, when Eric told Andy uh, that his dad gave him massages. And that sometimes his dad massaged his penis, and sometimes those massages It's making hurt. me feel and cold, that and I'm just... sounds very bad. I'm and he said Eric made him think he promised home. not to tell anyone. You just and if it you're for just two feeling of these witnesses, chilly. I don't think I would even entertain Hold the up. Menendez brothers' sexual abuse. What is that song? But these witnesses have never strayed from their stories. Uh, What is that song? Let me see it. Yeah, I know. Lyrics. No. No. Um, I'm Mr. White Christus. Oh man, I I need to learn this song. I I remember this song. That does make me wonder. So far back, I would However, love to. However, these stories would never come song. out until the trial, and Eric's lead defense attorney uh, will meet her I soon. Miss a it seems like Christmas. she got the brothers to I make some wild ass planks, and I do wonder if she kind of felt around with some of the cousins, or maybe Lyle and Eric did, to see who could maybe you know manufacture some stories. Why I'm saying that, uh, I think will make sense later. Not long after this uh, encounter supposedly occurred, Eric's older brother starts to date. Lyle's first romance comes when he's 15 in the fall of 82. His relationship with his girlfriend, Stacy Feldman, innocent and chaste. Stacy managed the men's varsity tennis team at the Princeton Day School. Lyle, the number one ranked player on the team. First date was to see Raiders of the Lost Ark. Stacy and Lyle fell in love. They walked around Princeton hand in hand, which was against, you know, school rules. Rebel, rebel. Teachers and administrators let this uh, infraction pass because they felt that Stacy and Lyle were awkward kids who needed each other. At the end of the school year, Lyle and Stacy voted most married by their classmates. That's cute. Nice period of wholesomeness in the midst of this uh, true crime story. In 1986, through contacts Jose had made while working at RCA, 
He gets the job that takes the family to Hollywood. Showbiz. That's how they do it in Hollywood. Oh, damn. Uh, he becomes president of Albert live entertainment. Fish. You know, we'll Los never Angeles. get away from the Albert of Fish. Carol Co. Pictures Incorporated. Live, now defunct, was a video distribution and duplication company. I don't even know if I want. Uh, Carol Co. Best known at this I time. I think it's a very Rambo interesting movies. story. Carol Co. would produce the monster movie, Total Recall, Universal Soldier, so Basic Instinct, up. Cliffhanger. I watched all those. Uh, I'm sure on set or you know at parties, Jose was meeting and bullshitting with big stars like Sylvester Stallone when he worked there. He jumps at the chance to become uh, involved in the film business in such a big way. The Cuban defector, now a Hollywood mogul. He uproots his family, minus Lyle. Uh, that spring, he was about to graduate high school. Moves him to the West Coast, uh, you know. Lyle stays in New Jersey, graduated Princeton. Eric moves, uh, you know, during his sophomore year, which had to have sucked. Uh, at Live, Jose will turn a company running at a loss into a profitable one. That was his specialty, turning companies around and be paid uh, roughly $2 million a year to do so, which is the equivalent of $4.7 million a year today. Crazy that the dollar I mean, didn't weaken that much. In Albert terms of Fish out. is 33 years, right? He's just so messed me, up. Uh, so that made me wonder if the inflation a... calculator I was using was wrong. But check this out. In the third quarter He's of 1988, such... the median sales Not price really for a household character. in the U.S. was ready to be depressed and then raged, $115,000. $115,000 in 1988. Median sales price for a U.S. home right now, $404,700. It's fucking crazy. Uh, federal minimum wage, and uh, you know, at the time... 88 335 an hour 725 now that is scary uh minimum wage jumped you know more than double 216 percent but home prices went up 352 percent truly a lot harder for the average american to buy their first home now than it was in 86 or 88 sorry extremely unfortunate and i can jump further into uh you know it costs this much in 88 versus it costs this much now uh working class uh modern americans are for sure more economically disadvantaged now than we were decades ago wormhole but I don't want to distract further from today's topic. I'll try and stay focused. Uh, most important thing to know as far as what pertains to this story, Mr. Menendez making the equivalent of almost $5 million a year and had been making a very nice living for about you know 20 years already. So this family's fucking loaded when they head out to California. Uh, Kitty not so positive about the move. She'd spent the past 16 years, you know, building a life outside of a marriage. Friends, you know, a uh, support group, you know, outside of a marriage that had struggled. She didn't want to leave her network of friends or her dream house in Princeton. I wish I knew more about that dream house, how nice it was. The only info I could find described it as a moderately sized Tudor style home with a well used backyard tennis court tucked above the neighborhood's artificial lake on West Shore Drive in the Elm Ridge Park section of Hopewell Township. Uh, that township just west of Princeton, just north of Trenton, uh, about <coughs> 70 miles from Manhattan. Uh, maybe what helped lure her out to California was, you know, a more opulent living situation. And Menendez is first uh, settled in Calabasas, upper middle class suburb in the northwestern part of the San Fernando Valley. Calabasas, uh, famous now for being the affluent area the Kardashians call home. Will Smith, Drake, Justin Bieber, lots of celebs call Calabasas home. 23 miles from Hollywood. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, 18 miles from Malibu. I almost forgot, Haven. Menendez is, uh, uh, I was one house going home. to tell you Those about my more mom. Spectacular She's doing 13 way better. Acres with mountaintop views in Calabasas. So they're crushing it. She is on Eric schedule to be released. Uh, away from hopefully, his this upcoming the first time, week. You know, comparisons were often made between them at the Princeton Day School. He discovers his own identity. Here, he makes friends with a group so of boys who are like nice. him. Described as arrogant with a rebellious streak. So, some pompous rich kids. As soon as he gets a girlfriend, it uh, doesn't sound like he wanted one. Uh, Kitty, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, not long after he gets there, he gets a girlfriend. It sounds like he doesn't want, didn't want one. Sorry. Uh, Kitty was worried he was gay and ordered him to get a girlfriend, according to yeah. various sources. How super fucking weird, if true. Cannot imagine ordering Tyler or Monroe to date anyone ever. It's so weird to me when, when parents, you know, just set these, well, my kid has to do this, and then my kid has to do that, and my kid has to do this. What? You don't have a girlfriend? What? You don't have a boyfriend? You haven't applied for this school yet? What's wrong with you? Just like, just like planning out their whole life in front of them. That is fucking weird. And, it's, and especially like ordering them to date. I would never do that with one of the kids. Glad your grades are good. Making friends, yada, yada. Now get a fucking boyfriend, Monroe. And it has to be a boy, no girls. Go find some dicks. Make your dad proud. What the fuck is wrong with some people? So much, actually. Uh, Eric found an older girl at uh, Calabasas High, but their relationship was short-lived. Right, because he didn't, didn't want to date her. Uh, and this is weird. At a party, uh, apparently they got into an argument, and then Eric locked her in a room and wouldn't let her leave. So that's creepy. Uh, according to witnesses, she screamed and yelled. He wouldn't let her out for a long time. And then, you know, when he finally did let her out, she broke things off immediately because she was not an idiot. Was he trying to control her like dad controlled him at home? What's happening here? 
Eric later had another girlfriend, Janice, whom Kitty and Jose apparently both liked, uh, which was nice because they didn't like Lyle's girlfriends, whom Kitty, I guess, found cheap, usually. Yeah, but she's, she's doing high, good. Janice. Uh, perhaps, perhaps Eric's most important relationship at Calabasas High was with Craig. Uh, also, uh, hey, man, how's the was artwork the been? The Have you been doing more? Eric would actually uh, achieve the rank of 44th in the U.S. for 18 and under players. Craig and Eric spent any a great new, deal of time uh, together. Any new pictures you would like to show? Friends. They had big dreams. The script was a 62-page thriller about, you're going to love this, a son from a wealthy family who reads his parents' will and uh, learns that upon their deaths, he will inherit $157 million, so he fucking murders them. <laughs> uh, considering what will happen to you know, his folks pretty soon, that's obviously a little disturbing. Lyle, meanwhile, back in Princeton, he uh, committed to two things, going to Princeton University and staying with his girlfriend, Stacy. Lyle and Stacy often talked about getting married and having children. Lyle lavished jewelry and other gifts on Stacy that he bought with his parents' money. It doesn't sound like he ever had a job. Uh, Stacy ended the relationship when she went off to college, though. She realized she wanted more out of life, and she was too young to get married. Lyle is devastated. Unsuccessfully tries to win her back. Uh, this uh, this year, 19... Um, my God, why do I keep writing it? Sorry. So my notes is 86. Is that right? Is it 86 or 88? Oh, shit. It is 86. I went back and forth there. So remember when I was talking about federal minimum wage and all that kind of stuff? I started correcting the notes that I was going to 88. Not that anyone's like, what the fuck? That sounds like... Those sound like 88 numbers, not 86 numbers. <laughs> but for factualness sake, we're in 86, not 88. Come on, comments. Why did you make one typo in 32,000 words? Uh, 1986 was kind of a kick in the dick. I haven't had a chance he with, girl, uh, also with not work. Hopefully get some the uh, work on his father, not on Steampunk one day. While enrolled in a local community college. Submits one another today? application to Princeton for the 1987 school year. Just one he today. To back. Okay, he, uh, one steam you know, pump he does, today. He meets All and begins right. to date Jamie Pasarek now, waitress at a local Princeton Are restaurant. Are we uh, talking Jamie, about also a uh, tennis player, five years what, old and Lyle? What is that Katie fucking Jose, terrible like. goddamn game that my friend likes? Lyle's second uh, Princeton that application that multiple people like that, the that I thought was... Semester. Father pleased about that. I think it's very weird. Despite that good news, I think it's weird that people like that family. game. Uh, the summer what is it called? Violent what is that stupid goddamn dumb game? Nineteen Jose felt Lyle was too young to get married, despite having gotten married that exact same age. So that's how we dads do. What is it called? Don't do the dumb shit that we did. Uh, shortly before Lyle was uh, to begin, for instance, Jamie moves to Alabama though to keep uh, tennis. Has that girl and Lyle and she's in summer. got Jose the helmet hair. Who gets stuck in Alabama. She's he's not that interesting. To sponsor Jamie on a European tennis tour now, thinking if he can just get her out of the country, Lyle will move on. It's a sneaky ass dad move. Doesn't work. What is it? Lyle game? follows. Now Lyle is fucking the girl. What is Daddy that doesn't game want him to that fucking I'm Europe thinking of? Alabama. On Daddy's dying. Fuck. Lyle does return to New Jersey though for his freshman year at Princeton in the fall. And immediately upsets father again. I'm sorry, father. Life his is first strange. semester, the academic pressure is too much is. for him, and he gets Life caught in plagiarizing. Copies his lab partner's homework. I was. I had class. to think about it. This is a serious violation of Princeton's uh, honor code. A home thank you for the work. Been in place since 1893. He has to go report to the honor committee. Thank you for the work. Lyle doesn't tell his dad about this. Instead, I he, uh, his dad Jose hears about it from his sister I hope Terry. You enjoy yourself. Jose then sends Lyle a statement to read before the committee. Stepping in here to solve his grown-ass son's problems. I feel like that's not usually a good call. Lindsay gets annoyed at me sometimes for not wanting to help father like, in uh, certain ways. Can't believe you. Know, he, you make sure he finished that he homework project? Like, Fuck no. Life is strange. Uh, but it's 50% of his grade. Good. And if he fucks it, he's going to be in trouble. I'll take no, you some of his stuff. Let your kids fall I'm not going to put, uh, I'm not gonna put words the in their mouth. Mind up the sting, but not so high they're going to ruin their lives. Let kids fail when the stakes are lower than they're going to be when they're adults, so they can learn how to recover, how to... Clean up their own mess. But yeah, the the game. You know, uh, I'm just, there's some devil dead. Some big meaning. Uh, the Lyle, game. Like normal, I guess, uh, based on numerous called, accounts. You know, uh, life totally is strange. Fine. Letting uh, daddy come and clean up his mess. Uh, which uh, after a four hour I hearing, though, the honor committee doesn't give a shit what Jose like, thinks, and I, they find Lyle guilty of plagiarism. I don't understand why people like year, this game. Tell him he can return in '88. It is not good. Father, very not pleased. He he uh, even flies uh, to the Princeton. The characters are not Princeton president. Great. And can't change. His mind. Princeton doesn't and need his money. it's very uninteresting and, or, and unoriginal. Donors. Lyle is humiliated. He wants to transfer to UCLA or it's the okay. University of Pennsylvania, yeah. but Jose not having it. His dad decides it's Princeton or nothing. No, you gotta, uh, you gotta clean up this mess. At, at one point, one of the characters off, says, keep Lyle busy. Uh, that's so steampunk. Give uh, Lyle a job, live entertainment. One Lyle of the characters just says, that's so steampunk. Reduce cost, 
He is as if it is a normal saying like any other employee that, that every uh, has to make appointments young to dad. kid does Ohio apparently uh, doesn't make too many appointments and so it's obviously written by a 40 year old uh, person uh, arrives late that uh, like doesn't classic, know what kids business owner, how kids shit, talk like uh, call in sick you know and just go play tennis especially high good. school kids finally one of jose's associates goes to him complains about lyle Everyone knew he was just working. But I think there that's because the people son. I watch playing okay, it asks, uh, uh, make it more what would interesting. You do yes. While, uh, you know, uh, was not my son. Probably. I guess this guy said. Uh, I'm I think that it's a well, very shallow field. story. Uh, and Jose with does. The, he does not fire this brave man. He fires a slightly his son, interesting Good. premise. But now Lyle uh, starts acting out in new ways. That ultimately goes nowhere. April of 88, two burglaries take place at the New Jersey office of the Sierra Club and the office of the Princeton Friends of Open Spaces. These burglaries, office equipment, is stolen to the value of about $1,100. Those offices housed on the same property that the Menendez family owned. I right personally think California. that the story goes the nowhere. In which Lyle had lived uh, it kind of leaves Princeton itself in such a shitty Indian. way uh, after, uh, after episode, uh, uh, after, after these burglaries and both burglaries, the final burglaries episode, the home through a second floor bathroom, uh, like the ending, the place. Um, police fuck. finally able to connect Lyle to the burglaries be and uh, after a confidential police informant came forward. I don't want to be charged, rude. And by the time all this kind of happened, he so was already in jail for the ending slightly for more it. serious charges. Not satisfied. I know with the, the ending. New Jersey uh, to it. July uh, there's Eric two Lyle possible during the summer endings. Between Eric Jr. and so, Senior High School. Before Lyle's a try to get Prince again. Two phrase, boys began so breaking into homes in Calabasas. Yeah. They burglarized no, it's the homes owned by parents of their friends. Like, are surprised no by the large amounts of cash and jewelry they're able to steal. They thought they'd come the, up with a genius way to get more spending money. One of the main characters says it. I have to ask Dad for just, more of an allowance. Get a lecture drives, about value, hard work. It, it yada, drives yada. everybody crazy the and jewelry because they're stole, like, stole, no one be, says uh, this. So that's quite a bit. Large enough to be classified as a felony offense called grand theft burglary. The L.A. County Sheriff's uh, detective who investigated the burglaries. It's a break in the case after Eric is stopped for a driving violation in Calabasas and stolen property found in his car trunk. Uh, later, so, detectives discovered that a safe like, in one of the homes I, that the brothers had burglarized had been found in another home. If you like the, the game, these two dipshits. The, I uh, just want to say, caught, they returned uh, one of the safes they took to the wrong house. Enjoy whatever you that. like. Eric, think. Doesn't matter oh, what I, oh, uh, where I, I like. Where did we put this back? We need to put it back where you found it. Doesn't matter what I anybody this else enjoys. It's very different than it did a few days ago. You enjoy different what you paint, like. Different layout. We have uh, two very remodel, different opinions about uh, uh, about story structure and whatnot. Menendez, father, That's really totally not fine. Now. Jose's furious. I don't, I, felony could mean I don't jail want to hate your game. Time, he hires Gerald. I don't want to bash video games unless criminal defense you're literally like, oh yeah, no, fuck that game. work out an agreement. The L.A. County District Attorney's Office. I think it's that awful. will absolve Lyle of any participation. So Eric takes the fall for everything. Is Eric's juvenile? and does, doesn't have a previous uh, record. And Shalef able to convince a judge to sentence Eric to community service with the homeless and for the brothers to both undergo psychological counseling. So they get out of it. Jose writes a check for $11,000 to victims. Everybody has their own uh, opinion. You know, for so take that as you will. These burglaries lead to the Menendez uh, family, Menendez's, moving to Beverly Hills because their neighbors in Calabasas now are yeah. not their biggest fans. Uh, neighbors, if you want to draw something steampunky, what are you feeling? Lyle and Eric what, didn't seem to face any consequences. Uh, didn't seem to be remorseful. Almost overnight, Let's the family get back abandoned the Calabasas, moved hand. to Beverly Hills, where Jose buys what a house. What you Doesn't even have to sell the Calabasas house. He just keeps that house, buys another house. 722 North Elm Drive. Six-bedroom, Mediterranean-style oh, uh, villa. Haven. Based a block off Sunset, uh, off the Sunset Strip with a red tile roof, courtyard, it's swimming pool, together. tennis court, guest house. It's Built coming 1927, together. Rebuilt in 1974. This home had previously been owned by, you may have heard of them, Elton John. Prince, Michael Jackson, other huge stars. A Saudi prince once rented it for $35,000 a month. Six bedrooms, eight bathrooms, over 9,000 square feet. Eric transfers to Beverly Hills High for his senior year of high school. When Lyle returns to Princeton in the fall of 88, he continues his relationship with Jamie Pis uh, Pisarek. Uh, Lyle's return to Princeton begins badly. He discovers that he's assigned a roommate, and I don't want one, Daddy! I wanted a single! And according to the Hall student that advisor, cool steampunk type of uh, uh, student pick, in his room, um, he just literally throws this shit out in the hall. Oh, Holy yeah. fucking privilege. These kids. Lyle's a grown ass oh, yeah. man now, actually. They are fucking brats. So we're going to work on that today. Uh, once again, Ooh, Jose yeah. comes to Lyle's defense. I love it. He writes a letter to Princeton apologizing, you know, pays for some damages, and uh, buys a single room for Lyle. Oh, man. Oh, boy. February of 1989, Lyle's girl Jamie introduces him to uh, a guy named Donovan Goodrow. 
I also have some steampunk stuff, uh, but I'm just not into steampunk, you know what I mean? Uh, his stopover in Princeton, like, Donovan I love the idea of steampunk. With Lyle, and somehow, I just, I think that homework. a lot of people that nice. are into it uh, have Lyle ruined it for me. Showing zero interest in working but like, for I like it. During the spring of 1989, Lyle and Jamie break up. But I also have up. a big thing for he fantasy to, uh, 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 stuff in general, so I might just like it than Lyle, because it's father, fantasy. Mother, again, not pleased. And Once it's again, like, oh, it's another form of fantasy. Also another issue. Even with his pal, uh, it's his just pal that, uh, you know, he's still doing his homework. Just like every but, fan, uh, over wants there's to always to fans that, that ruin it. Party life all the time. Uh, be reunited, like, uh, be reunited stuck, with Eric and Jose Forbidden. The fans that love it. Shortly after this request was shot down, Lyle and Donovan, they have ruined it for me. When Lyle accuses Donovan uh, of stealing from his room. One of my friends actually room. did uh, commission Summer work uh, for. Starts off great for Jose Menendez. Uh, for his Homestuck. contract live is renegotiated. And I was like, that's really cool. Do you like it? Uh, now that I've drawn it, I don't enjoy it at all. Jose's and I'm like, oh, company invests oh okay. In a key man life insurance policy that will guarantee that if he dies, his family gets $5 million. Jose has oh, yeah. Dragons, are the, has to Dragons are the coolest. Dragons are the coolest. That Jose will name Sorry, Kitty guys. As the Do apologize. Under California I'm biased. Property. I think dragons are this the coolest uh, Speaking of his son, Lyle pisses him off again. It's his girlfriend, Christy, pregnant. This is off his dad, Jose. According to Lyle later, Jose then intimidates her into having an abortion. Once again, daddy steps in to clean up the mess. Kitty later told one of her friends that Jose paid Christy $100,000 to get rid of the pregnancy and stay the fuck away from his son. Holy shit. And this works. She does leave. Also that summer, Jose finds out Lyle is flunking out of Princeton. Even though Donovan is writing a lot of his papers, he's still flunking out. Does Jose now punish his son? No, he kind of rewards him. In order to encourage him to exert more effort in school, he buys him a fucking condo just outside of uh, uh, the campus. That'll teach him. The condo has two-bedroom suites. It'll be perfect. When Kitty and Jose come to visit, they'll stay in one of the bedrooms without intruding on Lyle. It'll be a great place for him to focus and study or party and just not fucking care about school. Lyle asks Kitty to decorate the condo for him. She does. Then Jose and Kitty find out that academic probation, not the only problem Lyle having at Princeton, was having. Shortly after he came home to Beverly Hills for the summer, Jose and Kitty notifi notified by mail that Princeton is placing Lyle on disciplinary probation after some pool tables in his residence hall uh, severely damaged during a party he'd thrown. Now Jose and Kitty uh, then also find out that Jose, er, yeah, that Lyle had just gotten them banned from their old Princeton country club as well. Lyle and Donovan, before they parted ways, took a nighttime golf cart ride across the club's greens, caused a huge amount of damage, spinning cookies, doing all kinds of crazy shit. When Jose gets wind of this, he has to make full restitution to the country club before he can be allowed back in. Right? Daddy steps in, fixes things yet again. And now Jose is at his fucking wit's end. And he's not happy with Eric at this time either. Eric doesn't seem to have a life plan. You know, just wants to party at UCLA, spend his parents' money. He and Kitty are sick of these two dipshits being continual, never-ending disappointments. Kitty and Jose now threaten to write Eric and Lyle out of their inheritance. This is important. Jose's first will had been written in 1980. Yeah, Dragons are very that he, uh, cool. Love him and Kitty died in a common disaster. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Lyle and Eric were received the entire are okay. Thing. Now they want a new will. Uh, it's going to cut their kids out of that entirely. Don't know Eric the fun and Lyle fact about panicked. wolves. Uh, Sources say that Jose didn't fact. seem to notice any changes wolves in his son's behavior have after a he makes this threat, but Kitty did. And she Alpha Omega bullshit. After this, leading up to the murders. Wolves are not like that. Locked in her bedroom door, uh, which was new. Uh, that is actually uh, which was also that new. is actually from uh, research no that have keys to her house. Uh, upon further discovery, night, right? She he literally figured you know, out. She had to be waking from sleep. Oh no, they're Something a family structure. She was definitely concerned Basically, about her son. Basically, wolves so that have the same family trial. structure that humans do. On July nineteenth, nineteen eighty nine, almost a month before her death, she told her therapist she, death, she, told her therapist she thought her sons were sociopaths. They don't have an alpha omega BS crap like that. A person who lacks a conscience. Kitty's they therapist have made notes of the session indicating that Kitty was concerned structure. that her sons were narcissistic, lacked consciences, uh, consciences, and exhibited signs of being sociopaths. Despite her fear, the four continued to live under the same roof for the uh, And this was found out after he wrote uh, the whole book and Eric stuff like that. Time, and it's on August like, 19th, uh, the this is what family, wolves are. And Charter then he realized go shark fishing. later after the the boat, like, did not he wanted to like do more family. research on wolves and stuff like that. Fish. And he figured out, oh no, I'm an idiot. Lyle and Eric hung out. Oh no, I'm a big old dum-dum. 
Uh, this would be the last full day of Jose oh, and Kitty's life. No. Now we're up to August 20th. That did 1989, big a Sunday, the big day. Jose's 45. Kitty's so 47. So there's no like he's Alpha so Omega BS that, uh, Kitty still a lot has of the it same blonde wants. hair, green eyes, and uh, one of those beauty pages, a young woman. There's Jose literally just a structure of. Handsome guy, it's thick head of black hair, just a body, good family diet, structure. playing lots of tennis. It's basically like just mom, one dad, this day, Jose uh, the home and children. His kids, former tennis coach and friend Perry Behrman. And then me, Perry when they join up with the other family, that's when they. That's when the older wolves. Wild we'll take command at 5 over the younger parents' house. They make tentative plans to meet in Santa Monica at 10 p.m. The rest of the afternoon passes uneventfully. That evening, after Lyle and Eric leave the house, Jose and Kitty relax like a on the couch grandfather ice cream, or father figure and empty. mother figure May have the day off. taking uh, uh, taking off the role of James Bond parent, spy who loved me plays with the VCR. Around 10 p.m., a teenage girl standing outside her home, located down the street from it's the Menendez actually, mansion, waiting it's for her boyfriend. Way more interesting she's a small that, car driver uh, stopped in that, front of the Menendez home. Two men inside the car, Lyle and Eric. The wolves exit. have a, One man, uh, goes a, a uh, family shotgun, structure that is a lot, the house. that is very Menendez similar to how the street, humans shaded run by their dense foliage. A high iron fence surrounds the mansion. There are iron gates barring the entrance to the semi-circular driveway Which in front I of the think. home. That, that's a personal Night, thought of, like, I think that that's very interesting. The gates the driveway open. The home security system had been turned off. The girl watches the men disappear into the house. Lyle and Eric enter the home, walk through the French doors into the study. They walk down the hallway towards the family room, a.k.a. the den, located in the back of the house. They arrive at the den just a few minutes after 10 p.m. So many questions about this that they will never answer or answer truthfully in my mind. What was their mood? Emotional? Did they consider calling the whole thing off at the last moment? Were they scared that their parents might possibly fire back? That they could go to prison for this? Their mom did have that new rifle. Uh, could they have been giddy? Big shit-eating grins on their faces? Thinking about spending all that money once their parents were dead and gone, not giving a fuck about the murders? Did they shoot first when they entered the den? Did they say some heinous stuff before then? Neighbors would later remember hearing what sounded like firecrackers a few minutes after 10. But dismissed it as nothing to be concerned about. But also, the wolves are carrying cool. shotguns. The room was illuminated wolves, only by the light coming from the TV. Wolves are pretty okay. Jose dozing I on a thin leather couch. In the, in the structure the nearest, the door of like, the hallway. really cool things. Jose's legs stretched out in front I'm of him. I'm going to say on the table, chimeras, along with he and Kitty's cool two ice cream dishes. Wolves, Kitty lying under a blanket. And dragons stretched out across the couch, chimeras. Her head in Jose's lap. Morning. Juba married for 26 years. Good morning, Ray. Despite Jose's How are you, Ray Vaughn? They were very much in love still. It's that so, Raven? Entered the room first. Uh, the two would never say exactly My how goodness. it all went down. Is it that and, uh, Raven? One of them pointed a 12 gauge Mossberg shotgun at their father and squeezed the trigger. First shot My shattered goodness. the glass, splintered the wood on the French doors behind how the couch. How does the time fly with that, you know, awake, with that Raven? Hits him in the left elbow. A third shot Here. hits him in the right arm. Bit tired. Now he knows. He fucking knows who's shooting at him. She's his like, final oh, no. watching it's his two the, sons uh, it's, gunning that's down a full Raven blood. reference again. He watched his arms screaming out in no. pain, blood pumping out of his body. I his thought wife we were Kitty done screaming with this. behind him. One of his sons, no. again, we don't know if it was Lyle or Eric, goes up behind Jose, no. places the shotgun near their father's head, and blows the good. back of his fucking head off. His limp body now slumps over the couch, hands resting on his stomach, feet on the floor. Meanwhile, Kitty finding herself in a fucking nightmare. Obviously, the first few shots had woken her up, her clothes, skin, splattered with blood, body tissue. She now stands up, tries to run away from her murderous sons, the two boys she carried in her womb for nine fucking months each, the baby she'd held against her breast seconds after the lungs filled with air for the first time. She has just watched them murder her husband, their father. She has to know they're coming for her. This is some Greek tragedy shit. After most of Jose's head is blown off, one of them now fires at her. She turns and flees, shooting her in the right leg near the calf. A second shot hits her right arm. She falls down between the couch and coffee table. Struggling to stand again, she slips in her and Jose's blood, falls back down. Desperately tries to run away. I imagine she's screaming. Another shot brings her down again. As she now lays on the floor, Eric and Lyle fire, hey, fire several I went more to shots social into their mom, thing yesterday. ripping her body with bullet holes. From Jose 15 to shot 20. shot a total of 15 but times. fell in Kyle was uh, next, talk real uh, well, so I didn't get out of there the left before uh, so close 23 to 30. Then so she was shot in the right arm, oh, no. then the left breast perforates her left oh, lung, no. a quarter of blood flows into her chest cavity. Despite all of this carnage, oh, no. forensic ex experts later determined that she is still You're alive. Very tired. That's, uh, she continues to breathe. Uh, that's what makes you a son, sleepy raven. Eric that's so out of sleepy raven. They pause, unsure of what to do next. One of them runs outside of the car to get more ammo. Comes back in. They reload their shotguns with birdshot now instead of the ball-bearing-sized pellets they'd used before. One of the brothers 
then, uh, you know, takes, uh, leans over the coffee table, puts a shotgun against Kitty's cheek, pulls the trigger, obliterating her face, shatters her skull. Then the brothers shoot both Jose and Kitty in their left knees. Why? Because they wanted to make it look like an execution. That's the thought. Like professional killers, organized crime hitmen were the ones who did this. They now carefully gather their shell casings from the spreading pools of blood covering the couch, floor, and yeah, rug. What happens next? Yeah, giving those hugs. Well, trying to find that out made me yeah, uh, let a lot give of profanities ha- 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 fly give out hug. the mouth. Uh, for this quality of reporting mm. with so many journalists cranking out so many articles, man, it's kind of shit. In some instances, finding good sources keeps getting harder. You read 10 different sources about what Lyle and Eric did after killing their parents, you're going to get 10 different answers. They went to see Batman. They went to see License to Kill. They went to see Batman, but it was sold out, so they saw License to Kill instead. They went to see License to Kill him, but they, that was sold out, so they saw Batman instead. They met up with their old tennis coach, Perry, at the Cheesecake Factory. They called Perry to meet up at the Cheesecake Factory, but didn't show. They showered up, changed clothes, tossed their shotguns into a ravine off of Mulholland Drive, then returned home, or some variation of all the things I just said. Uh, I'm a little bit dizzy to uh, put it all together, but I think I found the right source. Thank you, Murderpedia, for using the police report as a source, uh, and a few other sources, uh, including uh, you know the L.A. Times and Robert Rand's book for putting together what probably uh, did happen. Uh, here's what Lyle and Eric told Sergeant Thomas Edmonds, the police detective supervisor, when Eric and Lyle were taken to the police department for questioning not long after officers arrived at the scene of the crime. Lyle actually answered most of the questions while Eric sobbed. Lyle described how they had played tennis in the morning on the tennis court behind the house, watched part of a tennis match on TV, then spent the afternoon shopping at the Beverly Center, right, that local affluent shopping mall, a bunch of fancy stores. Around 5 p.m., they said they made plans to get together with a friend, Perry, the former tennis coach at Taste of L.A., the local food festival in Santa Monica. Brothers said they left home around 8 p.m. to go to Westwood Village and see License to Kill, the new James Bond film. But the line was too long, so they went to Century City Mall to see Batman instead. And they did buy tickets to Batman. They bought the Batman tickets before the murders, which a lot of sources do not make, uh, does, a lot of sources don't make that clear. After watching possibly part of the movie, the brothers drive to Santa Monica, uh, get lost on the way, miss their friend. That's what they told their cops. It seems most likely uh, they drove home, straight home, and killed their parents after leaving the movie. Afterwards, from a payphone, the brothers called Perry Berman, apologized for not showing up in Santa Monica, said they misunderstood where they were supposed to meet for a mm. taste of L.A. Now they make plans to meet at the Cheesecake yeah. Factory in Beverly Hills. They tell Berman I will be right back. they needed to drive home first but to get Eric's fake ID so Eric could buy a drink. Uh, they did tell Perry that according to Already testimony looking later. Good. Uh, the brothers then tell the police that when they returned house home, they good. noticed smoke in the house, especially in the quicker. family room. This would later seem odd to officers. No one else would smell smoke. I gotta go pee. Then Lyle Ow. said they walked into the family room, came upon a bloody Ow. scene they would never My forget. Legs. Lyle told Officer Edmonds about his mom's nervous mood, they were locking My the legs. doors, said his mom was on the verge of contemplating suicide. She was so rattled about somebody trying to kill her lately. Edmonds asked Lyle who hated his parents enough to try and kill them. He said, maybe the mob. Uh, backing up a bit now, nearly two hours after the murders, at 11.47, Lyle calls the police. He did this not long after telling Berman he'd meet him at the Cheesecake Factory. Here is how that call began. Hello, emergency. Yes, please. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, what's the problem? What's the problem? Don't tell my dad. Pardon me? Don't tell me. I can't find the full unedited audio anywhere online, but I found the transcript. Here's the rest. Dispatch. What? Who? Are they still there? Lyle, yes. Dispatch, the people who? Lyle, no, no. Dispatch, they were shocked? Lyle, Eric, man, don't. Dispatch, uh, talking over the background sounds of screams, and Lyle shouting, Eric, shut up. I have a hysterical person on the phone. Is the person still there? And then a second dispatcher joins the call. What happened? Have you been able to figure out what happened? Lyle, I don't know. Second dispatch. <sighs> you came home and found <sighs> who shot? Lyle says, my mom and dad. Uh, I'm glad you First were social. Are I'm glad you were social for People just a little shooting. bit. Lyle's screaming now. Eric, get away from them. Second dispatch. Who is the person who was shot? Lyle, my mom and dad. The call was two and a half minutes long. A minute or so later, Michael Butkus, Beverly Hills police officer, and his partner, John uh, Sarnaki, arrive at 722 Elm Drive. After walking around the outside of the mansion for several minutes, the police officers heard screaming, watched as two men ran out of the front door side by side, almost in step. Eric and Lyle ran past the officers, through the gate in the front of the driveway, fell to their knees on the grass between the sidewalk and street. Oh my God, I can't believe it, they screamed. 
The two cops tried to get information out of the brothers, but Eric seemed completely hysterical, running around, even trying to ram his head into a tree at one point. Lyle trying to calm him. Shortly after, Officer Butkus and Sir, uh, Cernaki discovered the bodies of Jose and Kitty Menendez. Detective Les Zoller receives a call at home from Marvin Ioni, chief of the Beverly Hills Police Department, informing him that he's been appointed to head the investigation of the Menendez murders. Mm. Zoller, 38, considered to be Beverly Hills' uh, top investigator. But I hope you're doing Zoller well. Zoller arrived at the Elm Drive with, mansion. What's your he plans today, Raven? Although the family room where the murders were committed was what's messy, been going on? it appeared that the clutter was not the result of the kind of ransacking you normally see for robbery. It appeared as though the victims were acquainted with their killers. Zola noticed that there was no forced entry into the home. He and other investigators counted over a dozen gunshot wounds between the victims, up to 15, likely 15, including one to the back of Mr. Menendez's head, which essentially decapitated him, another against, against Mrs. Menendez's left cheek, which literally blew away her eye and nose. Uh, didn't seem like a mob hit. It was clearly a crime of emotion, not a quick and dirty killing. Zola was skeptical of the brothers' claims regarding organized crime. He would have grilled the brothers, but they seem to have a good alibi. And, uh, you know, like I uh, pointed, uh, pointed out a while back, it's very rare for kids to kill their parents. Newspapers run with the mob story. Uh, given the fact that Jose frequently left the alarm system off and the house's gates open, even after his Mercedes-Benz had been stolen from the front circular driveway earlier, uh, police thought that, you know, maybe it could have been someone from outside the family who had a grudge against Jose and Kitty and did just walk in. Early reports describe the crime scene inside uh, as a gangland, gangland style killing, noting both Jose and Kitty had been shot in the kneecaps. Early on, the brothers' plan was working. Uh, the police, initially so unconcerned with Lyle and Eric, in part because of their grief over the loss of their parents that seemed so authentic, they didn't even test their brothers' hands for gunshot residue. Instead, they gave the brothers space to, cons uh, to console each other. Neighbors even recalled that Eric, the younger of the two brothers, has uh, curled up in a fetal position on the front of the lawn. And though they'd been questioned the night of the murders, police would not sit down again with Lyle and Eric Menendez until two months later. Three days mm. after Jose and Kitty are murdered, August 23rd, Dr. Irwin Golden of the L.A. County and Coroner's now, Office conducts their autopsy. A little bunny. These autopsies would reveal no the sequence plans. of shots that killed okay. him. Dr. Golden found right. bird shot in Kitty's wound, uh, wounds, right. which confirmed the investigator's suspicions that Kitty's killers had reloaded their weapons. None of Jose's right. wounds contained bird shot. Golden also discovered no that the plans. final wounds of the pair uh, were their knees. No oh, strings on mob, me. Mob members did it. They would have shot the knees first. Made no sense to shoot them in the knees after they're already dead. It seemed like is. someone was trying to make it look like the mob did it. Lyle and Eric staged an elaborate memorial service for Jose and Kitty on August twenty fifth, nineteen eighty nine. Sheer... Directors Guild of America. In LA. I'm not. Uh, also showed up an hour late. Should clean. Should been prep and pack. Earlier. Not kidding. Where are you going? You going on another trip? To make it to their parents' memorial. Uh, if you Eric already told me, I, it did seem like he'd I been do crying. apologize. Lyle I'm, appeared calm. I'm very calm. bad. August twenty eighth, nineteen eighty nine. I'm very, I'm very bad sometimes at this. Service held at the Chapel, Chapel in Princeton. At the service, Jose, or excuse me, Lyle spoke for thirty minutes and recalled how much Jose and Kitty had meant to him. Eric was too upset to speak. Going to soccer the parents Friday. Hell yeah. Eric, unsure whether to begin attending UCLA or devote himself to tennis, Lyle seemed more focused. He decided against continuing with his college education. He knew enough, and he began a plan for a career in business. August 31st, 1989, Eric and Lyle hire, hire a computer programmer to erase the files in Kitty's computer. Not suspicious at all. The police learned about Kitty's computer from Glenn Stevens, a friend of Lyle's. Glenn told the police that Lyle had told him that he erased a new will his parents had written and called a computer expert to ensure that no one would be able to retrieve that file. Yeek. Here seems like they killed him for money. Uh, the two months following the murders would be big ones for the Menendez brothers, who seemed to quickly stop grieving. They began their spending spree just four days after their parents' murders. In the weeks after they disposed of their parents, the brothers spent between five hundred and dollars in a buying blitz. They got new watches, cars, leases on apartments. Even bought a restaurant in Princeton. Uh, as well as got a new personal tennis coach, Mark Heffernan, for Eric. Uh, also a, a 40000 investment in a rock concert. Daddy had given them a lot of money before, but nothing like this. This looks uh, real suspicious. They drive around L.A. in Kitty's Mercedes-Benz SL convertible, dine expensively pretty much every meal, go on trips overseas to the Caribbean, London, laugh it up, have a great time partying with new and old friends. Part of the brother's shopping sprees funded by Jose's personal life insurance policy. Uh, and then there's all the family's assets, a fat checking account, the house on 14 acres in 
Calabasas or, you know, 13 to 40. Uh, the Jose and Kitty still own the Beverly Hills mansion. And the loans on both properties are deducted. The value of Jose's real estate is $5.7 million at the time of his death. Uh, Jose also owned 330,000 shares of live entertainment. Bam. I've been trading about that is 20 a bucks a share. That's a lot of money. That's another 6.6 .6 mil, equivalent to over $15 million today. Added to all this were Jose and Kitty's personal property and automobiles. The estate Jose and Kitty left was valued at $14 million, over $31 million today. But somehow, Lyle and Eric would only inherit about $2 million each after loans and taxes were subtracted. Not sure how the fuck that number got arrived at. I don't have access to their full financial portfolio, but that, uh, that's what sources say. Seems real low to me. Not sure what kind of debt Jose accrued to offset a lot of his assets. Uh, $2 million each, not a small inheritance, but it fell far short of Lyle and Eric's expectations. Uh, a friend of Eric said the brothers expected to inherit $90 million. I'm not sure what happened to that, uh, you know, $5 million uh, uh, insurance policy oh, line that they were supposed to get. Oh, hug my closest uh, and they friends. Yeah, so I don't know yeah. how that factors into the $2 million. Oh, uh, that will be uh, very nice. That Jose so nice. Had so really excited for it. Haven't account. seen him Neither physically since how four Jose years. Amassed that Definitely type of fortune. need to give him a big, uh, squishy hug. About a week after hug. murders, Lyle and Eric Eat. met with executives at Live to discuss uh, the assets they I maybe know. didn't know about no. that they should be receiving. Uh, I'm the gonna brothers be, are surprised uh, to learn that the five million dollar key man life insurance policy oh, yeah, that's in a right. while. Okay. Uh, I do know what happened to that. Uh, right, that life insurance you. policy was not valid. Bye because bye. before getting murdered, he never took his physical Enjoy examination. Enjoy your lurk. Uh, they would get some money out of life, though. I wanted the to hang out with Raven. They could not Raven. stay in the Beverly Hills mansion, right? It was uh, it was too scary for them. They were afraid that whoever murdered their parents might come for them. So they have live pay for them to stay at the Bel Air Hotel. Uh, and they run up an $8,800 bill in five days. $2,000 is just room service. That's a lot of steak and lobster. A lot of food for your friends. A lot of drinks. No, also, uh, Lyle also paid for a limousine ride, right bodyguard now. for the brothers. Uh, Lyle's bodyguard was al is... alarmed God damn when Lyle, God. I guess, would jump out of the limousine <laughs> before it would come to a complete stop uh, to go shop and spend yeah. money. And it's like cartoonish what these guys are doing. What the fuck are these idiots doing? On one occasion, the bodyguard watched uh, Lyle purchased $24,000 in stereo equipment alone. Then on September 4th, Lyle tells the bodyguards he doesn't need him anymore. His uncle was able to contact someone in the mob and arrange for some type of deal to have them not be murdered. Okay. Lyle did not explain how his uncle, a middle-aged businessman from a New Jersey suburb, would go about contacting the mob. Or how his uncle managed to remove a sentence of death from their heads. After living at various luxury hotels in Beverly Hills, the brothers now uh, rent adjoining apartments in the Marina City Towers in Marina Del Rey. Uh, Lyle's apartment rented for $2,150 a month. Eric's rents for $2,450 a month. And this is in 1989. Uh, the brothers see, uh, they get a penthouse in one of the towers that they want to buy. It's uh, $990,000, but their financing falls through. They're like, they're just trying to buy everything they can buy. Uh, they keep spending. Uh, Lyle decides he needs a new car. The red Alfa Romero that his parents purchased for him as a graduation gift from high school. Ah, not enough. Needs something new. He gets a Porsche 911 Carrera. Eric trades in his Ford, es Ford Escort for a Jeep Wrangler. Uh, by October of 89, Lyle has charged more than $90,000 to Jose's American Express card alone. He's uh, traveling frequently between New Jersey and California uh, on the MGM Grand, some kind of airline that catered to business people with expense accounts. He's, uh, he's busy right now trying to establish Menendez Investment Enterprises, trying to become a big businessman just like Daddy was. He gets a bunch of his friends from Princeton, you know, kind of, kind of friends, acquaintances together, makes them officers of this new business, Menendez Investment Enterprises. And this is my favorite part of this episode. Oh, buddy, this made me laugh so hard. Check out this insanity. Lyle rents an office for $3,000 a month in a uh, Princeton shopping mall. He furnishes it with a bunch of really expensive office furniture. And then he, he opens Menendez Investment Enterprises, but they never conduct any actual business. Like, none at all. Doesn't sound like they even had a, a business focus. He hires employees, right? He rents a space. He fucking puts on a suit. Doesn't know what he's doing. Reminds me of Kramer from Seinfeld, carrying around a briefcase full of fucking Ritz crackers, pretending to be a businessman. He comes up with a name, right? And I don't know what they do there. Maybe just vaguely talk about business. So fucking weird. All his employees are young, super inexperienced uh, in business, uh, kind of friends he'd only known for a few months. None of them have business skills. They're just pretending to be businessmen. Lyle, fake businessman, hires other fake businessmen. Hang out with him in a fake business office. This is like some kind of weird cosplay taken so far. What the fuck were they doing there? I just picture 
you know, Lyle standing at the end of some long, you know, cool looking conference table. Okay, boys, allow me to open the first meeting of Menendez Investment Enterprises by asking you to conduct some business. Eric, what business do you have for us today? Lyle, I, I told you, I don't, I don't want to do this. I, I just want to go play tennis. Pretend. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric, not into business today. That's it's okay. So funny. We have a lot of other it's businessmen here to pick up the business slack. Dom, hug, you like hug business, us. don't you? We need huggies. Uh, yeah, I, I, me I and, love business. Me uh, and well, Haven need whoa, huggies. That's exactly why I hired you to be CFO of Menendez <laughs> Investment Enterprises. What kind of business are you working on today? You fucking business crusher. I'm fucking uh, with you. Um, Go uh, do make, what make you need money. to do. Uh, Thank you for coming make, in, uh, Raven. Make a money business. Uh, it's just like hanging a, with business. you. I like fucking yes, Dom. That's what I like to hear. Money making business. I Armando, just like what about hanging you? With what you. kind of business do you have for us? I just think uh, you're I'm neat. I'm so confused, Lyle. I, I do like business, but what are we? And I appreciate I mean, your time. Uh, cars, uh, uh, stocks, uh, uh, real estate. Yes, yes, yes. All of that, Armando. <laughs> Making money, Armando. You're goddamn right, Dom. Uh, tennis? Fucking yes, Eric. Tennis business. No, I'm just, I'm going to play tennis. This is stupid, Lyle. Not the business attitude we want here. Menendez Investment Enterprise, Eric. You are fucking fired. Uh, more business. Insanity follows this. this is my, I love this. One of Lyle's actual business dreams is to own a restaurant. So he tries to buy Teresa's Pizza, a takeout pizzeria located across from Princeton's front gate. But Lyle offends the co-owner. With the ridiculously uh, low price, arrogant attitude, and the guy won't sell. Business! Guess Teresa's Pizza doesn't get business. Like Menendez Investment Enterprises. CEO, president, MVP, founder, quarterback, VIP, director, cool guy, starting pitcher, ho Joseph Lyle business guy Menendez. Uh, after the pizza rejection. Lyle decides to buy Chuck Spring business. Street Cafe. Work, work, work. Snack business shop, business. for instance. No, it's the funniest. Spicy chicken wings. This is why, like, they think that this, these motherfuckers Which did the kill. Of Teresa's Pizza will later say it was ridiculous. Their parents because it was worth for about money. $200,000. And it had nothing business. to do. That's how you do business. Buy high. It had Sell absolutely nothing to do Pay a lot. with. Sell later uh, for a big loss. That is business. That's the Menendez Investment Enterprises With business them way. being mistreated uh, or anything like that. that. Nope. Is in over his head. Uh, and had everything to do this guy with is these are fucking idiots. crazy idiots. And now he takes out a loan against his parents' homes. <laughs> Finances business deal. Uh, he immediately goes to work. This gets better. He immediately goes to work at Chuck's, and he accomplishes nothing good. He expands their home delivery hours from midnight to 1 a.m. He hires more people, changes the name to Mr. Buffalo's. Other merchants in Princeton think this is a bad idea since Chuck had good name recognition. But, uh, you know, it had been a years long staple in Princeton. But those merchants don't understand business. After purchasing Chuck's, Lyle announces he wants to open a second location in, nearby, in the nearby Princeton Mall, right? Another Mr. Buffalo's. And then more locations near UCLA, uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey, near Rutgers uh, University. He says he wants to open a new Mr. Buffalo's every two months. But, he doesn't know fuck all about chicken wings or business. While making these plans, his one location is hemorrhaging money because he's paying old classmates who don't know anything about chicken wings to work there, and he's letting a bunch of other people eat there for free. Holy shit. Business! Meanwhile, Eric yeah. also conducting some awesome business back home in California. These guys are a couple of business moguls. <laughs> Some shady dude convinces Eric to give him $40,000 to sponsor a rock concert at the Palladium in L.A. <laughs> and Eric just gives this guy $40,000 in cash. And that guy disappears. Because he was not a concert promoter. He was just a guy who saw easy money in Eric Menendez. Just another businessman. Eric decides now he's not cut out for business or for college. He wants to become a tennis pro. So he hires private coach Mark Heffernan for $60,000 a year. And they begin to travel extensively. Instead, <laughs> That's how you become a tennis pro. Do you start practicing tennis a lot? No. You go on a constant vacation. They stay at expensive hotels abroad. <laughs> Are you sure that they weren't <laughs> lovers? Because it feels like uh, they were like lovers. Mark also just took advantage of Eric. Meanwhile, the investigation into who killed their I parents is heating up. Let's, let's catch up with Detective Zola. 
his Barry Hill's investigation. Him and his uh, tennis his coach. Plan. On October 24th, two months after the murder, Zoller interviews Eric Maybe Menendez Maybe not even lovers, more Hills like mansion. a hooker uh, uh, with, a, uh, with the title. <laughs> in New Jersey, conducting sweet and savvy business, uh, he tells Eric that he's heard the brothers are not getting along. Eric then complains to him that Lyle, he, Lyle spends too much money. Like, uh, Eric also like a bit of a lover thing. Like yeah, like going on Although an Eric extensive cool vacation an interview, uh, Eric with him. Him. He thinks police Not are on actually him. practicing, he and he's like, uh, my tennis Princeton, coach. But he can't reach him. Sounds he's, Lyle, he's like he's, he's your he's lover. Spending, he's running numerous companies. But not even he's your lover. Chicken wing I, place, I don't even believe that, that he's that's his lover. I think that that's just a hooker with a different name. don't know what they're fucking doing there, so he can't come to the phone. Because so I don't Eric think he's with him. Uh, Jerome, he wouldn't be Ozeal, like, oh, yeah, also, you know, uh, he he's my lover. Lyle and will later I still get a paycheck from him. Now, this appointment will so, be very bad you know. for business. On October 31st, 1989, Halloween, Eric goes to see Dr. Azeel, dressed up as Optimus Prime from the Transformers. Dr. Azeel, dressed up as Megatron, leader of the Decepticons. It's a very tense session. JK, it was a tense session, but not because of dressed up. Uh, but by all means, please continue to imagine them dressing up as Transformers. <laughs> During the session, Ozeal and Eric sounds, walk around Beverly Hills. Ozeal encourages Eric to talk about his recent feelings of depression and suicidal thoughts. Ozeal and Eric soon walk back to Ozeal's office. And as they near the office, Eric stops walking, leans up against a parking meter. Ozeal stops walking as well. And then Eric says, we did it. We killed our parents. Who says it straight up. Eric then tells Ozeal about the Billionaire Boys Club, some miniseries based on a true story. <laughs> He and Lyle had watched together. Uh, some L.A. rich kids who uh, murdered for money. And afterwards, uh, they talk about their shared beliefs that Jose is going to disinherit them, going to cut them out of the will. And that's so terrible because he's always been such an asshole and dominated them. They tell each other they should kill their dad. Uh, but then they worry about their mom. Kitty presents a problem. They don't want to kill her. But they can't think of a way to get away with killing their dad without also killing her. Eric does not mention a word about sexual abuse. Uh, at this point, Aziel stops Eric from saying anything more has him call Lyle, who now is back in L.A. from Princeton. You know, he's taking a little business break. Lyle races over to Ozeal's office. Before he gets there, Eric continues telling his Isn't story. Isn't tennis coach uh, well, housewives called their lovers? The uh, how they thought they committed the perfect crime. Fucking right? They've been careful. Like, up the shotgun what the fuck? Yeah. Shooting. Uh, uh, now, nowadays, it's no longer about a that tennis coach. It's a yoga So now uh, the fingerprints are going to be everywhere. Once they you don't understand. Up, he says that like, Lyle it's drove a Eric's car to Mulholland Drive, a windy road that runs from the Pacific Ocean to the San Fernando Valley. In me. Stopped on the drive, Eric waited until the I area think that's was also car, disgusting, and they threw but the shotguns like, into the nearby you know, canyon. It's a business. They then headed for a gas station where they dumped their blood-spattered clothing and shoes into a dumpster along with shell cases. And then they drove home. They really thought about this. So maybe not as dumb as I uh, was making them out to be a second ago. But they are pretty dumb. But in this instance, they did something smart. Uh, you know, cold-blooded but smart. They said they intended to go to the Cheesecake Factory then to meet up with their friend Perry, but Eric was falling apart, so they went home, called the police instead. Now, Lyle arrives to the session, and he is furious. He starts ranting, rambling, uh, saying anything he can think of to justify their actions, including, so weird, that he thinks his dad, Jose, would be proud of him for committing such an effective, well-thought-out murder. Fucking what? Dad would be so proud of the way I killed him. Uh, Aziel explains to the brothers the difference between a crime that takes place in a moment of heated passion at one point during this session, such as during an argument, and a crime committed to reach a specific goal like killing for money. Because I guess the brothers thought, like, well, if we get caught, it's a crime of passion. Aziel explains, like, no, not necessarily. He, he says the behavior in the latter situation is considered the behavior of a sociopath. Uh, Aziel would later testify in court. The brothers then looked at each other and said, we're sociopaths. Cool. Also, Lyle does not mention sexual abuse. Worried that Aziel might report them, Lyle does threaten to kill Aziel if he tells anyone about the murders. November 2nd, boys meet with Aziel again. Lyle threatens to kill Aziel again, telling him that he and Eric had already considered killing him to keep uh, their secret. I'm sure, that was super fun to hear and very relaxing. Uh, Aziel could have uh, now reported Lyle and Eric to the police because they had threatened him, and this threat erases the patient therapist confidentiality barrier. Uh, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he makes notes. He tape records their sessions, continues to see them. Two weeks later, November 17th, two police officers interview Eric's friend, Craig Signorelli. Yeah, fucking... Signorelli tells him that a few days after the murders, he visited the brothers bastards. in the Beverly Hills mansion. During the visit, Eric asked Craig if he wanted to know, quote, how it happened. According to Craig, Eric told him that on the night of the murders, he and Lyle had come home to get his fake ID 
As Eric was walking towards the car, after finding his ID, Lyle appeared with the shotguns. Let's do it, Lyle supposedly said. According to Craig's story, it seems like he's really just trying to blame this on uh, Lyle. The plan was that Lyle was going to shoot Jose and Eric was going to shoot Kitty. But after Lyle shot Jose, Eric froze. He couldn't do it. So Lyle stepped in and shot their mom. Once it looked like she was dead, Eric then shot her twice. At the police station, Craig tells the detectives he didn't know whether to believe Eric or not. When he was told that she tells him that he and Eric have a running gag where they tell each other a fucked up story and then eventually say, eh, it could have happened. Basically a little mind game between them. The detective's not sure what to make of Craig's story. After consulting Pam Ferrero, the L.A. County Deputy uh, District Attorney, they decide that they didn't have enough on the basis of this story to charge the brothers with murder, but they now have a lead. The brothers are suspects, and the detectives decide to get Craig to wear a wire, meet up with Eric again, see what he might say in the presence of his friend. Craig agrees. A dozen days later, November 29th, 89, the trap is set. Craig is to meet Eric at Gladstone. They really for fish should have uh, watched how to get away with murder. <laughs> I've been to Gladstone two times. On his right? spot, These fucking idiots should have fucking uh, they done that. They sat down. Craig slowly brought the story that Eric told him. But instead of confessing, Eric said he'd been lying earlier that he and Lyle had nothing the to do with the brother's murder. Oh, it's a bust. Literally now went on trial the for them. Think, well, maybe the brothers did have something to do. And with he's it. he Several gets nothing out of this. The brothers and they threatened think they'll him. never get caught. And he's like, yeah, I'm fucking going to tell the cops. Fuck that. Fuck these idiots. Jose's estate probated. The brothers wind up with their parents' fortune. Then finally, in March of 1990, new lead shows up. March 5th, over six months after the murders, a woman named Judalon Smith contacts the police, saying she has some important information. Judalon was a 37-year-old woman, owned an audio tape duplicating business, and also Dr. Azil's mistress. She tells investigators that Azil had asked her to eavesdrop on the second half of a therapy session he'd had with Lyle and Eric on October 31st, 1989. Yep, when Dr. Azil told Eric to call Lyle, he also made a call to his mistress, had her come to the office. She did, and she recorded some of what she heard. She said she heard what sounded like a shouting match. First, Lyle said, I can't believe you told him. We've got to kill him and anyone associated with him. According to Judalon, Eric screamed back, I can't stop you from what you have to do, but I can't kill anymore. The session ended when Eric ran out of the office sobbing. Then Judalon said Lyle uh, left the office, followed by Dr. Azil. In the parking lot, Lyle threatened Azil. Azil asked Lyle if he was threatening him. Lyle shook his hand and said, good luck. Dr. Azil. Over the following months, Judalon said Azil continued to see the brothers for therapy sessions. Dude was either brave or stupid to keep counseling uh, murderers who kept saying they were going to kill him. Uh, he tells them that he might be able to help them piece together events in their family's history, find out what had caused them to kill their parents. And during the following months, while they do complain endlessly about their dad being a domineering asshole, they do not mention sexual abuse a single time. Now the police have Lyle and Eric's murder confessions, extended conversations about the murders on tape. Three days later, March 8th, 1990, around 1 p.m., Lyle and his friends decide to go out for lunch. Lyle's friends jump in Eric's Jeep. Lyle gets behind the wheel. The destination is the Cheesecake Factory. Just like it was the night of the murders, these fuckers love the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, me too. Even though my butt now weeps at the thought of cheesecake destroying my digestive system. That's another story that no one ever wants to hear. Uh, down the street from the Elm Drive Mansion, the Beverly Hills police are lying in wait. They decided to get surrounding the mansion or storming it by force Cheesecake because is Maria, delicious. Jose's mom, but also her grandma, it will destroy your now, They want to harm her in the process of arresting the it's grandson. It's very bad. Soon a cruiser very pulls up naughty. with lights and sirens it on needs in front to stop of being so delicious. Uh, I guess, you know, Eric's Jeep. But also he's driving incredible. It. He slams on the brake just short of running into the blue car, throws the Jeep into reverse, and crashes into a police so van behind him. Police are everywhere. An officer screams, get out of the Jeep. Loud does. Promptly handcuffed. Brought to the West Hollywood Sheriff's Office. He is then booked to the station, transported to the L.A. County Men's Jail in downtown L.A. Later that afternoon, uh, the Los Angeles County District Attorney, Ira Reiner, holds a press conference and says, I don't know what your experience is, but it's been our experience in the District Attorney's Office that $14 million provides ample motive for someone to kill somebody. He continues, special circumstances have been attached to the charges, which means that if convicted, the brothers could be put to death in San Quentin's gas chamber. After hearing about Lyle's arrest, uh, Eric calls his uncle Carlos from Israel, where he's competing in a tennis tournament. That's right, yeah, because it's Eric's Jeep. Uh, Lyle was driving it. Eric was not in it. Uh, uncle Carlos tells Eric that the best thing for him to do is to turn himself in. I bet Eric regrets the shit out of taking that advice now. Right? He could still be out on the run somewhere. Maybe. Probably not. He's not real bright. But Eric then flies to Miami to meet his aunt, Marta Kano. Kano notifies Detective Zoller. She's flying with Eric from Miami to L.A., 
Uh, March 11th, 1990, you know, he's arrested at the uh, LAX, Los Angeles International Airport. And then he is booked into LA County Men's Jail and kept separate from his brother. While the brothers have now been arrested, Zoller is still building the case against him. He doesn't have any physical evidence linking the brothers to the murder. Yes, he... Their search for the murder weapons soon turns up a new lead when Judalon Smith tells him that Eric I would be from the so guns upset if I couldn't eat cheesecake anymore. Smith I know. Also told Zola it would be so upsetting. Diego, which Lyle visited frequently for tax reasons. It would be Zola upsetting, thinks right? Thinks the brothers would have selected a smaller store. It would be to so upsetting. Uh, the runs between you, LA and San Diego. Uh, you so couldn't. they could get home with the guns quickly, but searching smaller stores doesn't yield anything. And he thinks that they've been so dumb, so arrogant. They would simply buy their guns from a big chain store. Hope you've been doing good, good Yes. On March 14th, Do you have any detectives new go to emotes? Big Five on Convoy Street in San Diego. They ask We've the got the so many wonderful record. emotes detectives now. Detectives find the sale of two Mossberg 12 gauge shotguns, these $199 wonderful each, emotes. August 18th. Uh, Look the at form all. is signed by Donovan J. Goodrow, and it lists a San Diego address. Zoller calls Donovan, that fucking kid who used to do Lyle's homework back in Princeton, Asked him where he was August 18th. Well, he was in New York City. He's working at a, a job managing a restaurant and had a, uh, you know, um, a time clock card that was punched to prove it. The address on the form is phony, but the driver's license number on the form does match Donovan's. Lyle had written it down years ago. When they sent the form to Donovan, he said the signature not even close to his. Elliot Aldehoff, uh, the assistant district attorney now assigned to the case, asked the court for an order allowing him to collect handwriting samples from Lyle and Eric to compare to the signature on the firearm form. I, I love this. Eric refuses, but then signs the refusal form. <laughs> and the signature on the refusal form matches the signature uh, that was used to buy the shotguns. And now they know that the guns that had been used uh, to kill Kitty and Jose are the ones that the Menendez brothers bought. <laughs> the Menendez family now lawyers God. up. Eric and Lyle's extended God, family stand behind so them. so stupid. First, it's many so funny. If they were promised it, to share this is really support. kind of funny, the even though they're try, awful uh, by trying to find legal representation for Eric, uh, then Lyle. How you been, they Azzy? Select, uh, to represent oh, my Eric, God. Leslie I Abramson. Know, right? Abramson. Fucking idiot. <laughs> uh, a tiny woman with a little orphan Annie hairdo. Vocabulary like a sailor <laughs> and an unstoppable will. Uh, Leslie, a veteran lawyer, been, feared by many prosecutors. Hope you've been doing well. After Hope attending Queen's College and Law School good. at UCLA, she was admitted to the State Bar of California in 1970, then spent six years working in the L.A. County Public Defender's Office. Then opened Give her own, her own said, private what practice <laughs> uh, in, the, in, the in the Public oh my Defender's God. Office oh, your son's and listening. became known for awesome. her take-no-prisoner's tactics. According to the LA that Times, cool, that she cool spent one. her working life building a reputation as a four foot but one yeah, fire eating mud slinging nuclear strength pain in the legal uh, butt. This is the first Abramson, page so far, and the, the year by the LA Criminal Courts Bar Association. Twice blam, blam, blam. Yeah, uh, just trying to get into a flow of things again after my holiday. Years old, oh, her yeah. license practice law is still active, but apparently, you had a holiday. Nice. Uh, she eventually got tired of so the legal service. So this is circus. page one. Uh, maybe is her now done. Finally got bothered for making Basically, money by keeping murderers I just from receiving need to justice. And that is not clean it up a little bit. And then by the way. just her. She seemed to love to help murderers. We're gonna do. Get away with uh, I'm gonna do a few Back other things to clean it up and prime. stuff like that. Very successful in defending her clients. But Only one client done. she'd represented had gotten a death sentence, and she had represented many a murderer. Whether or not she believed that the brothers had killed their parents, she certainly proclaimed in public that they didn't. The and that's the so job. Awesome. Tells yeah. the Washington Post, I've represented people charged with murder for 27 years. Yeah, and these guys just don't measure up to anybody yeah. else I've ever represented. These are not murderers. These are troubled kids in a very difficult and grotesque Thank home environment. Thank you, and they crack. Well, I'm glad Menendez's they had a good holiday. Her 15th high-profile oh, murder Oh, thank case. you. Her fee for oh, defending boy, Eric. Thank you. I'm just going to copy and paste it and, uh, in the, the next panel. Because family retained Jill Lancy, uh, I'm not fucking slender blonde it woman. She had just left the L.A. County Public Defender's Office to it open her like own private pain, practice. Sounds like a pain in the ass. Unlike Abramson, Lansing did not have sounds much like experience with high-profile cases. Sounds like a huge pain cases. in the butt. She also no longer practices law. Uh, not sure why the family hired a much stronger attorney for Eric uh, than Lyle. Maybe they thought Lyle did it. Uh, they hired other attorneys to round out the Menendez family legal team. They hired Marsha Morrissey, mm -hmm. who had been a L.A. County public defender, Michael Burt, head trial attorney in the San Francisco public defender's office, and an expert in death penalty law. Uh, that's brothers why we do the things their parents, uh, March digitally 26, to make it easier. In Judge yes. Judith Stein's courtroom in the Beverly Hills Municipal Court. The brothers had been in the L.A. County jail for two weeks, we're just but neither acted as if they were uh, under any kind of suspicion. Observers we're just thought they looked smug, to arrogant. 
this merch. If they were positive, my holiday kind of reminded me I miss living and uh, with Lyle's in Melbourne. Business mind. Uh, so I'm going to try look? and move You're there next year. Yeah. Uh, the courtroom was filled with reporters and supporters right. of the brothers, also, uh, including uh, oh, Lyle's ex girlfriend, gotcha, gotcha. Jamie uh, Pisrick, Eric's tennis coach, Mark Heffernan, uh, who had been also, in Israel I'm with him that... before he was arrested. That Maria you're Mendez, so, also you're in so the audience, blessed. supported by a large number of Mendez family members. I understand people members. have uh, Brothers, tough Wade, times these days. Friends and relatives acting like they didn't have a care in the world. I totally First get it. First phase of the trial would deal heavily with doctor-patient confidentiality, essentially deciding whether or not the tapes that Dr. Azil made could be allowed as evidence. And then, in August of 1990, the court does give the prosecution a major victory when uh, the court states that the tapes of the conversations between Eric and Azil were admissible. Because it's Lyle also close to the holidays and whatnot. Uh, Leslie promptly appeals the decision he to the California Court of Appeals. March 2nd, 1991, the California Court of Appeals overturns. I was going to do a hug uh, uh, emote. The decision. Uh, but the I don't know. What do you think? With the California Supreme what do you Court. think, is? And on June 4th, 1992, the California Supreme emote? Court decides the release of the tape, uh, you know, is not barred by the patient therapist privilege because, again, you mm. know, Azil uh, had been threatened. So now the trial can proceed after a bunch of fucking legal wrangling. The Menendez brothers have now been in jail for almost three years. In jail, Little separated from other, you know, prisoners housed in separate cells in the jail's 7,000 section. Uh, that section has housed high-profile inmates save. since notable times like Alumni like save. Night Stalker Richard Ramirez and O.J. Simpson. Remember to in jail, save. Eric and Lyle eat their meals in cells and uh, exercise for one hour three times a week outside of their cells. Yeah, my birthday is during coming up uh, to, uh, too soon, so uh, hopefully I can go on holiday again suicidal, for a weekend or Xanax. something to do something also fun then. Yeah, 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 yeah we need a hug emote. Oh, yes, hug emote. Uh, was this yes. genuine, or was he laying the grounds for a new uh, defense strategy? I was we'll thinking, say that later. it's uh, two June emotes, of 1990, Eric weekly, and one side is one of the characters, and one side is the other character. Uh, and they, the they come together to spend hug. a great deal of time on the telephone. <laughs> yeah, They're two separate the emotes, and Buffalo. they come together in a hug. Uh, not kidding. And this caused other prisoners to complain about the number and length of his telephone calls. Sorry, guys! He has business! <laughs> he has chicken wings to not sell. <laughs> yes, he's still running his business at a loss, but that's part of a complex, long-con business plan most people who have small brains and don't have empty offices at malls don't get. Yeah. I fucking love that he's running a wing joint. Uh, terribly in jail. Around this time, sheriff for years. Around this time, sheriff's deputies find that Lyle's ankle chains have almost been cut through. They suspect he's planning an escape. They conduct an inspection on both Lyle and Eric's cells. Find a 17-page letter from Lyle to Eric, along with some notes in Eric's cell. Uh, the notes describe plans to travel to South America and then hide out in the Middle East. <laughs> deputies also find this is why I'm laughing. Uh, a weird drawing of a building with too many stairwells and doors. Deputies try to match it to the courthouse that Lyle had been in, but can't find a building that this drawing resembles. I like to think that he was planning <laughs> his escape here. This is like an important part of the escape plan, like a map of how they're going to get out. But he's just not very good at drawing. And then, you know, like he, he gets a chance to break out of the courthouse. Mm. Uh, he gets Eric. You know, they're, they're back. They're running away. And they both get lost because of his shitty fucking map. They're just like, Lyle, that would be where cool. are we going? Yeah. Uh, um, hold on. Uh, we just have to find a staircase on top of another staircase next to an elevator. What? We need to look for a bathroom. I just wish it, it wasn't five ninety nine for my uh, for my lovely emotes. My I would love everybody to have, have emotes. It looks out at a tree. It's my bigger cool than the whole emotes. courthouse. I want oh, oh. people to enjoy. We need to look for some people with giant heads and very skinny arms, legs, and bodies nearby. Most people you don't need to be good at drawing uh, when you're in business. Lyle's yeah, tells Eric that he will never <laughs> you testify don't need to be good at doing Lyle anything advice when you're a business uh, man. Jose would have been, you know, proud of him. Uh, Lau wrote, I'm not an ordinary person. I do not see things in terms of manslaughter and life terms. I only see win, lost, honor, and dishonor. Dad is watching, and I will not disappoint him a second time, or mom, by giving up and having their deaths be in vain. Oh, what's happening here? Uh, near the beginning of their time in jail, Lyle and Eric are visited by Eric's former girlfriend, Janice. Uh, apparently, while Eric talked to Janice, Lyle stood by silently, creepily stared directly at her breasts. Uh, Janice felt so violated, she told Eric never to allow his brother to come to visitations again. Oh, sorry, Janice. Guess you don't know how fucking business works. Oh, my God. We go smell the business, Janice. Um, Lyle's not checking you out. He's filing away, uh, you know, business plans, not just boob fantasies to jerk off to later. He's putting together some solid and comprehensive sales 
plans. He's brainstorming Here how can he combine chores. food it's with okay. chicken wings, Janice. You idiot. He just came up with it's business okay, goals. Azzy. He came up with the idea oh. for Hooters. You're too dumb to note it. I, he came up with it I nine years after brilliant. Hooters opened. Anyone can come up with a great idea first, Janice, but only the best business minds can come up with a great idea second. More than three years after the murder, just wish on December 8th, 1992, like, the Fenders brothers indicted by the fucking, L.A. County Grand Jury uh, on charges Twitch. of murdering their parents like, in two special likes circumstances. Nobody Twitch, but people like the users that convicted, on Twitch. They could be put to death. The two circumstances were that it you was know, a multiple murder, that, and the they had reason been that lying they in, uh, in the first third special place, circumstance, that they committed you know? the murders for financial gain, was thrown out by the Grand Jury, which is surprising to me. Uh, the Menendez brothers' trial would now be held at the L.A. County Superior Court, located at the San Fernando Valley Government Center in Van Nuys. Judge Lee Stan Weisberg presided over the trial. Uh, Weisberg is in his mid-50s. He had just presided over the first Rodney King trial. Like the Rodney King trial, the Menendez brothers' trial uh, would become a cultural obsession. The, uh, the brothers' first trial in 1993 made history as it played out, you know, as I said earlier, uh, live on television on Court TV while America watched at home. May 14, 1993, Judge Weisberg rules that the cases of Lyle and Eric will be tried together in the interest of time, cost, and convenience. Weisberg ruled that each brother would have a separate jury. This meant that if the evidence that pertained only to Lyle was being heard, Eric's jury would be excluded and vice versa. So interesting. From the time of the brothers' arrest until shortly before the trial began, Leslie Abramson, Abramson and Jill Lansing uh, held their cards close to their chests and did not reveal what their defense strategy would be. In June, that strategy was revealed and shocks the nation. During a pre-trial hearing on June 9, 1993, Abramson said that the defense would admit the brothers had murdered their parents, but they would argue that Jose and Kitty deserved it. Why? Abramson and Lansing would argue that the brothers had been abused by their parents for many years, including sexual abuse. The athletic spoiled rich sons who uh, each at one time in their lives considered becoming professional tennis players were going to be portrayed now as victims of child abuse, physical, emotional, sexual. But one big problem with this argument. The brothers had never, ever complained to their psychologist or anyone else about this abuse, except maybe those two cousins. There was no medical evidence, no photographs of bruises, no concerning trips to the doctor. If this defense were to succeed, Abramson and Lansing would have to carefully reconstruct specific incidents of abuse that involved Lyle and Eric. They brought in Paul Monitz, uh, a lawyer and children's rights advocate uh, to help them do this. Monitz had written a book titled, When a Child Kills, Abuse Children Who Kill Their Parents which outlined how attorneys can successfully defend children accused of killing their parents. In the book, based on Moni's research, uh, I'm not sorry to say, say his name, actually. I couldn't find a video. It's M-O-N-E-S. Uh, he said that the kids who kill their parents are usually normal and favor non-confrontation right up until the murder. He said that child-parent murders happen after years of suffering abuse silently and trying to please parents. Moni's argued that the uh, murders themselves tended to be characterized by overkill. So instead of firing one bullet, the child shoots the parent abuser over and over again. And in no uncertain terms, Monas believes that when an abusive parent is murdered, it's their fault, not the kids. So interesting ethical dilemma. Is it ever okay to murder your abuser? If so, when? And what if you murder them when you no longer live with them? When you're long, no longer under their roof and a child? Is it still okay to enact vengeance? Uh, Abramson and Lancey would try to prove Lyle and Eric have been abused by using uh, an abuse diagnostic tool developed by therapist E. Sue Bloom, which measured characteristics of incest survivors. The diagnosis consisted of a 34-item checklist detailing the after-effects of child sexual abuse. And Bloom's checklist had many items that could be applied to both brothers. Fear of sleeping alone, stealing, desire to disassociate from family, living in a fantasy world, feeling like one needed to achieve in order to be loved. Uh, those traits can also, of course, though, be found in people who are not victims of any kind of abuse. Uh, the defense attorney seemed to try and invoke sympathy from the jury by making Lyle and Eric look like abused children as well. Uh, visually. They had them dress in boyish sweaters, sports uh, shirts, khaki pants, making them look like teenagers instead of the 22 and 25-year-old men they were now. Uh, throughout the trial, Abramson would also do shit like pick lint off of Eric's sweater like she was his fucking aunt or grandma. She would put an arm around his shoulder, whisper into his ear, you know, actions implying he's not a killer, he's a misunderstood boy, he just needs good parenting. The trial begins on July 20th, 1993. Prosecutor Pam Bozonich's opening statement lays out the case against Lyle. Pam also retired now. Uh, Bozanich previously prosecuted uh, uh, the infamous McMartin preschool case. We talked about that case back in episode 31 of Time Sit, uh, the Mandela Effect episode. That trial ran from 87 to 90, ruined a lot of lives. Infamous example of satanic panic, improper questioning of child witnesses. 
false memory syndrome, most expensive trial up to that point in American history, right? The children in that case accused defendants of doing ridiculous shit like being flushed fucking down toilets into secret rooms, uh, <laughs> being shown the, the devil, uh, gave people the ability to fly. Uh, Chuck Norris was, showed up from time to time, you know, <laughs> might have molested. It was, fucking, it was Salem witch trial shit. It happened over 30 years ago. People's lives ruined over nonsensical, paranoid, delusional, conspiratorial allegations. Uh, a reminder not to let the world devolve into conspiratorial fucking idi idiocy. Uh, back to this Bozanich trial, um, or this one, you know. Bozanich described the brutality of the murders, right? All the wounds to uh, Jose and Kitty. Described the spending spree after the murders. Rolex watches, cars, apartments, you know, lots of business equipment. Bozanich would often remind the jurors throughout the trial that if Lyle and Eric could lie so frequently and in such good great detail to avoid being caught previous to the murders. They could also lie about child abuse to avoid death sentences. Uh, these guys had recently practiced lying a lot, which is very true. Hate Bozanich for the bullshit she pulled in the McMartin trial, like some of her work here. Uh, Jill Lancey began her opening statement by telling the jurors that, yeah, Lyle and Eric killed their parents, but the trial wasn't about that. I'm pretty sure it was, but whatever. She'd say, we're not disputing when it happened. The only thing that you're going to have to focus on in this trial is why it happened. That is some lawyer, mumbo-jumbo, Jedi mind trick shit, if I've ever heard it. Uh, she continued, what we will prove to you is that the murders were committed out of fear. Fear of two parents who were so brutal, so manipulative, so sexually perverse, that they drove their own sons to the most desperate act of defilement. The main threat of the defense was twofold. One, that Eric and Lyle didn't have to kill their parents for money because they already lived luxurious lifestyles. And two, that they'd had to murder their parents, that they had to murder their parents because they had been victims of sexual abuse. But why everyone wondered... Would the brothers wait to kill their parents until 1989 if the abuse had been going on for so long? Why do it after both of them were out of high school? Jill had an answer. She said that, uh, you know, a few days before the murders, Eric told Lyle that he'd been molested by Jose for the last 12 years. Lyle was shocked because he had been molested by Jose from ages 6 to 8. They just found this out. Then, according to Lansing, Lyle confronted Jose, told him that the abuse had to stop, uh, and that he was going to take Eric out of the house and leave forever. Uh, Eric was, you know, already planning on leaving just a few weeks later to go to UCLA, but whatever. And according to Lansing, uh, Jose told Lyle that Jose would do whatever he wanted to his son. No one would threaten him. Lansing went on to say that Jose made it very clear to Lyle that this secret would never leave the family and that the people who held the secret and this power over him would not be allowed to live. And that feels like a script of a poorly written melodrama to me. Feels phony. Uh, that was when the brothers drove to San Diego, purchased shotguns to you, uh, using Donovan's driver's license. Right, they had to. They had to defend themselves to defend Lyle's business plans. Why hadn't they told anyone about the abuse in no uncertain terms previously? Yes, it was the, the cousins. Uh, Lansing said it was because their shame was so great. In her opening statement, Leslie Abramson expanded on many of the same themes that Jill Lansing outlined during her opening statement. Abramson told the jury that Lyle had acted the way he had to defend his brother. Eric needed to be defended because he was the real victim in the family. She acknowledged that Eric's revelation of abuse might look suspicious, especially after he spent time in jail. But that didn't mean he made it up. As for Kitty, both Eric and Lyle's teams would argue that she died because her sons could not go to her for support. He said that Kitty was a disturbed person who dished out more abuse, sexual, physical, and psychological. Interesting that she's being accused. Not even any cousins grown up heard any allusions to her being sexually abusive. Uh, Judge Weisberg would not allow the attorneys to describe Kitty's problems with alcohol and prescription drugs, but they would allow them to talk about Kitty being unstable and obsessive. Uh, now to go along with their new characterizations of Jose and Kitty, the defense presents a brand new, highly unlikely the shit ever fucking happened rundown of the weeks leading up to the murders. This is ridiculous. Abramson described how in the week before the murder, Kitty and Lyle got into a screaming match. It ended, get, ended up getting physical. And then Kitty yanked Lyle's toupee off his head. And when this happened, Eric is shocked. He didn't know Lyle had a toupee. And the shock of this alleged discovery made Eric ask Lyle if anything else suspicious had been going on. And then Lyle was like, I don't know, anything suspicious going on with you? And that's when Eric told Lyle that Jose had molested him. And then Lyle was like, what? Me too. We have to kill him. I'm paraphrasing. But that's the gist of the defense. Fucking what? Did you catch that? The defense is arguing that the incident that kicked off a double murder revolved around a toupee being ripped off. That's some of the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Uh, if I'm a juror, I'm openly rolling my eyes and mumbling some version of, get the fuck out of here. Come on. It seems so fucking made up. Just weird. Eric would have known Lyle was wearing a toupee. You don't hide that from your brother for years. Come on!
Then after the pay, after the uh, two pay incidents, school run? No. That never happened. Uh, the same week, Jose school supposedly told Eric he would have to sleep away. at home several days a week. So that Jose and Kitty could keep track of his school. And Abramson said that Eric assumed this meant the sexual abuse would continue. He's about to turn 19 now, by the way. Athletic. Big as his dad. Now the boys have no time to waste. They drive to San Diego to buy shotguns. The prosecution now reminds everyone that Eric and Lyle had been through years of therapy, never once discussed any of this. In fact, their brothers had never spoken about any kinds of abuse until they needed a legal defense, almost seven months after they murdered their parents. Eric's out of the house. Lyle's almost out. They both don't seem capable of fending for themselves in the world. They love fancy shit. Their dad's about to cut, uh, about to cut them out of the will. Come on. It was about the money. Both sides now call witnesses. All kinds of people will testify, even the captain of the boat, the Menendez family chartered to go shark fishing, right, the day before their parents were killed. The captain said they were an odd family. Uh, the brothers spent almost the entire seven-hour trip huddled together in front of the boat. Uh, at the end of the testimony, Abramson told reporters the reason the brothers stayed to themselves was because they were worried about being murdered on the boat. The fuck? How are Jose and Kitty going to kill them in front of a crew of witnesses? How does Abramson say stuff like this with a straight face? I don't like her. Did she represent murderer after murderer because she wanted to make sure innocent people don't go to prison, or is she just some sick fuck who likes murderers? Uh, whether or not it had been an actual plot to kill them, Abramson said, oh, it didn't matter. I beg to differ. She said what mattered was that the brothers had been made paranoid, oppressed over the years by so much abuse that, you know, everything seemed life-threatening, and they had to strike back. She's really redefining reality for the jury here, presenting nonsense as fact. The prosecution calls their star witness now, Dr. Azil. Before he takes a stand, Abramson promises to attack his credibility in every way known to man and God. Cool. Azil has a smoking gun, the Menendez brothers' confessions. August 4th, he begins the first six days of testimony for the prosecution. It says before both Lyle and Eric's juries that the brothers wanted to kill Jose because he was dominating and made them feel inferior, not because of sexual abuse. Giddy, he said, was murdered because the brothers just couldn't figure out how to leave her alive not because she was an abuser. Azil provides the only detailed recreation of the murders in the brothers' own words, and at the root of it are, is financial gain. The Menendez brothers weren't abused kids. They were greedy sociopaths, in his opinion. After this, Eric and Lyle take the stands to defend themselves. Lyle testifies That's for nine never days. never a good idea. He a stream of stories about the alleged molestation he suffered from ages six to eight, and a story, randomly, that he also molested his brother when Eric was five. Not sure why he included that. Maybe he just wanted to show, like, his dad made things so crazy he just didn't know what to do. What was right? What was wrong? Both Lyle and Eric cry frequently during Lyle's testimony. Lyle testifies that at 13, he came to believe his dad was molesting his brother, which is fucking ridiculous, because earlier, Abramson said that they just found out about it during the toupee incident. Remember the whole, my mom pulled yeah, my brother's exactly. wig and let me confess That's my brother being sexually like, abused and let him to confess to being sexually abused to me, which led to the that we had to kill both defense. It doesn't did help that you. It did. So much bullshit here. So much smoke and mirrors. Does this story add up? A lot of TikTokers seem to think the Menendez confessions of abuse are 100% true. Makes me not have a lot of faith in the critical thinking abilities of a lot of TikTokers. Yeah, uh, I realize exactly. two cousins would reference thinking that Jose sexually abused Lyle and Eric, but after all this shit, I question their statements. Did Abramson coach them into saying that? Find some witnesses who could be manipulated with leading questions into maybe false memories? I don't know. It just uh, She seems so good at just being manipulative and just helping people manufacture bullshit. Uh, Lyle also now adds that Kitty sexually abused him when he was 11 and 12, even though no one ever heard anything about anything like this before. Uh, there was no way to run from them, Lyle said, because they were so powerful they would have found them and killed them. On September 27th, Eric testifies. He begins to testify. Uh, his testimony mostly consists of him reiterating his belief that his parents were going to have him killed. Also, this is fun, said that his mom, Kitty, had magical powers. Like, literally magic. <laughs> He was worried about his dark magician mom. She knew where he went, knew who his friends were, everything he did. She was a magician. Uh, Eric's statement seemed pretty difficult to believe and childish, coming from a uh, you know grown man. Eric talks a lot about uh, new sexual abuse it's tales. It's not really a grown before, man. Like how he began to put cinnamon uh, in his father's tea and coffee. He heard from classmates. And semen tastes better. Handed to him. Uh, let's now speed up to the closing arguments, beginning with the defense. Michael Burt begins his closing argument by telling Lyle's jurors that they must consider that the murders were carried out while the brothers were in a state of fear and panic that followed year after year of abuse Did I hear this right? Parents. Magical power? Jill Lance yeah, that was in his testimony. Asked them to consider the entire what? event dating back to Lyle's childhood you're sexual crazy. molestation. You're, you're, you're crazy. You're crazy. closing argument, Abramson, three you days, were crazy uh, enough to kill your parents, salad, so, like, to explain it, away this isn't surprising. Holes. 
uh, you know, accusing prosecution witnesses of being liars, uh, publicity seekers, attacks Dr. Azil's credibility towards the end of her argument, also throws Lyle under the bus, telling jurors, I don't want Eric to be taking the rap for Lyle. Uh, adds, the evidence in this case does not prove that Eric killed anybody. Uh, Pam Bozanich then delivers the prosecution's closing statement, doesn't pull punches, calls Lyle and Eric spoiled, vicious brats who got the best defense daddy's money could buy. At one point, Bozanich says of the defense, for all those children who were severely abused and who became useful members of society, this defense is an offense, uh, or is an offense. Judge Weisberg gives Lyle and Eric's juries four choices in deciding the brothers' fate. They can find their brothers guilty of first-degree murder, special circumstances, or second-degree murder, or voluntary manslaughter, or involuntary manslaughter. Lyle and Eric each face sentencing on three counts, murder of Jose, murder of Kitty, and charge of uh, conspiracy to commit murder. January 13th, 1994, after 16 days of deliberation, Eric's jury announces that it is deadlocked. They can't reach an agreement on any of the counts. Unreal. At least one jury member bought Abramson's bullshit, two pay defense and all. Just under two weeks later, January 25th, after deliberating for 24 days, Lyle's jury announces it's deadlocked. Judge Weisberg declares mistrials in both cases. Second trial, trial is coming now. February 28th, 95. Judge Weisberg sets a trial date of June 12th for a retrial. The retrial is postponed a number of times, doesn't start until August of 1995. This time, the brothers are tried together by a single jury. During the two and a half years between trials, a new prosecutor, David Kahn, who uh, sadly died of ALS back in 2006, decides to avoid key mistakes made in the first trial, namely Bozanich's decision not to address head-on the brothers' allegations of all the abuse. Bozanich had ignored it, thinking that jurors would too. Uh, this time, the prosecution hires Dr. Park Elliott Dietz, well-known forensic psychiatrist, to help them disprove Lyle and Eric's allegations. They also spend more time reconstructing the crime scene to show how clearly the brothers had premeditated their attacks. November 20th, Khan rests the state's case against the Menendez brothers. The cornerstone, cornerstone of the state's case is a computer-generated reconstruction of the murder scene. Khan used the reconstruction to demonstrate to jurors that the brothers deliberately, methodically killed their parents. Uh, this contradicted the brothers' testimony in the first trial when they said that they fired their shotguns in a blind panic. <laughs> Abramson got them to tell so many wild-ass stories that didn't add up. There was no way that they were going to pull that shit off again when a good prosecutor who had time to study their nonsense comes along. Like the trial before, the brothers will testify. Eric testifies for 15 days. Uh, his testimony began much like he did in the first trial. Describes a lot of the sexual abuse that Jose supposedly inflicted on him. This time, Judge Weisberg, though, is on to him, and after three days, limits his testimony to, uh, you know, certain allegations. You can't just talk on and on and on about early childhood stuff that may or may not have happened. Lyle does not testify this time around. Uh, he fucked up in between the first trial and this one. He conducted some bad business. Prosecutors have tape-recorded conversations between Lyle and Norma Novelli, a lady who met with Lyle in prison in 91 about maybe writing a book about all this. And Lyle told her he, quote, snowed the jury at his first trial with his testimony about sexual abuse. As in, as defined on usingenglish.com, and as I've always understood that phrase, to persuade or deceive someone. He told this lady he fucking lied about the abuse when he had another murder trial coming up. Why? He's a fucking idiot. This really makes me lean further towards these assholes making it all up, or at least 99% of it. Did Jose maybe touch them inappropriately when they're younger? I don't know. Maybe it's possible. Uh, or maybe they just said some weird shit as kids. It's hard to say with these guys. Uh, the prosecution also discovered a letter Lyle had written to a former girlfriend telling her to lie at his first trial. January 30th, 1996, the defense rests. February 20th, Khan begins the first of four days of closing arguments. He ridicules the brother's claims of abuse as, quote, the silliest, most ridiculous story ever told in the courtroom. February 29th, closing arguments I gotta make Khan garbage telling the jury glass, that Lyle and Eric blamed their victims, put their parents glass, on trial, uh, made up stories about sexual abuse, stuff. and get the money they felt they were entitled to. Now it's time for a jury. March 1st, jury begins to deliberate. March 20th, 1996, after four days, the jury convicts the Menendez brothers, each on two counts of first-degree murder and on conspiracy to commit murder. And uh, they are also uh, special circumstances attached to the murders, lying in wait in multiple murders. Because of these special circumstances, there are only two sentencing options, life in uh, uh, prison without the possibility of parole or death by execution. And they end up getting life in prison 
without the possibility of parole on July 2nd, 96. Yeah. Uh, September 10th, the California Department of Corrections separates the brothers, sends them to different prisons. Lyle bus to North Kern State Prison. Uh, and then uh, Eric bus to California State Prison near Sacramento. Lyle and Eric segregated from other prisoners, classified as maximum security inmates. And then there's appeals. But the appeals don't go through. Uh, the California Court of Appeal upholds the murder convictions. And on May 28th, 1998, the California Supreme Court upholds the convictions. What about their lives in prison? Uh, since entering prison, the brothers have married, even though California does not allow conjugal visits for those convicted of murder or those serving life sentences. January 97, Lyle marries longtime pen pal, Anna Erickson, a former model and current fucking idiot. Uh, the marriage reportedly ended after less than a year because she discovered that Lyle was cheating on her by writing to another woman. What is wrong with these people? November 2003, Lyle, then 35, marries Rebecca Sneed, 33-year-old magazine editor from Sacramento. At a ceremony in the maximum security visiting area of the Mule Creek State Prison. They'd known each other for 10 years prior to their engagement. Also in 97, Eric reportedly marries uh, through a telephone ceremony at, at Folsom State Prison. In June of 99, Eric, then 28, uh, I guess he gets engaged. Uh, and then he gets married uh, in 1999 to Tammy Ruth Sockerman, uh, 37 years old, in a Folsom State Prison, prison uh, uh, in their yeah. waiting room. She later stated that our wedding cake was a Twinkie. We improvised. It was a wonderful ceremony until I had to leave. That was a very lonely night. You should get counseling, Tammy. Uh, you seem, for lack of a better phrase, uh, fucked up. Why are you doing this? April 4th, 2018, the Menendez brothers together again for the first time in nearly 22 years. They both end up in the same unit of the R.J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego. They speak to each other face to face for the first time since September of 96. After having been sent to different prisons, you know, 500 miles apart following sentencing, Prison officials allowed them to meet together in a room for about an hour. Longtime Menendez tracker, author, and journalist Robert Rand told a USA Today reporter, adding, and both brothers immediately became very emotional. They hugged each other. They are so excited to be reunited after help, all these girl. years. Yeah, they can't exactly. wait to conduct some business. Please uh, According get to the California help. state government's online inmate tracker, the two remain in San Diego, incarcerated together today with no hope for parole. And with that, let's hop out of this long ass. Time suck. <sighs> timeline good job soldier you made it back Barely. i'm just here uh, before right a recap, now uh, how about a little bit more waiting business? for this goddamn thing Today's to time fucking is brought to you by menendez investment enterprises <laughs> hi i'm lao menendez convicted murderer and businessman do you like money <laughs> rolex watches Sports cars, condos on the beach, and business? Do you like chicken wings? Well, I have a business opportunity for you. How would you like to go into business together? I'm looking for a business partner for Mr. Buffaloes. I'm not sure it's still in Princeton. It's hard to conduct business from a 6 by 9 cell. But if it is there, let's have a business lunch in separate places because I'm not allowed to have lunch visitors. Then let's hop on the phone for a business call. Profit, interest, return on investment, wealth building. These are business terms I've heard over the years, and I'd like you to teach me what they mean. Also, my brother would like to play tennis again. Please, break us out of prison. Are you in the breaking out of prison business? If any of this makes sense, call 1-800-BUSINESS. I wrote a jingle to help you remember our business number. Call 1-800-BUSINESS. If you like business, 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 800, with one in front, business, business, Princeton, money, profit, business, so much business, Menendez Investment Enterprise for business, I'm lonely, I need to pay money for my business. Wow, what a great opportunity for people to invest in. So what do I think about Eric and Lyle Menendez? Obviously, I think they're fucking idiots. I think they're parent murdering liars. Were their parents assholes? Maybe. Uh, were they spoiled fucking brats? Oh, certainly. Did they get molested? Maybe. The cousin testimony is hard to completely ignore. But if something happened, why tell all these convoluted toupee-based weird tales that contrast and contradict previous tales of molestations? I mean, the stories were all over the fucking place. 
Why tell someone you I'm snow uh, for sure? <laughs> Did Lyle trick his cousins into Not saying what they said? I don't know. Did they just say weird shit a few Haven, times to their kids about stuff we never have happened? An it's possible. To make. We must... Maybe a liar and also have actually been molested? Yes. Uh, but the timing of the murders. When they're both 18 or older, one's in college, one's a few weeks away. Well, here's the biggest thing. Then they murder right after I've dad threatens to cut one. them out of the will. Right after mom and dad likely write a new will. That's a little suspicious. Investigative journalist Dominic Dunn wrote a lot about these two before passing away in 2009. He wrote the following for Vanity Fair after covering the first trial extensively. He's probably the most noteworthy print reporter covering the case. And, this uh, is just he, annoying uh, me. Here, here are a few excerpts that provide additional I'm, details. I'm down to invest my life savings. Or express feelings that I, I share, but <laughs> more eloquently. He's a, good, he's a good writer. What? Guys, they're real businessmen. They, you guys need to stop making American fun of children the, die the each day real businessmen, not this is subject that must phony businessmen garbage. But it is also a subject Come that on. is being ludicrously overworked in the justice system. Come it has on, become guys. an increasingly popular defense to gain an acquittal or an inconsequential verdict for most uh, for Some the most heinous business, of crimes. Uh, business, Perpetrators business. need only to scream out, I was abused. And there is an expectation Come of forgiveness. On. This Child sounds like Soldier Boy all fucking over again. Need only this sounds like Soldier Boy all fucking over again. No proof necessary. Where it's like, everybody's like, himself, man, why is Soldier Boy uh, doing all this shit? Because I have ever encountered nobody's fucking bought his shit in forever. Nobody's fucking bought his shit in forever. Because he doesn't make music. I was devastated by his first day on the stand as he told his story. I'm getting Everyone real, had expected that uh, it would frustrated. Be never stop trying kid brother, Eric. It would Just because it's like... But it was Lyle who soared. It's it like brilliant. the uh, Lord Machine Gun or whatever his throat. name is. I thought, is. my God, I'm wrong. Uh, that rap really star. Uh, Lyle Menendez knew instinctively how to take his moment and turn which, it into theater. First of there all, were rumors never verified I don't like of an rap. acting coach who visited him I've and his never, brother in jail. Uh, I'm sorry that you therapist. guys are learning this, this now. This much I know for sure. I like he was rap. aware of the brilliance of his performance. I, it's Let's not because of the lyrics. About Joe it's literally Jose because of the beat. His I, I, I think the beat The sucks. squeezed tight little anus of a six-year-old is not an easy rap. entry for a man-sized penis. Surely, if it happened, the, beat the pain sucks. must have been unbearable. And if the beat not just sucks, the time span of the rape itself, I can't listen but to for it. days, possibly weeks after. But there must have been devastation I have heard in the rectal all area. Of those rap other songs, than, other than to say it hurt, video he game Lyle music, did not give any and I instantly of love it. Physical trauma. I his it, like the Yoshi Island. Uh, they, they put in Yoshi Island uh, sound to some of those like hit beats, Legend of Zelda, like Fairy Fountain. Uh, doubted to the truth uh, of the uh, wonderful beat, the and I immediately am like, who has oh, undergone years of therapy and has worked with other incest fucking, survivors. That is a dank ass beat to buy the about one of the fuck that the girl. Note. I love that. If it had been a butcher knife or a gun already in the house or any household instrument, such as an axe or a pipe that might have been at hand, she would have believed the story. The advanced planning, the use of a former friend's ID to cover up also rang false to this person. The defense in this case is destroying a new area of the law, she said. They are twisting it and contorting it to justify this crime that their clients have committed. This case causes many questions and concerns to be raised by some of us in the incest survivor community. Even though a significant number of children are told they will be killed if they tell on their perpetrators, they simply choose not to murder them. I have heard from the mouth of Menendez's relative, with whom I met clandestinely during the trial, that the brother's account of the molestation was false, gleaned from books they read in jail, beginning with Paul Monet's When a Child Kills Abused Children Who Kill Their Parents a study of true cases, and how they were defended in court. The defense claimed that until the moment Kitty pulled the hairpiece off Lyle, Eric did not know that his brother wore a toupee. The defense further claimed that the sight of his older brother's baldness and the sudden awareness of his brother's vulnerability and embarrassment freed Eric to confess to Lyle his own deep secret, that their father had been sexually molesting him for 12 years. That one brother did not know the other brother wore a hairpiece is hard to swallow. A man's toupee is not like a woman's wig, which can be slipped onto the head easily. The wearing of a toupee involves elaborate preparations before a bathroom mirror and the various means of attachment, such as glue, hooks, and lure locks, tried by Lyle before he settled on the method he liked best could not have gone unnoticed. This is not a fool your brother kind of thing. The Menendez brothers are documented liars. Their 911 call to the Beverly Hills police to report the discovery of the dead bodies of the parents they had killed more than an hour before will always remain a classic in the deception genre. Perhaps Lyle's crying was real in that call. Perhaps even grief was involved in that genius moment. In all fairness, one must assume that the initial sight of the carnage they had created when they returned from getting rid of their bloody clothes and the shotguns must have been brutalizing to their senses. However, 
whether in grief or fakery, they were still lying. Every word spoken through tears and the agonized cries was a lie. Later that night, and for the next seven months, until they were arrested, they continued to lie convincingly to the police. That last part, that's just it. Liars, proven liars. So why believe them about wild sexual abuse claims told in convoluted and contradictory stories? Yeah, The book exactly. Dominic references that pulmonase when a child kills, so many graphic details of their supposed abuse match up exactly with abuse tales from that book. I can't explain the two cousins' testimony. I lean strongly towards believing sexual abuse allegations, but sometimes people lie, especially when they're trying to avoid prison time, a possible death sentence. And I think these two fuckers lied. I mean, like Dominic points out, we know they lied over and over and over leading up to their testimony. And I think the two sociopaths willing to kill their own parents for money also willing baby, to completely tarnish those baby, parents' reputations to try and save their ass. Here. That's just my opinion. Let's now get back to some facts with today's top five yeah. takeaways. No, I think they killed their parents. I 100% think they killed their parents, not because uh, they were uh, after sexually abused. In San Diego on the night of August 20th, 1989. Lyle and Eric or Hernandez, abused then 21 and 19, in ambushed their parents at Beverly Hills home. Jose and Kitty shot uh, multiple times I think before they, they died. Were, uh, and after they died, or after they were dead, Eric and Lyle shot them through their knees to From make the, the murders look like a mob hit. From the story, it sounds like uh, they were Number treated uh, not great, but I don't think that they were. Are you fucking kidding me? Dude leased office space in a mall, hired employees for an investment business, but never invested in anything. They wanted to kill. Pepe, uh, Lyle and Eric sniffly, probably are yes. sociopaths. He, uh, also, he their sociopathic tendencies sometimes. are probably not helped he at all by their dad constantly protecting them from suffering the consequences of their actions. When Lyle got suspended from Princeton, Jose steps in. Eric gets caught stealing from houses. Jose steps in. On and on. Cleaning up his While Jose might have been thinking he's protecting them, uh, their future but and no, their reputations, like, what he was no, really showing them was that there's enough money to get away that, with anything. Uh, that are not abused. Good. Parenting. I think the, four, that was uh, sick and wrong of them a major part uh, of to do that. What happened to in the weeks leading up to be the like, oh yeah, the no, we were that abused. Yeah. Miles Toupay docked Eric so much that it somehow led to him confessing all the years of a sexual abuse and a murder plot. The prosecution claimed that Eric had known about the Toupay uh, since Lyle had actually been wearing it since he was 14. How strange. Didn't remember that detail uh, from the from the case back when uh, all this happened in '93. And number five, new info, uh, more pop culture Menendez moments. In 2017, the wonderful Edie Falco of Sopranos and Nurse Jackie fame played Leslie Abramson, that spitfire Eric Menendez defender, in a new series, uh, Law and Order, True Crime, that thus far has only ran one season. Eight episodes in the Menendez case that aired in the fall of 2017. Uh, earned an Emmy nomination for her portrayal, her 14th. And while I did not see it, Lindsay did, said it was fantastic. Also, the brothers can be seen in the background of Mark Jackson's 1990-1991 NBA hoops card. Um, Jackson saw a player, Rookie of the Year, 88, All-Star, 89, NBA assist leader, uh, 97. He played for the Knicks, and the brothers can be seen in the background in the stands, sitting in the front row, courtside, Madison Square Garden, tickets bought with daddy's money after the murders, before the arrest. Uh, unfortunately, That's this card crazy. is not worth a lot. Holy have, shit. Because in 91, lots of people buying sports cards, and the market was saturated. Still interesting, though. What are the odds it would pop up in a fucking basketball card? That is crazy that they're uh, that they're uh, memorialized with that. That's actually a real interesting thing. Holy shit! It was interesting. I tried to cut the fact, and it was still a lot of info. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Production was, uh, team for all the help to make. Yeah. No. Like. Um, no. Like. No. Fuck them. Like I don't really get like. In all honesty. If they were abused, they should have told someone, it, it would have gone to trial, and they would have brought their, uh, their parents to trial. I don't think murder is ever a, a, is ever a solution. Let's just give it the benefit of the doubt. If they were sexually abused, I would 100% think that they needed to bring that to trial, give everybody a notice of what uh, what had happened. That put their parents on blast. Something like that. But it seems to me like they were some spoiled uh, fucking rich assholes.
But that is just my opinion. <laughs> that is one man's opinion. Everybody has the their own. The of the cryptozoological creature known as Mothman begins on November 12, 1966. On that day, five men were digging a grave at a cemetery in Clendenin, West Virginia, and one of them claimed to witness a man-like creature fly over their heads. A creature he and other witnesses in the coming days would describe as a terrifying, large, man-like, gray monster with glowing red eyes and a roughly 10-foot wingspan that could fly at speeds anywhere from an impossibly slow I mean, to 100 miles an hour. Has the Mothman creature would be described by a different some not representation a of reality. Two huge, ominous red eyes set inside his think... chest. Eyes consistently reported to be glowing or at least reflective. The details yeah, of his face. It sounds like he, they're big dumbasses. He, has face, uh, he even is a he, I, and his feet I'm, have never been. But I also described. don't think one witness uh, who did claim to see his face that said, uh, you know, if you're abused, face, clearly, could only say tell that the details were horrible. If you are monster, literally sexually abused, terrible nightmares, tell someone. A nervous breakdown. Most Murder of is a never the, the answer. Seem to suffer from extreme fear and I, psychological distress. Sometimes I wholeheartedly think that murder is afterward. never the answer. In particular, people I don't say think that, that, that sense of pure evil overcomes them when they look into Mothman's eyes. The legend of Mothman, and, and most even when there's sociopaths, the even when there's crazy people, I don't 15, think that an eye for an eye bridge that rose uh, above the Ohio River anyone that connected good. Point Pleasant, it West Virginia, the people that uh, died Ohio, back from the dead. And lives of 46 people. It doesn't bring the sense. Stories like, have even with psychos, like collapse to Mothman. If I find out was this that creature trying someone to warn local killed that someone, bad happen? That I didn't know the bridge would collapse. To me. Like, yeah, Smart I, man, my head initial no head, thought would be some kill harbinger him. of impending doom. Kill him dead. Some bizarre creature trying to save the lives of those but who died. But my other thought would be 15th. like, this is what some still believe. I I don't or want is, to be that person. I don't want to be what they are. Is the legend nothing more than a murderer. collective product of overactive imaginations and a few creative writers but, trying to exploit opinion. those imaginations. Everybody has always one. always have to entertain that possibility when it comes to the paranormal. The story of Mothman would never have become part of a of American cryptozoological folklore if it weren't I for the 1970s book, The Silver Bridge, written by noted ufologist Ray Baker. As a few friends Ray have been uh, through Ray Barker. There is ways you the can Mothman say there is And then there was the Mothman Prophecies, another uh, important piece of the Mothman canon written by another ufologist and talk about John it. Keel. Uh, without killing someone, yeah. We're gonna look at the story of Mothman from all sides today, making you believers to just as much a here. monster. Uh, there's no way that happened tonight. And also, uh, uh, today what we're doesn't look innocent is literally going Richard on those Gere people's dime right Lovely's fucking Lovely's afterwards. The Mothman prophecy that they uh, that they fucking died. The same name. It's also a movie that scared the shit out of my wife Lindsay, and when she uh, when she first saw it, and a movie Chicago uh, reader critic. Lisa Al Spector called the scariest movie I've ever seen. Will today's tale scare you? Does the Mothman give you the heebie-jeebies? Or will this all just be a big uh, wackadoodle gasser of a tale? Find out today as we dive into the strange and hard to explain today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. But I mean, everybody is different. Happy Monday, Time Suckers. Hail you. Hail the mighty Time Sucker. Uh, I won. Trailblazer on various paths. I 100% believe Hail that curious. everybody's Hail different. Nimrod and Lucifina as well. Praise Triple M. Everybody Sweet has Sweet 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 their Sweet cross to bear. Uh, time Suck is brought to you again today by Broem, the Broem Podcast. And I ought to say it now. Broem is a show about how it's okay to be a dude, but, but all dudes should be better dudes. Each week on Broem, Joe and Ben pick a topic they think dudes could use a little help with. And based on what I've heard so far, uh, I think this info is fantastic for ladies as well. It's fantastic for everyone. This week on Pro, I mean, the guys discuss ways to enjoy art without uh, uh, being like a wine-swirling jerk. Right? What are the benefits? Changing up your routine, seeing something new. Would you feel better if you had a different, possibly more artistic, creative outlet? This week, Ben and Joe chat with Portland artists Bryce Wong and Alex Moan about ways to dip your toes into the art world. Tune in each week for new topics, new discussions, new ways to continue seeking enlightenment through deadlifts. Brome it up. Brome it up, everybody. Uh, www.broaum.com for more info. You just listen to it where you listen to podcasts. Link in the episode description, or you can just push the button in the sponsor section of the Time Suck app or the Time Suck website. 
Uh, love these guys, man. Good dude. Good dude. Thanks to everyone who came out to, uh, to Providence, Bridgeport, Albany, New Brunswick. Whether the crowd was small or the room was sold out, the energy was fantastic. Yeah, Every yeah. single show. I got uh, a pee again. a lot of new material. But having an awesome already looking crowd great. Here. Already you're looking new good stuff, uh, up and running to just, start uh, out. So that's pumped, good. Really, really pumped now. Hope, for the rest uh, of the stand-up hope your trip got, to uh, uh, school has been going to, well. Uh, you know, hope take, like, everybody's going well. And then hope everybody's to doing with, well uh, tonight. Fair amount of new material quick. Hope now, everybody's you know, having good. a good night. Like be the best hope everybody's having an interesting uh, night. I've ever done. Very, very excited. Going to have more fun with the Happy Murder shows this next week in uh, Wisconsin and Madison. Those shows are packing out. Saturday early show may already be sold out. Uh, comedy on stakes. Are you ready for the Happy Murder Tour? Are you ready for the first live time cycle 2019? Right? The Ant Hill Kids, the Canadian tale of fire and brimstone maniac co leader, father and 26 kids, torturing followers in the most ridiculous ways, uh, getting the rest of his followers kind of help with the torture um, before finally meeting his own violent end. So it has a, it has a good ending. So that's nice. Uh, it's a hell of a true crime story. A lot of whack doodle in this one. It's been a while since we sucked into a crazy ass cult. And this is a crazy ass cult. Uh, bringing the Happy Murder Tour to Philly the following week, and then both live podcasts and stand up to downtown Salt Lake City soon after, then Zanies in Nashville. Uh, just, let's just found out a new great Nashville band, by the way, called Republican Hair. Weird name. Not a huge fan of the name, the weird name. But really, really like it. Really like it a lot, actually. Uh, check out dancummins.tv in a full, uh, for a full year of fun shows. Some more live stuff's coming up in Cleveland in April, Nashville in April. Uh, the Comedy Festival, Spokane in San Francisco in May, Orlando in August, Phoenix in September, Tempe, technically, then Denver, Grand Rapids, yep. and Tacoma at the end of the year. That's Child be away to school and now home spaces are enjoying the release yum, of the video coffee. of the Denver show. The but that's also Matt another Morrow's, thing that uh, I... Narco uh, Satan's cult this past like, week on Patreon. Gotta, gotta check those Patreon posts and emails from time to time. If you miss Does that. that make you just All as right, bad as the murderer? Meat sack sweatshirt. And a lot of people have different opinions about here. that. Time of like, meat sack's pretty sweet, man. I'm happy no, about. that Something doesn't I make enjoy. you a murderer. You're uh, just crew dishing out just what well, says. Meat lots sack of right people the think that they're doing the right thing, and they put AKA the, team the stamp of justice on it, assholes, and then right? it's we a-okay in the, the end. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? I didn't do all that. We still make it was justice. To suffer our heartaches, but we'll try hard until we die. Fight, fight, fight. We are the meat sack to see. Curious until the end, we will keep learning on, fight ignorance till it's gone, like, and make life better for one and I all. always have fight, a problem fight, with fight. it because what if it, one that, time in a hotel room, you're wrong, uh, New York City. What it's, if uh, one time uh, you're <laughs> dealing out your it's justice? The in the room next door. I mean, what in and the you're wrong. Is he and about? then we get uh, to the point of like how our justice uh, system works, which French is Harry style sweatshirt. So many words. Which is, All it is better soft. to it's, let... It comes either navy or porcelain. That's Lindsay's favorite uh, sweatshirt brand. She, uh, she picked, uh, it's better uh, to let six men, uh, men uh, go, uh, uh, six murderers go free than let one, uh, you're at. one innocent uh, man both suffer. Both are 50-50 cotton poly blend. Also 100-100 imported man. That is how sack, our justice system in most of the world is conducted. Because those were the only... Illegal animal parts. Available. I think it's Remember a lot more money. Parts, uh, murders. Content. It's better also, to let a hundred like murders uh, free more than, than let an, an innocent again. man suffer. Finally, they, uh, they only run to up to two x alternative. So guild will be used for three x to five x. Stay cozy and hail Nimrod. Stay warm. Uh, yeah, a lot of you, man, stay warm this week. Man, some fucking and that, terrific that's the biggest thing of life. The what if My God. you're wrong? Uh, also, congratulations to the winner of our first Time Suck Street you Team don't know Sticker the Challenge. You right, of the situation. On, uh, what time if, uh, it came you know, the curious on the these page. people round did one what they did the time suck for team a good come cause? To a close. We had a blast. We're already preparing for round two. More details on that in the coming weeks. You don't, you As don't round know. One time suck stickers have How been slapped you, and tagged in 30 different defining, states. Why are you uh, the Germany, defining factor UK, in all of this? Spreading that suck far and wide. Hopefully convincing more and more people to join the cult of curious. Uh, we saw stickers on street lights. It's not cars, a bad DVD question rentals, to ask cars, because... Billboards, like, bathrooms, tables, chairs, windows, gas pumps, trash cans, soda machines, ATMs, 
being uh, skeptical is like, something that's or good. Being uh, skeptical is something months. that's like, uh, from all oh man, stuff and tagged on social media am I being, uh, am I being lied to Reverend and Dr. stuff like that? It, it's where you're just like, man, what's going on? Yeah, uh, not a, a, a decision I would want to have to make. Uh, exactly. So like, dealing out justice is something that's very difficult. And that's where, like... That's why here. I love Superman and all that. Could've, could've been I love Superman, been Batman, Rachel, and all of that because they're name, heroes that Rachel, don't just uh, deal that. out believe, random I I justice. You, you stay at Rachel. Like Rachel Robocop, Lafayette? the only you know, has, has reason why Robocop can do it Rachel, and uh, Judge uh, Dredd uh, can do it uh, is because you've watched the movie. Finally, You've literally watched the movie uh, well enough. You know that finally Spotify. The Judge Dredd is making curious, the right call. Start off with my the person that is receiving this, this bullet to the brain, uh, is a monster. There, there's no redeeming qualities right now, about this notes. character so and stuff like that. Reminder, like, and and, and that notes. also makes now, that the villains one weird, note, like West Virginia bird which means weird. that the rest of the movie has to carry it out. I don't like one-noted villains. And that's why it's like, it, it, it's my biggest belief of like, why is this character doing this? Why is this character making this, di this difficult decision and whatnot? West Virginia. Harpo! Harpo muscle! Harpo muscle! Specifically, you gotta get to Point Pleasant, West Virginia. That's the real birthplace of the legend. I know Clendenin was, we're gonna talk about that uh, quote-unquote first sighting in a bit. I have a lot of, I have a lot of problems yeah. with that one. When you have all the details, uh, it does make it easier. That's where the real but like, stuff that's happening. not well, the truth for all those characters. That's, that's not the truth uh, for uh, Robocop it's, it's, it's and stuff like that. Like, like making that huge decision is uh, about a hundred miles uh, from and less a than a two-hour drive thing. southeast of Columbus, Ohio. In real, li northeast. in real life, uh, Huntington, you'll West never Virginia. have all the details. In fact, America, you'll have less Huntington, uh, than any details because you, you will never square. have seen the crime. Got real drunk in that little town you have to make times. assumptions Point about Pleasant, every little thing. And the you have to find out. And that's where it's like, I'm also like, I give a lot of props to actual news news organizations and stuff like that that try to find out all of the details before uh, before making a headline or anything uh, like that. Or like, yeah, we'll miss the deadline, people. but you know what? I'd rather know now, all the facts Ohio instead of just to to have slapping it on there and so, sorry Clap police I, I, you know I, hope, I sincerely hope a new terrifying monster attacks like we don't know what, what happened so we don't fully know it. what uh, happened in this situation in this situation we should way. know all the Maybe details to the and to make a, a uh, informed decision about a person on the other side of the river and it's just so difficult in all types of life America's and people act president, like it's so Eddie easy. Franklin visited it's like, the area it's in not. 1770. Said it was it's, pretty. It's said hard farmings, to find out who's, said the river you know, smelled, the quote, good decent. guy or bad guy, he especially so inspired, when, you know, in a book, in it's, it's fairly easy to know who's the bad guy. Shot to showcase the area's vast abundance of With serial class, killers, Jackalope. it's so easy to That's know right who the oh, bad guy is. Ben Franklin did not visit. The area, and of course, but like a, a real intelligent, like of America that I know of, George Washington story, visited the area in 1770. That's true. It's very That's difficult right. for a general color. audience uh, the Battle of Point because Pleasant a lot of difficult later, uh, stories. Over a thousand Virginia militiamen led by Colonel Andrew Lewis. I, I and love it when of about a it's hard Shawnee to find out who the villain is, Chief and when you find out who the villain is, he wasn't born Cornstalk. You're like, okay, what else? What else uh, about them? About or am I missing? Am I missing context? And, it, it, and away the wounded, finding out about the character the and stuff Shawnees like that. quietly withdrew back across the Ohio River at night after a day of fighting in the Virginia like, soldier ground. Let's, and Luthor. Thus let's go with, uh, the with the Superman. Celebrated locally Lex the Luthor battle of the is such an the interesting character because once you find out about him, he becomes way more interesting. 
Point Pleasant was established because to of find death. out that he a is of the same name. just followed, a normal person. A few years later, during the fall of seventeen seventy-seven, Chief Cornstalk made a diplomatic yes, visit to Fort Brandon. But also, he is new American Fort more than uh, just being a uh, hard uh, capitalist. And the he's, meeting uh, did not go well. He's Lee's very much Chief like, oh, uh, Superman, everybody's gotten all these things. Uh, I am just by the such a small person. Like, originally, take he's very one note. He's hand. just, I have a lot of money. I hate Superman. But then you slowly realize why he hates Superman. Why he distrusts Superman. Cornstock's son and two other Shawnees in retribution. And some believe Cornstock's murder and why he is land. kind of paranoid of like everyone around Virgil, him, and why he Lewis, funds a, name. a lot Virgil. of villains. Virgil Lewis, you don't become a diesel mechanic if your name is Virgil Lewis. And like he is the most uh, he interesting said, character in the DC universe. The the was no I, th than I would say that uh, he's far more of an interesting villain than the Joker. the fiendish murder of Cornstock there in 1777, the place was laid under a curse for a hundred years. Did this curse lead to the birth of the creature of Mothman? But that's is just Mothman my opinion. Is physical manifestation of I this think curse? that Did the curse last Joker longer than is years? very much Any more you know a, how to, how to place uh, curses? a villain Can for curses? Superman Can you teach me? than there he is people, for Batman. Uh, I wouldn't mind. Like, uh, you know, put a little Mothman curse on. I, I genuinely think 18th, like early 19th century Joker settlers, is uh, way more of a, a good villain for uh, uh, Superman. Mark Twain's grandparents. Just Mark because, Twain's grandparents, like, uh, headed out there, would take until cosmically, the if Joker was just given cosmic powers, slow he'd be a great villain uh, for Superman. High, about 6, there we go. People in but like, intellectual-wise, uh, uh, he's not really people. smart unless the, uh, like we're no villains in. He's <laughs> not that yeah. smart. He doesn't. Uh, he's not that Island witty. He's settled by a group of French known as he's the French kind of Jackals who are fleeing the French Revolution. And then, you have, area, uh, then you have the then you have the best French, version of him, which is Kepka from uh, Final City Fantasy. Demon Monster. Not sure if that's but also, a legend or not. I'm just uh, waxing the city poetics. Of the I don't that, know. Uh, that big it just depends on the writer. And uh, and Galapolis being the home of Bob Evans. You know about Bob Evans? Bob Evans, founder of the chain of Bob Evans restaurants that are my favorite chain of cheap and easy breakfast and lunch spots. I, your damn skip, y'all have a side of warm banana bread. Thank you, Bob Evans person. Uh, seriously, Bob Evans is legit. But other than that, the area is really not known for much other than Mothman. Mothman is far and away Point Pleasant area's uh, biggest claim to fame. There's a statue of Mothman in the heart of town. He's fucking ripped, too. He's jacked. He's got an A-pack. Uh, there's a Mothman Museum. Every third weekend in September, there's a Mothman Festival, which has been packing, or kind of packing, the town every year since it started in 2002. Uh, this year, the event takes place on September 21st, 22nd. So get, get your tickets now, Moth fans. Oh, man, it's going to be crazy. Big, big Moth Man Fest full of Moth Man cosplay. Live music. Uh, probably songs referencing Moth Man. Food vendors. And uh, classic rock. Uh, even tasty Moth Man pancakes. There's, that seriously is an option. What are Moth Man pancakes, you wonder? Well, they're normal pancakes. Shaped kind of Moth Man like. By a guy in a food truck. Uh, so don't, don't want to miss that. Uh, there's hay rides at the Mothman Festival. I don't know how that ties in the Mothman. Maybe just trying to make a little hay ride money off some families coming in. Uh, there's guest Mothman expert speakers, shuttle tours of the nearby creepy TNT storage bunkers. Talking about that here in a bit. Much more. Right, hey, what, what are those uh, TNT storage bunkers? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's some some think they they led his creation. They will come up quite a bit here in this uh, in this tale. Uh, the nearby bunkers are part of what was once called the West Virginia Ordnance Works, a military facility that manufactured and stored TNT, uh, which is an explosive chemical compound used a lot during uh, World War II. Out of its production, the facility outside Point Pleasant, West Virginia, produced 500,000 pounds of TNT each day. Most of the site was closed in 1945, but wasn't uh, eventually was eventually made into a regional airport. The, the area, not the not the TNT. <laughs> Not the actual TNT bunkers. They, they weren't. They just ah, let's just fucking let's put a let's put a Starbucks in there and have it have it be an airport and just yeah, push the chemicals in the back, just make it into a Starbucks. No, uh, uh, the area where the TNT was stored was made into a little regional uh, airport, became a recreational space, and uh, much of the land is still very contaminated by the TNT and its chemical precursor DNT. The Superfund site that's been on the national priorities list since 1983 
Uh, surprisingly, actually fixing up this site doesn't seem to be uh, on that uh, list of priorities. Priority doesn't seem to be uh, getting rid of the hazardous material. Just monitoring and containment seems to be the strategy. Did this hazardous material stored out in the woods create some kind of toxic avenger? Some sort of mutant? Later given the name of Mothman? Some kind of some kind of comic book superhero? He was really bad at explaining to people that the reason he's showing up is to keep him from getting on that bridge a, a year later? That actually is another one of uh, Mothman's theories. Beyond the explosion in 2010 uh, of a storage igloo that contained 20,000 pounds of unstable materials, the bunkers have been pretty quiet. But other than one explosion, pretty quiet. Uh, the Mothman Museum looks pretty sweet. Can't forget about that. It's voted number one destination on TripAdvisor.com for things to do in Point Pleasant. So get there if you get out there. Number one in the competition for the top spot, it was intense. Boy, howdy. Uh, Mothman Museum narrowly beat out a nearby state park, the Point Pleasant River Museum. That's exciting. A whole museum dedicated to the river there. And a West Virginia State Farm Museum. What? Farm Museum and River Museum. Oh, my God. And even better, the best museum I've maybe ever heard of, the U.S. Navy Poster Museum. That's a very specific museum. How many U.S. Navy poster enthusiasts can be out there? How many of them are heading to Point Pleasant? All 19? <laughs> Welcome to the U.S. Navy Poster Museum. Uh, man, we, we really hope you like posters. <laughs> that's, that's all we have. And, uh, and we really hope you like posters specifically about the U.S. Navy because that's quite literally the only kind of poster we have here. Thank, thank God we don't need to make money. because this is, this is a tax write-off. Hey, come take a tour. Uh, tours run uh, on the hour, uh, every hour, and generally take from two to five minutes. We don't have that many posters. Uh, check check out our U.S. Navy posters. When we go uh, to the poster museum. Older U.S. Navy posters. I uh, would uh, love that, to take go a to some of these wonderful places. I actually would go uh, to the poster museum. The US Navy that sounds we have. We have lovely. Of I love of propaganda uh, museums. Uh, what was that? I went we to have, the uh, propaganda uh, of World War II uh, Navy posters. You asked. Uh, museum expose that happened in Birmingham. I told you, it's a U.S. Navy Post Museum. And it was actually in quite yeah. interesting Get out here. to see, uh, that's, to see propaganda there. from My all across the, the world. Uh, so and I've got to say, video. I actually loved it. Couple uh, just because town, I river, love the uh, artistic Virginia, uh, Ohio, interpretations of Americana. all the other countries. So now let's jump into the origins and of the Mothman it, legend. It's kind of like a look back machine into like not only our history, Time but into every single country's Woody, history, and I thought that was interesting. And more I love, spectral I love a good uh, propaganda poster, just because of how ridiculous it kind of is of all of them. But that's a personal opinion. Okay. You mean Gavin? No, he's not okay. <laughs> no, he is. No, he's not okay. He'll never be okay. <laughs> No, no, he's not okay. <laughs> you just, you just hey, listened to that rant. Much, you guys, Woody's, 
Woody's been under a lot of pressure. Sales have been a little slow, and he's uh, he seems very stressed out uh, from what I've just noticed around the office. He's, he's having a rough go. I hear he's drinking again, and it sounds like his human ventriloquist partner, Charles Gutman, uh, really having a rough go of things. So, so sorry to hear that he got put back in the cage. No, <laughs> no, Woody has no, to do with no, Dan Hoffman's doesn't head. need a hug. Uh, let's, let's no, 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 no. You're... You're interpreting Carter things to Mothman Society. As someone who, 12, who watches all of it. <laughs> West Virginia, which is actually a 76 I mean, mile not, drive southeast of Point Pleasant. I don't think he would, uh, now. Uh, about a thousand he people would say no there. to a hug. Used to be booming I just pounds. think he First does not need a hug. The world was built in Pendennet in 1920. Five men, just from listening to all his comedy and stuff like that, me, he just Gotti gets like this sometimes. Digging a grave for Ken's sometimes he just Smith gets like this in a cemetery it's, near Clendenin in 1966. It's disturbing, this and, is, uh, but also Kenneth very funny. Claimed to see a man-like figure that flew out from some nearby trees, glided low over their heads. Now the other men Ken were working with that day uh, did not see. You know what? I don't have the best looking away. comic. How, how did that happen? But Ken said that the brown creature lifted my off beyond the trees. It was no bird. It was humanoid. He said it was gliding through the trees. Massive And was game. in sight for like, about a minute. seriously. He was baffled. Massive hair game. Didn't look like game. any kind of bird. Seemed to be a man with wings. Now, this is said to be one of the first sightings of, of Mothman. It's the, it's the first nope. kind of sighting. Don't like that. Little buzz. Don't Came like that. A little while later. We'll it, talk about that. Uh, yeah. Ken only initially discussed That's the sighting a with better, a few friends. Yep. And, you know, would have been forgotten if others didn't start to, you know, claim to see this winged man around the same time. Now, does anyone else think it's, it's pretty weird? Their, game, in the air. their hair oh, game is minute. on Big point. Big ass flying man bird. And old Kenny doesn't does think look to point out yes. that there's a fucking monster above, above their heads to his fellow grave diggers. He has a minute to say something like, hey, uh, <laughs> hey, other four guys, uh, stand here with me. Uh, uh, hey, my, what, you would you get a load of that? Look up there. Maybe look up for a second. Maybe check out that, that bird dude flying over. <laughs> hey, guys, listen, I know you're real busy right now uh, digging a West Virginia grave. And I, I'm not looking, I don't want to interrupt the undoubtedly incredibly interesting discussion you're currently having right now. Uh, maybe about how you're sick of your wife, Linda, making tuna roll casseroles all the time. Uh, how about uh, maybe your uh, ruin Susie Lee's ass, looking real real nice and fine in those tight blue jeans at the corner tavern uh, the other night. Or, or maybe perhaps about how Coach would just let you play a little more senior year. Uh, you'd have gotten full ride and been a mountaineer to you. But hey, hold on for a sec. There's a large red eyed monster I would like to make a peek uh, at. Of their it's flying game? above us yes. right now. You yes, just don't I mind. Am. If you wouldn't mind like, setting your shovel down for 10 This is what seconds. I'm talking about. I'll show you. Something I'll cooler show you, than anything Haven. you or anyone in your family tree will ever see in their entire see, lives yeah. is about 20 that yards is away. A massively now. Nice hair How game right there. Happen? Look at that hair. It's referenced in November 18th, 1966 edition right of the Monopolist Daily Tribune. It says right in the paper, four other men helping to dig the grave didn't see it. I don't know, Ken. I don't know about you. Also, how the hell did that town have a daily paper? Uh, while that is the first reported sighting of Mothman, uh, again, one of kind of notes, you know, there's if you look in like dark corners of the web, you can find all kinds of supposed bullshit. Um, but this actually made the paper. Uh, the Mothman tale doesn't really get moving, though, until a few days later in Point Pleasant, which is why they have all the cool museums, right, Clendenin? Old Kenny fucking blew it for you. If you would have just said something, you could have had an annual Mothman fest. You could have been eating those tasty-ass pancakes. Well, now what do you got? You got nothing. You got a ghost town since Interstate 79 bypassed you in the, in the 80s. Why does Interstate bypass you? Because Kenny, dumb shit, Duncan, fucked up everything. Couldn't point out a large flying monster. Now he ruined an entire town. Sorry. It upsets me. Three days later, after Kenneth D Duncan doomed his town to failure by being the worst person who ever lived. On November 15th, <laughs> 1966. I hope you know I'm intentionally being over the top about Ken, by the way. Uh, there was a Mothman sighting in Point Pleasant that kicked off the heart of the legend. Roger and Linda Scarberry were driving a Roger's Black 7 Chevy Bel Air with Steve God and Mary it, Mallory every fucking through the time. air around midnight when Linda noticed two large glowing red eyes. In the darkness be, uh, behind, uh, beside, excuse me, the old North Power Plant, and unlike Kenny Tight Lips, unlike Kenny, 1966 West Virginia State Secret Champion, right? She uh, she screams and alerts the other people in the car to the presence of a goddamn monster, uh, like a like a red blooded terrified American is supposed to do. The four young locals, all around the age of 20, uh, soon learn that these eyes belong to something that looks both very human and very inhuman. 
a biped monster about seven feet tall with wings folded against his back. Roger stalled in the road for a minute, inspecting the strange creature, making sure it wasn't some sort of bird. Before quickly realized, listen, this, this weren't no ordinary animal. They watched the creature spread its wings and head right for him, and that's when they put the pedal to the metal. That old Bel Air raced down Highway 62 to Point Pleasant. Right, exceeding a speed of 100 miles an hour, the monster at one point easily keeping up with them. Four arrived in town, startled, confused, and then uh, they noticed that the monsters, you know, seemed to have stopped following them. Roger parked his car at the edge of town to discuss the encounter. Eventually, convinced themselves that you know it, it had to be a bird, it had to be a giant, strange bird. So, in an attempt to face their fears, right, feel better about the whole encounter, they drove back out of town. You know, they wanted to verify that it's just a bird. Headed back towards that TNT area. It wasn't long before they did see the creature again, apparently waiting for them beside Route 62. All right, the couples were now sure that this thing were no bird. The instant that the uh, car's headlights landed on the creature, it lifted vertically in the air with tremendous speed and disappeared above the tree line. The race back into town again went directly to the Mason County Courthouse, told their story to Sheriff George Johnson and Deputy Miller Halston. Uh, two hours later, city police began investigating the area. They really did head out there and investigate. This is all talked about in the papers, only to return empty-handed. The next day, a press conference was held, and the local press began printing the story, causing others to come forward with previous and future sightings. People like Kenneth, why don't you just keep that sighting to yourself now that you've blown it? Dunk it. The November 15th Point Pleasant sighting was uh, what got the buzz going about Moss Man. In the November 16th issue of the Point Pleasant Register, a strange encounter would be brought to the public eye with the headline. I know Couple that sees my viewers are jealous creature. of my character's so, hair game. Here's that article. In I know entire. that this is the most important article in all of Mothman lore. It was a bird or something. It definitely wasn't a flying saucer. <laughs> Two point pleasant couples said today they encountered a man-sized bird-like creature in the TNT area about midnight last night. Sheriff's deputies and city police went to the scene about two o'clock this morning but were unable to spot anything. But the two young men telling their story this morning were dead serious and asserted they hadn't been drinking. Steve Mallett of 3305 Jackson Avenue and Roger Scarberry of 809 30th Street described the thing as I being know, about I six know or you seven guys feet are tall, jealous. having a wingspan of 10 down feet and red eyes have about two inches in your diameter hearts. And six inches apart. Of my, uh, of it my was like fictional a man characters. with wings, Mallett said. It wasn't like anything you see that. on TV in or fact, a monster movie. The I men and their that. wives I, were in Scarberry's car between 11.30 p.m. and midnight when they spotted the creature near the when old you're power like, plant man, adjacent to the old I wish National I had that Guard great armory hair. building. You too can have that great hair. The creature was seen standing on three uh, with my new sponsor, and was described as being extremely uh, fast. It flew about 100 miles an hour. Oh, man, if only I did have a sponsor. A clumsy runner. Deputy and they told me Miller to uh, head and shoulders. Uh, said he had seen dust in the vicinity oh, of man, the coal field. Uh, if head and shoulders. Of, of field. But it could have been caused by the bird, he said. I'm a hard guy to scare, Scarberry said, but last I'm ready night, to sell out. I was for getting out of there. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, they man. They did just that, but the thing followed I'm, them. I'm they ready. said it was hovering over the car, apparently gliding, until they reached the National Guard Armory on Route, six, Route 62. We went downtown, turned around, and went back, and there it was again. Now I it am. Said, I am. It seemed to be waiting I'm on I'm sorry, but I am He jealous. said the light gray creature, <laughs> then scurried uh, through the field. It also had so flown jealous. across the top of the car. It apparently is afraid of light, Malik reasons, and maybe it Are thought those it was scary No. The young men That's said they saw the creature's eyes being which glowed fabulous. Red, only when their light shined on it, and it seemed to want to get away from the light. They said it looked like a man with wings, but its head was not an outstanding characteristic. Both were slightly pale and tired from lack of sleep during the night uh, following their hair. My hair experience. obsession. They speculated that the thing was living uh, in the vacant you know where power it started? Plant, possibly in one of the huge boilers. Can you guess there where it started? In all the You're other buildings, surprised. Mallet said, but not in that one. You're going to be like, uh, where, where, where did his... Article? How would he know that detail? Where did Goat's How did hair obsession where happen? The local bird where was it? Some weird local bird expert. All right, listen, there are pigeons in every other building. Uh, not that one. I don't know for sure. Once a week, for my own peace of mind, I like to do a quick little bird check of all abandoned TNT buildings in this here area. No, I, I don't I use know like where a, it started. I use a whistling technique. Oh. Well, I walk around the my whole little armory, pony. armory, and I'm like, I just walk Friendship around. Friendship is like, magic. That's right. And when, and when I hear something come the back, truth has like, come out. I was a brony. Okay. We got Blue Jay over there. We got Pigeon over Deep here. Deep down, I still have, got, uh, little, uh, I still love that kind of, show. Uh, uh, hmm, maybe like a Robin. Deep down. 
or uh, maybe uh, listen. I don't know all the bird names. Okay, I just know the sound uh, it didn't matter, of uh, birds, and I know what, what age you are. They are in. Just matters are, are that you love the show. In a huge ass board of building. Nope, not a piece. Go ahead, go over there, go over there, block. No, nothing coming back. Anyway, it's cool. Starberries and yeah. Yard are the same. If I had seen it while by myself, just I wouldn't matters have said that anything. you love the show. There were four. And you're into the show, and you, you want to uh, anyway, uh, explore maybe it with what all the other people that love it as an angel. <laughs> That's a weird, weird uh, description. I was terrified. It was monstrous. I was scared for my life. It looked, it looked like an angel. Uh, the last time they saw it was at the gate of the C.C. Lewis Farm on Route 62. They heard a sound like wings flapping, and they said the bird rose straight up like a helicopter. Okay, got helicopter wings now. Uh, this doesn't have an explanation to it, Mallet said. It was an animal, but nothing like I've seen before. Are they going back to look for the creature? Yes, Mallet said, this afternoon and again tonight. Today, Scarberry said, but tonight, I don't know. No, well, that's what they said. That's what they reported in the paper saying. On November 16th, 1966, the day the article I just read came out, one of the Mothman witnesses, Linda Scarberry, was rushed to the hospital by her father after she experienced a nervous breakdown. Uh, the evening of the 16th, Mothman strikes again. Marcella Bennett, her, her brother Raymond Wamsley, and his wife Kathy were bringing Marcella's two-year-old daughter Tina to visit relatives who live near the TNT area of Point Pleasant. Marcella and her brother had just read about the strange being in the newspaper, they even thought it might be fun to go out and look for it, you know, one day, but they never expected to see it that night. But yeah, that's the that's what got little uh, back among what the taught me the how to do hair. The area. Was, was actually uh, was actually was my little of pony. Some work being done out there. Ralph's was, wife, Virginia uh, Thomas, was Marcella Rarity, Bennett's sister. Uh, when Marcella, Raymond, and Kathy arrived. They discovered that Ralph and Virginia had Rarity both left the church. And, uh, uh, all the, the fan only characters, three Thomas children, Ricky, Connie, and Vicky. Pinky Pat, uh, after changing Twilight, a few words, Sparkle, children, Bennett, and the uh, moms leave. Apple Jack. Back to the car. It's about 9 p.m. And that's when they say uh, they saw. It. They claimed they spotted some strange lights in the sky, hovering above the trees. They made it outside. Or, they, or they, sorry, they saw this when they made it outside. So they walk outside the house. They see the strange lights in the sky. Raymond stops when he gets to the bottom of the steps, tries to get Marcella's attention. Uh, she told him that she didn't want oh, to see any light. He said, yeah, no, you've you know, got to look at this. Princess this Celestia, She ignored him and began Luna. walking uh, to the car, carrying her daughter. Is, is Marcella relate, related to Kenny, Dum Dum Duncan? Uh, your husband is telling you there's strange lights in the sky. And you're like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't want to. I don't like to turn my head up. Nope, not for one second. Look up for one second. No, I don't, I don't, I don't like to look up ever. Um, what's going on with people in West Virginia around this time when it comes to looking up in the air? Suddenly, a figure stirred in the darkness behind the parked car. Now, Marcella sees the creature out of the corner of her eye. She's unlocking the car door. She first sees a man's legs that looked like they were covered in gray feathers. She didn't see any feet. Like a slow motion scene in a horror film, she pulled her eyes up. The wings were drawn in towards its body. The head was tilted sideways. So it looked like a bird, but was too big to be a bird. Standing only a few feet from her was a giant man bird, its head sunken into the shoulder area. She saw no red eyes but later said she might have been too frightened to notice. Marcella described the creature as over six foot tall with feathers. It just looked like a giant bird, but yet a man. And it was standing with its shoulders arched and its neck down. She was terrified, but not able to run. Don't I just stood about there it. and looked Only at it. I couldn't uh, figure out what I was seeing. The original My Little Pony. Her brother saw I also come forward saw the was. original My Little Pony. <laughs> like, I yeah, liked yeah, I the so I original My Little uh, Pony. Raymond and his wife were both very frightened. He kept I yelling thought for Marcella it was to run. a fun she little thing. Fear. When Marcella finally managed to turn around, she took maybe four steps towards the house before falling to the ground in a state of shock, landing on top of her daughter. But I was told to that I'm not as, supposed as to like trance, it when I was a boy. Uh, I just because couldn't do what my mom I was a boy. me to do. And she heard the flapping uh, when wings I was that she was trying to uh, run. Can you I imagine mean, that's that scary that really happened? grammatically like, correct. You head to some relative's house to it just it. feels not like, like it's the car. not. Right? Then some literal flying bug man monster grammatically correct. land next to you. I have no idea but I'm still, how I would react to something like that happening. Now, I'd like to think I would grab my so kid, grammatically, you know, throw him on my shoulders and run. But who knows? Maybe I'd be too paralyzed with fear. Maybe I'd freeze. My brain would just be stuck, you know, as I was trying to process I like the what's show supposed when to I was a not be possible, young but what clearly is possible That's to stand somehow sentence. in front of me. After pulling herself together, when Marcella, Marcella picked child. up her child, ran to the house. The Wamsleys were waiting on the steps. Raymond heard the creature once again flap its wings as Priscilla yeah. reached them. The family locked themselves inside the Why? house to protect themselves. Fucking, Marcella's hands it's and knees totally were badly skinned up, scraped, to, bruised, and to bleeding like from the when you're, She had even been burned I don't, I don't from get, falling on top of the lit cigarette. Societies. The side of her face was also bleeding from where she had fallen. 
<laughs> Jesus, that is some fault. Bleeding from her face, hands, and knees, and burns. Man, if, if Raymond had a, had a history of like, domestic violence, which he doesn't Just have, because you're violence, a boy doesn't mean you can't, like, uh, version of a lookout, lookout, feminine things. Got clumsy and fell down the stairs again. This and it's like okay to enjoy feminine things. I've ever heard. There's some wife beating, you know, just greasy. Like, I, I didn't hit her off, sir. I never laid a hand on her. I don't care what a crazy mom says. Hey, oh, how'd she get all those bruises? How'd she, bleed? how'd she get the cigarette burns? How, how'd I saw what you ask that goddamn mothman creature? Terrorized my wife. Winged son of a bitch. Came over here and scared her, knocked her down. Burn, put a cigarette burn on her. I don't know. I don't know nothing about it. It's nothing. okay to like you're feminine a, things, you want, you want even if you're not you a go, girl. You go find that critter. It's I'm all, no, also okay, okay I, I, to like I, I, I uh, manage things, story. even though apologize, you're yeah. not a I boy. For, for being abusive, and I apologize for not coming up with a I don't cover. get it either. My parents uh, never push things the children like that on us. Uh, we can watch whatever we like. Yeah. The police. By this time, Marcella was lying on the sofa. Well, here's the hear, thing. Uh, uh, I was raised at a daycare, so they were like, whatever shuts them up, we don't care. He told uh, he told him that they were locked in the uh, house and it was still outside. While Raymond's talking to the police, the Mothman creature is apparently shuffling around on the porch, pushes on the door, peers into the windows. Uh, uh, I remember that they the didn't want me to watch Spaceballs when I was a kid. Like if you, uh, if you were able to put a costume together that quick, they were like, you "It's too much. It's like, oh, too much. Shit. We gonna make some people scared tonight." And you just get some big ass feathered costume. And made no fucking sense to me. Uh, uh, now as an adult, and I watched that uh, movie police, multiple uh, times. searched all around the house, but found nothing but a bunch of rubberneckers. Yeah, yard, it doesn't matter. As long as you're not hurting anyone, who gives a shit? As Raymond long as you're police, not uh, you're not sports. doing anything Marcella like Bennett lascivious or anything like that. Like, who cares? Talking about. She was traumatized, couldn't sleep afterwards. She would say, I would think I could Space hear Balls the wings great. flapping I watched the noise it when I was eight. the roof. I watched it when I, I was four. Somehow she four. felt the creature now yeah. had a link to when her. When I was uh, back. four. She never drove at night after this experience. I watched it when I was four. That, that it was right outside it, it's fucking hilarious what when you're a four-year-old. Do you know what it is was. as an adult? Close fucking hilarious. Kids. She even sought medical attention. There's at only to deal with one joke uh, that I would say Sleep that missed. little kids Sleep shouldn't Sleep listen to. Sleep and that's a personal she would opinion, feel which is, I'm surrounded by assholes. For example, she would feel as if... Uh, but also, it teaches you a fucking life lesson that you're probably, uh, if you're Marcella smart enough to know it, no terror, you're probably surrounded by assholes. Book, the Mothman Prophecy. So, in fact, I think kids the should day. watch so, it. You know, okay, so, you know, I, I can joke around about this stuff, but you know, these people seem uh, very into what they think they saw. Next day, the local press was abuzz with tales of Mothman. Here's a little excerpt. You're from either November an 17th, asshole or you're surrounded by it. of the Point Pleasant Register. Ever since two young couples sighted a man-sized creature in the McClinic Wildlife Area Tuesday night, ridicule after pun after cute remark has been quoted about Mason County's monster or bird. Nevertheless, it was seen again last night by several of the hundred of curious citizens scouting the massive area. And the same description was given, gray in color, 10-foot wingspan, 6 feet tall, and huge red eyes. The latest to see the thing were Raymond Wong, If Wamsley, you're not 19, surrounded by Wong, assholes, 18, you are the Marcella asshole. Bennett, 21, I was typing and Ricky Thomas, 15, said, according to the Mason true, County Sheriff's Office. True, true. They told like, Sheriff George Johnson the huge bird was in the yard of It teaches Thomas, you a life lesson. I think Church kids should Sierra. watch space balls. The time was about 10 p.m. Wednesday. It's a kid's comedy. And stared at them and then soared away. Civil Defense and National that Guardsmen were patrolling in the area last night, along with sheriff and deputies. So that's pretty crazy. Whether you know whether it happened or not, there's enough, there's enough kind of uh, commotion, you know, uh, going on about, about these sightings that they got some National I, Guard in there. None they of that police, you know, that deputies, movie. Sheriff, I would say kids cannot watch. Out in the woods. I would say it's Next one of day, Mel Brooks' another cleanest Captain Paul Yoder, movies. Benjamin Enix, both volunteer firemen from Point Pleasant, revealed that they had seen a very large bird it, it tells in you, the TNT it, area like, November, on, on the November 18th. It tells you exactly uh, what happened to the series of, uh, with big red eyes. of but it was huge. Star Wars. We've never seen anything like which it. Which is, so it's always in search of money. Uh, a lot of motion, sending folks into hysterics, maybe. 
Let's it it, it literally uh, did, did the bird take it has man's no dog? uh Merle Partridge it has no real structure things Salem just kind of happen in it which are, is exactly what uh, what Shepherd happens in uh, in the original the Star Wars and I think it's a great fucking uh, never seen again How much joke that stuff, movie to Monster Star Wars Rayleigh, please leave the doodles alone leave, leave the doodles don't take faint pooper I don't think Ginger Bell, Moss Man. It's a, it's a, it's an this. amazing movie with an That's amazing not soundtrack. Uh, sometimes one of them does take a shit in the basement. Uh, we, we can't figure out which one's doing it. Sometimes, sometimes Ginger does chew on the furniture. But you let us, you let us decide how to punish those fucking little weasels. If you have to take one, I love her, but take Ginger Bell. Take Ginger, if you, ha if you have to. If one of them has to go, leave Penny Boomer. Please don't do that, Moss Man. Um, okay, so during these first few days of sightings that the creature seems to have gotten its Mothman name, and November I still 17th, don't know why they turned it off the because it was at the joke of, it seems to be the earliest example uh, of the creature being called raspberries. It read bird, I plane, hate or raspberries. Mason There's only one County man who would dare Mothman. give me raspberries. It was written by local reporter Pat Lone Star. Uh, the, the creature Mothman. Seems like Pat how is just that? came up with that herself. Well done. Nice, nice ride, Pat. How is that at like Birdman, all? Which is closer to what the actual like uh, considered uh, a uh, bad joke look like, as described by witnesses. Nice alliteration, Pat. And and Batman was already taken, so you know you, you would look silly if you would call it just Batman. Uh, next day on the November eighteenth, uh, like now as an adult, uh, I'm still the, baffled the by that. Printed the headline. Maybe the Mothman be a balloon. No, she Later had no idea 19th, what this movie a was. From the Herald Dispatch read that Mothman would you believe a sand hill crane. Uh, yeah, some people assume that what they were seeing uh, was it was my brother's uh, VHS that, that I like, borrowed like the, uh, like the and, and uh, uh, alien extravaganza I no in the Area 51 stuff. I want to you know, watch it again sightings. now. Yeah, I do no, like, were what was related. the joke that uh, she was I, like, I don't think that makes no, sense with no, because no one described. I don't know like where you got orb, this, orb, and I'm like, uh, well, great it's away, it's mine. Like I need that, it you know, back. For a I did get it back from a great distance, but uh, it couldn't be mistaken up close for a red-eyed winged humanoid. But like, so that doesn't make any sense to me. I had to I'm, beg her I'm back saying, for it because I was like, it's my brother's. Please get back. Police in Charleston, and West now Virginia, as an adult, received an I don't excited get it. phone call from one Richard West. Dick West. Ah, uh, Dick West. That's, I don't get that's a like, strong ass There's name, only Dick one West. joke in that movie be like a that literally or something uh, that, name. that uh, you would turn it off for. Uh, yeah. that's better than, like, and we didn't even get Dick to that East joke. Seems weird to me. Uh, and that's the Dick asshole's South. joke. Dick South seems sad. Dick South. What's your name? Oh, Dick South. Keep firing the assholes. Sad Wayne always pointed down. I'm Dick South. That's it. Oh, man. But you're Dick Dick West. Oh, it's manly. Anyway. Uh, Dick West, 10.15 p.m., Monday, November 21st. He talks to patrolman D.L. Tucker. West insisted that a Batman was sitting on a roof next to his house. That's fantastic. I'm Dick West. And next door is Batman. He said, uh, it looks like a man that's about six feet tall, has a wing spread of six or eight feet, has great big red eyes. Did it fly, Tucker asked? Straight up like a helicopter, West answered. And then he hung up. That's what you do with your dick, West. Straight up like a helicopter, motherfucker. Clack! <laughs> don't, don't bother me. Don't bother Dick West. Goddamn I'll do what Richard I want to West. November 25th, 1966. Says, no, 13 miles east of Salem, Clarksburg, West Clint. Virginia. The mystery monster spotted again. This time by Tom Uri, assistant manager of the Kinney store, 7.15 a.m. Morning of November 25th. Tom told the sheriff's office that he had an experience with the bird as he traveled north on State Route 62. All right, all around this, this 62. Or he was driving home from Point Pleasant to Salem, a little town 13 miles east of Salem. Uh, or excuse me, east of Point Pleasant, about, uh, oh no. Uh, actually, it's a town about 130 miles from Point Pleasant. Oh, okay, so that's right. He was visiting relatives. I was like, man, that's a long commute. Uh, no, he was spending Thanksgiving in Point Pleasant with some relatives when he encountered this creature. He says, I know people think you're crazy when you tell of seeing something like this, but I've never had an experience. I was scared. Uh, and giving an account to the Point Pleasant Register, Tom said as he went from the road, went up the road, excuse me, he spotted a flying object that seemed to come uh, down from the woods at not, uh, on, his, on, his, uh, like a, on his flight. After his description of the area, it was determined it came from the area back of the Homer Smith residence. Who's Homer Smith? Does that name sound familiar? It's Kenny Dumb Dumb Duncan's father-in-law. The one he was digging that grave for. And he just couldn't mention seeing a flying monster to his buddies. Didn't want to bring him up again, but here we are. Uh, and Tom said that near Homer's house, Mothman came up like a helicopter and then veered over my car. 
It began going around in circles about two or three telephone poles high and kept staying above, above my car, he added. Well, his first thought was that of fear, or he noted, I tried to get away. It was going about 70 miles an hour, but it kept up with me easily. He stated that it kept soaring over his vehicle until he got to Kirkland Memorial Gardens, the Point Pleasant Cemetery. Uh, why do cemeteries keep popping up, Taylor? And then, it, and then it made its way to the left and over toward the river. Or he said, I have a convertible. And at first, <laughs> it felt it was going to come through the top. But after it stayed in the air... At oh, my gosh. I don't... I know that it's the the story needs to know I have a convertible because that's when I was scared, so I put up the top. But it just feels like a brag of like I have a convertible, guys. You guys, I have a convertible. About the same height, I didn't feel like it would attack. I've seen Big Bird, but I've never seen anything like this. He commented. Given a description, he said it was grayish brown in color, about six feet in length or height, and was at least uh, had at least an eight to ten foot wingspan. And, and I like how he felt compelled to add that he had seen big birds before, and that he would know the difference between a big bird with large red eyes and a winged demon man. This is weird that the people are thinking like that these things are, are, are birds, you know, uh, bird and, and winged demon man. I feel like those are two very different creatures. Are you sure you saw a red eyed monster face, seven foot tall? A uh, demon man with a with a ten foot wingspan, or maybe a crane or condor, maybe an owl, maybe a large pigeon, maybe an aggressive robin. Go go go, G officer! I mean, heck, when you sit up on two legs and raise your wings and stare at me with his red eyes and flex his man pecs, I thought for sure it would be a monster of some sort. But now that I think harder upon it, I think it may have been a gray parrot or perhaps a bluebird. How the fuck? How would you mix those two things up? Tom uh, probably felt compelled to say uh, that it wasn't a bird because you know. Uh, some witnesses, as we've heard, you know, those firemen d did say that what they saw was a bird. And people do still think, uh, you know, today that the 1966 Mothman sightings were actually just strange bird sightings. Uh, the main culprit people seem to believe in seems to be the Sand Hill Crane. Which is totally one of these fine. Birds? Um, just three days after the first Mothman story was published about the Point Pleasant sighting, uh, of the you know Mothman following a car full of uh, two young local couples who drove back out of town, saw it again. A story was published in the Huntington Herald Dispatch on November nineteenth, and it was titled "The Mothman: Would You Believe a Sand Hill Crane?" And here's what it said: It said the case of the Mason County monster may have been solved Friday by a West Virginia University professor, Dr. Robert L. Smith, associate professor of wildlife biology in That's WVU's funny. Division of Forestry, told Mason he Sheriff in, George Johnson he in Point Pleasant range, he believes so the thing, the which has been frightening him. people in the Point Pleasant area since Tuesday, is a large bird, which stopped off while oh, my green uh, From all the descriptions I have read nice. about this thing, it perfectly matches the Sand Hill Crane, said the professor. I definitely believe that's what people are seeing. Since Tuesday, more than 10 people have spotted what they described as Birdman or Mothman in the area of the McClintic Wildlife uh, Station. They described it as a huge gray winged creature with large red eyes. Dr. Smith said the sandhill crane stands an average of five feet tall and has gray plumage. A feature of its appearance is a bright red fleshy area around each eye. It has an average wing spread of about seven feet. Somebody who has never seen anything like it before could easily get the impression it is a flying man, he said. Car lights would cause the bare skin to reflect with big red circles around the eyes. Okay, so I had to stop reading this old newspaper article at this point and look up some pictures of this crane. And I gotta say, it looks nothing like a dude. Like nothing. I don't know what the hell Dr. Smith is talking about when he says, perfectly matches the description of a sandhill crane. No, no. It a, has a teeny tiny little bird head. Like the tiniest little bird head. Uh, with not human at all looking bird eyes on the sides of its head, since it is not a predator. On the sides of its little, little bird head. And it's very skinny, little narrow bird head rests on the end of a very super duper long, very skinny crane neck. It does have big, cool, powerful looking wings. It's a big bird, but in between those wings is a skinny ass little weak bird body. It looks honestly like a long necked duck with big wings and literal sticks for legs. Its legs could not be skinnier. It, it, its legs look like they're about an inch in diameter. It, looks like, it reminds me of bamboo reeds. It looks like they got. Uh, bamboo reeds, those little web feet at the bottom. No one, no one. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Uh, the web feet. I, I, I added that. I, you know, I have to pull this clip to be very honest with you guys. I, I wrote that in the in my notes, 
But uh, I don't actually, it might have a little, it might not have webs, but it has a little fucking tiny bird feet. I know that. Uh, no one who would see this, I, that I, I don't think, would have mistaken it for a human being. I don't care if it's dark. Right? I, I don't know how you could be dumb enough to mistake this creature for a monster bird man and be smart enough to still talk to a re- reporter after the incident. Um, I, I know some people like to work themselves up and see what they want, I guess. And so, you know, they, they could have really manufactured the whole thing in that sense. <laughs> but I don't think you would see this bird and think it was a giant monster man. Uh, at the end of the article, he says, while such birds are rare to this area, uh, Dr. Smith said this is migration time and it could, this and it could not be yeah, too not difficult for one like or more birds all. to stop off yeah. at the wildlife refuge. There are no... It's a... Uh, let me type in Mothman bird. Mothman brain. Now, the owl might be a... Uh... Oh, my God. It's beautiful, though. It is a beautiful bird. I think the owl is more uh, appropriate. I think the big-ass fucking owl is way more appropriate. Uh, But in uh, the West Virginia, uh, the Mothman is actually a giant moth in the Fallout 76. Now, I love this interpretation of it. I have Mothman in my uh in my lexicon of uh of creatures in my uh in my comic. But it's not a bird. Yes, beautiful bird, but not Mothman. You are right. Agreed. Official sightings of such birds in West Virginia, although there have been unconfirmed reports in the past, he added. Okay. And he warned that the sandhill crane is harmless if left alone, that a cornered it may become a formidable antagonist. Its dagger-like bill is a dangerous weapon which the crane does not hesitate to use when at bay and fighting for its life. Many a hunter's dog has been badly injured, he said. Some of those who reported seeing the monster remembered uh, best the eerie sound it made. The description of the sandhill crane also fits there. He says the cry of a sandhill crane is a veritable force of nature, untamed and unterrified. Uh, its uncanny quality is like that of a loon, but is more pronounced because of the greater volume of the crane's voice. Its resonance is remarkable, and its carrying power is increased by a distinct tremolo effect. Often for several minutes after birds have vanished, the unearthly sounds drift back to the listener, like a taunting trumpet from the underworld. That's a pretty terrifying description. But does the bird actually sound like that? Well, I, I just I, I did some research. I want to play you. Uh, a little, now, this is the Sand Hill Crane, it's scream. So you decide for yourself if it sounds demonic to you. Okay. Okay. That, that is fairly scary. Uh, that is fairly scary. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, let's check out, let's check out uh, uh, another. There's, there's various recordings of them on the web. Uh, maybe, maybe, what about this? This is a man's world. Yeah. Now, to me, that one sounded more like James Brown than a Sandhill Crane. Let me, one, let me, one more time on that. This is a man's world. Yeah. That's uncanny. Sounds exactly like James Brown. Um, <laughs> obviously, that's for nonsense. Um, here is the real one. Here's the real bird sound. All right, let me, let me get right back to here. Uh-huh. That's what, that's actually what they make. Have I heard that at night? Yeah. I creep me out, but but you know, dark cry from the underworld? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's uh that's not that terrifying to me. Um in a perfect in a perfect world, uh it would sound like this. This would be awesome if this is how the bird actually sounded. I thought I saw a pussy. <laughs> I did! I did saw a pussy cat! Oh, Tweety Bird, why are you out there trying to pretend to be Mothman? Scaring folks. Come on, Tweet! Come right over here and kiss the poor little birdie. Yeah, you make everything better, little Tweety Bird. Come here, Thomas, and kiss the little birdie. Ah, oh, I love it. He's, ah, how long has it been since he heard about Tweety? Okay. 
So the next day, November 26th, uh, in St. Albans, West Virginia. Oh, I'm going to get rid of these so I don't actually play them during the rest of the show. <laughs> um, just outside of Charleston, 45 miles south of Pound, uh, Point Pleasant, Mrs. Ruth Foster claims now that the Mothman is appearing on her front lawn uh, in the evening. Oh! November 26th. I uh, was standing oh. on the lawn beside the porch, oh. she told reporters. It was tall, oh, big red see. eyes. I want to see. Face. May My I husband see. is six feet one, and this I bird looks see. about the same height, or maybe a little I short. I wish to she see continued. your picky. Had a funny little face. I didn't see any beak. All I, I saw was to those see big your red, picky. poppy eyes. I screamed and ran back to the to house. My brother-in-law went out to look. I'm always it interested gone. in okay, my right. viewers' so art. So Mrs. May have and I'm always interested in yours. When she talks about having a tiny little face. Just because you are my good friend. But some of the other people are either too lying or really hyped up a bird. They get very interested in other people's art. The next day in St. Albans. On November 27th, two teenage oh, like girls some of my friends. Uh, by a gray seven-foot-tall creature. Uh, Sheila Kane, age 13, and her younger sister were walking home from the store when they saw an enormous something <laughs> standing next to the local junkyard. It was gray and white with big red eyes, Sheila reported, and it must have been seven feet tall, taller than a man. I screamed and we ran home. It flew up in the air and followed okay. part of the way. Connie Joe Carpenter, 18-year-old witness, or <laughs> 18-year-old witness, 18-year-old waitress oh, at the tiny message. diner in Point Pleasant. Now, now Village Pizza also claimed to have an encounter with Mothman on the 27th. Love that. Connie Joe described was described as a shy, studious girl of 18 from New Haven, claimed to have the encounter 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, November 27th, driving home from church when she saw what at first she thought was a large man uh, dressed in gray standing on the deserted uh, links of the Mason County Golf Course. Again on route, uh, route 62, about 50 miles north of Point Pleasant. Ten foot wings suddenly unfolded. The thing took off straight up and headed for her car. Those eyes, they were very red, and once they were fixed on me, I couldn't take my own eyes off of them. It's a wonder I didn't have a wreck, she declared. Connie Joe said the creature flew directly at her windshield, then veered off and disappeared. She stepped on the gas and raced home in hysteria, locked herself in her bedroom. Those eyes, that's all she'd ever say was those eyes, her boyfriend would later say. She was so upset that uh, she wasn't. Uh, she was unable to go to school for several days and required medical attention. Ooh. She was also. Uh, she also suffered from an ailment afterwards called Clee Conjunctivitis, or eye burn. Her eyes were red, swollen, and itchy, with water coming out of them oh, for two yeah. weeks. Miss Carpenter was also one of the few to claim a close look at the Mothman's face, saying it was horrible, like Ooh. something out of a science fiction movie. Many years oh. later. In 2001, when filmmakers uh, making the Search for the Mothman documentary wanted to talk to light her about little... it, she declined. She said, I guess she's still kind of traumatized. Ugh. Her husband, Keith Baker, the, who was her boyfriend at the time, both decided to spoke on her behalf, saying, I'd like people to understand it, that, that I'm here did? to make sure mm. they don't mm. think she's a kook. Because she's not. And when she says now, she's seen, she's To get a shading seen. for the metal, she went on to say, the remember, only thing I have don't to say be afraid is, to keep an open mind. Because a dark blue or something like that. What are you but do remember, it does you? change the aspect of the uh, metal. Well, okay. So, right. like, point. for point. like a silver, I, mean, I would use a darker, that uh, a darker uh, gray I mean, color. Would emotionally uh, you but like for that. like uh, a regular a iron, would I would like use that. a blue. Man, you're a fragile, you're a fragile human. And then for uh, like steel, uh, I would use I would use a purple. Okay, so sometime in November. In 1966, Bob Bosworth and his but friend Alan Coates are said to have seen a legendary moth just man within the TNT. Color area, stuff and all that. North and Island, when you're making uh, the goggles. Oh, and, and now these two, uh, if they saw anything, they did not see Do afraid. not be afraid to sure contrast. There's a fair amount of alleged sightings written about uh, that happened at some point. Uh, there, there are sightings that are not given an exact date. But that is an opinion. In the fall of 1966. I think I'm you're doing amazing work. Pretty redundant. You know, you get the idea now. I think you're doing amazing sightings. work. Uh, weren't reported in the papers at the time. Don't really add I have much birds in my face. I just want you to know that they're out there. This one I wanted to include because Bob has repeated the story in numerous sure interviews, on, uh, authors, and documentary filmmakers over the years. Yes. Uh, the stories remain consistent, and, it, and it, <laughs> it is an interesting one. He said, a friend of mine, Alan Coates, had a motorcycle. We were just riding around, and Al said, you want to go up to the TNT area? And I said, yeah, we might as well. Bob and Alan had already heard news stories about the Mothman, which locals refer to simply as the bird. Bob and even once offered Roger Scarberry five bucks to take him to where he saw the bird, but Roger declined the offer. It was chilly weather, so the men were wearing heavy coats. They drove along Camp Conley Road. The road was adjacent to the old armory, which later became fairgrounds. So we're riding out through there, and Al said, Look at that. We stopped, and up on top of the roof, that old power plant building, uh, it was, I believe, a three-story building, and up on top we seen two big, what looked like red eyes looking at us. And he's telling the story many years later to an author. 
He said, somebody's probably got a couple reflectors nailed to a board trying to fool somebody. I bet you're right. I said, so, or no, he's, uh, no, he said, yeah, I, I, I said, I bet you're right. Let's go up there and see what it is. So I do like these guys' style. This happens. So being honest, we finally get a pair of adventurers with some balls in the tail. Hell no. All right. Enough squealing and running around, racing, you know, away from this thing, you know, falling down on your baby. Let's have Mothman get chased for once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. West Virginia Hawk folks, go get him now. Oh, boy. You don't did it, Mothman. Uh, he says, we stopped right there and we looked up. Well, it looked like those red eyes were looking down at us then. That still didn't bother us much because we thought whoever it was just turned the board. The men tried to pick up the front of the motorcycle, shine the headlight on the red eyes, but the motorcycle was too heavy. They couldn't get to the front end of it. Yeah, they couldn't get the front end of it, excuse me, high enough. So they decided to just go to the top of the building. They entered the power plant, went to the third floor on a concrete platform. There were metal grating catwalks veering off toward abandoned equipment. And that'd be spooky as shit. Walking through an abandoned power plant, looking for the source of two shiny lights that could be the eyes of some Mothman creature. Scary and exciting. I wouldn't do it alone, but I probably would do it with a friend. Right? The feeling, whether it's real or not, safety in numbers. It was in the process of a lot of demolition work. They'd remove the ladder that took you up on the roof. I thought that uh, I thought, how in the world could anybody get up there? All of a sudden, this I don't know. I don't really know what to say. Whatever, whatever I saw, it, it very slowly and precisely walked towards us. The floors of the abandoned power plant were literally were littered. Uh, glass, just remember that really silver, uh, silver is going to be a brighter so metal. Bright, shining the open the bronze is also uh, uh, bronze and gold are shy. very difficult because right when you go with uh, gold, you're looking for a brown. Red I thought about a that. reddish brown that is what you're looking for, but bronze, you're looking for a deep brown that goes into a black. I stepped and extended my arm towards it. I could have touched it. Bob claimed to have seen just the distinct outline of the creature. The unique shape was large and had broad shoulders. He estimated it was 6'6 six, six to 7 feet tall. Were no birds. Unless someone released an especially tall, especially short necked, aggressive emu or ostrich in West Virginia in late 1966. I've seen no records of that. He said, I don't know of any man that I've ever seen this built the way this thing was built. Back then, I weighed 170 pounds. Its shoulders went past me. Had a taper to it. Well, I, I would compare it with the robin. You know, bird, how it looks when their wings are folded and how their bulge at the top to come back down to a taper. It was just as though it had a head, a large head sitting on its shoulders. Here's what we did because you can't sometimes comprehend what you're seeing. But it looked like a very, looked very strange. So I told Al, you know, Al, that's, that's a bird. Uh, I'm going to shoot it. <laughs> what? He said, Al, that's, if that's a bird, I'm going to shoot it. Uh, he said, well, we didn't have any guns. If it were somebody... They should have spoke up and said, hey, man, don't shoot. It's me. Oh, I see what he's doing. I see. That's right. He's trying to make the, he's saying out loud, hey, this is a bird. Let's shoot it to make it, uh, if it's a person, be like, no, oh, don't shoot me. Nothing. He just should right there. I said again, ow, I mean it. I'm going to shoot it. He said, go ahead. I put my hand into my coat like I had a gun. No sound. It just stood right there just as if it were looking right at me. I'm 5'9". I had to tilt my head back a little bit to look where its face should be. I had a rounded head. But well, if you can imagine a U upside down, it was just too big to be a man. There was no quick or threatening moves whatsoever. And, it meant, and had it meant any harm, it certainly had its chance right there towards either one of us. But I remember that any nervousness went away, and I started becoming more interested in trying to figure it out. I became, at that point, very calm. I wasn't afraid. I was unsure. Bob and Al stared at the thing in front of them for another five to six minutes. It very slowly and precisely turned towards the catwalks. Now these catwalks have been torn up and everything else. It went out to nothing, dropped off three stories down. And it's where they had removed equipment. So whatever this thing was turned and started walking out the cat. I don't know, fuck, it's fucking terrible. I don't know what the hell he's trying to say here. So it, it's, it's, I'm still to the point that I'm not sure what I'm seeing. And I didn't want anyone to get hurt. So I yelled out, buddy, don't go out on that catwalk. There's no railing. It drops off three stories down. Never hesitation. Then we just heard the sound of wings. It was just as though it said, well, I'm bored, and left. I walked. I walked. It, it walked back. God damn it, man. The fucking, it walked to the back of the catwalk. And only at that time, for some reason, is when we started getting a little nervous. I don't like the way this guy speaks. We hastily left. Bob and Alan ran down the steps. They didn't hear anything else, but kept looking back as they ran to the motorcycle and drove off. One thing that has always stuck in my mind all these years is how in the world, if it was a person or someone out to scare us, how they could get up there and then get down that quick while we were coming up the steps. 
Bob and Alan mostly kept the story to themselves. They didn't think the police could help. Bob's father thought he was seeing things, but no one would believe him, even if he told him. Uh, Bob added, I would give anything to see it one more time before I die. I would do things differently. I would try to touch it. I just got the feeling when it was in front of me that it was, it was safe. I wasn't, it wasn't going to hurt me. I just wish I could caress it. I wish I could hug it and tell it that everything's okay. I wish I could just look into its eyes and just understand what love is and feel approval that I never got from my father. And I just wish if I could one chance that I could just hold his hands, hold his moth hands, and just ask and just get down on one knee and just, will you marry me? If I could, if I had one, if I had one shot, and just and put my lips on his beak and just, you know, and just feel his chest and hope, hope that there's breasts and breasts or not, and just make love to it and have a, have a beautiful moth baby and raise it with a caring and understanding that my father never gave me when I was young. <laughs> and, and, and Bob just started to weep. Uh, no, I made up that last stuff. But, uh, but he told the story to Jeff Walmsley. He published it in a 2005 book, Mothman Behind the Red Eyes. In 2017, the audio from this interview uh, was used in an animated sequence in the Mothman, a Point Pleasant documentary. I wish that stuff I made up at the end uh, was also animated. So that's what they say, what, that's what they say happened. Now, the, the, I do have, I thought it was just a weird story, so I wanted to share. I do have problems with this story. My main problem is the lack of a flashlight. Right? Let me get this straight. You've been planning on going out, looking for some scary-ass creature out in the woods at night. I would think that a flashlight would be a very important item to have on your list. Uh, next, next to maybe gun. Gun might be the only other more important item to have on that list, and they have brought neither. And this is a, these are two dudes in rural West Virginia in 1966 that don't have guns or flashlights with them on this adventure. I have a problem with that. However, I am very forgetful. I do do shit without planning it myself a lot of times. You know, I, I will go to the grocery store without grabbing the grocery list. The one thing I'm supposed to fucking bring besides my wallet. I've gone to the grocery store without either my wallet or the grocery list. So, maybe, maybe that could have happened. Okay. So, a couple more little eyewitness things here. Another alleged eyewitness who supposedly saw this creature sometime in late November 1966 Excuse me, as a sighting worth mentioning is Faye DeWitt Laporte. That November in Point Pleasant, 13-year-old Faye and her siblings decided to see if they could find the mythical Mothman, uh, said to be haunting the area. Her older brother, Copper, had heard of the sighting, wanted to prove it was fake, once and for all. So they drove to the creature's rumored hiding place, that damn TNT area outside of Point Pleasant, drove up there in a green 59 Ford truck. As they drove, the Mothman said to have appeared and began running beside the car. Oh, he can run now, too. I like it. Terrified. Faye found herself face-to-face -face with the creature through the car window. Her brother told her not to look at it, but she got glimpses from the corner of her eye. She said it was whitish and sandy, had the features of a human, but no beak. Almost, uh, yeah, had the features of a human, yeah, no beak. Almost everyone by late November is sure to point out that what they saw was not a bird. Uh, she saw those infamous giant red eyes. She didn't see the creature's wings until later, because he didn't fly at first, he was just running. She was impressed by the creature's ability to keep up with them, running, uh, you know, about 50 miles an hour. Face it, all I could see was the eyes. They were they were so big, other than yeah. anything else on its face. It just it just held you. And that's about all you saw. The eyes. The eyes was the reddest eyes I've ever seen in my life. And to this day, I've never seen anything that red. In a panic, she told her younger sister Betty and her younger brother to hide by ducking down in the back seat. Her older brother went as fast as he could around a sharp corner, trying to lose the creature, but the beast was simply too fast. It turned along with them, continued to follow. Faye's brother went around another sharp turn. Stopped the car sideways in the road. Ah, oh, shit's intense. The creature jumped on the hood of the car, looked at them through the windshield. The creature leaped to the top of a nearby abandoned factory, then jumped on top of the building, then just turned and sat down and crouched like a gargoyle, Faye described. The creature was amazingly able to leap the height of a tall building in a single jump without flying some superhero shit. She then says that her brother got out of the car. And, and what? She says that her brother got out of the car and started throwing rocks and pieces of coal at the creature. What the fuck? Dude, if this is a horror movie, you'd be first to go. What are you doing? You're getting out? out why would you get out and throw rocks at it? And, and how much more stereotypically West Virginia could you be right now? You hop out to throw literal lumps of coal <laughs> that are just laying on the ground at a, at a cryptozoological beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, get out of here, damn mouth. Oh, take that. I'll clean you right between your critter eyes. Hey, with this here cold lump. How are oh, you, Flo? No, you don't scare my sister. You don't scare my sister, you damn big bug man. Son of a bitch. You got right there, Phil. Oh, get out of here, gargoyle. Oh, get out of here, you train fella. No. Oh, <laughs> anyway, that's Emma. a story. That's what she said. Oh. Uh, she said that her, her, finally her brother threw a larger coal chunk. Oh, my. <laughs> it was landed, landed oh. by Mothman's foot. 
And you're still looking. Up, looking okay. Turned sideways, jumped Fair down enough. the roof. The same way I just love your uh, emotes. Brother, then they look adorable. The yeah, I bet he did. They look uh, adorable. Oh, no, 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 I can't wait until you have more. <laughs> oh, you don't see the way you look at me. playing games, gotcha. I just oh, wanted to uh, know how to Those are really he cute he emotes. He those are he really cute emotes. I don't give up. I got to no more cold. I never know how. That's how I picture him kind of getting excited. Uh, then they saw the creature spread its wings for the first time, flopped in the darkness, leaving the children stunned. Faye described the Mothman by saying, I'd say it's close to five, six feet. Right? Same description. Same description everybody else is giving. She also told a story to the local author, Jeff Wamsley, for that same book we just referenced, uh, 2005 Moth Mothman, Behind the Red Eyes. I think I mentioned that one already. Uh, Faye then went on uh, the Monster Quest television show and was later featured in the Eyes of the Mothman documentary. 2017, Faye appeared in the Mothman of Point Pleasant documentary. A lot of documentaries done about Mothman. Love them. Uh, when asked if she thought the creature could have been they some sort cute. of mutation, I can't wait till you make more. This was not a mutation. This was something that was perfectly formed. So I can't supposed wait to till you like make thing more. Is. Okay. Uh, if you'll recall from the Men in Black suck, it was around this time that the Men in Black supposedly started visiting Mothman witnesses. Uh, it said in, the, in that suck that local West Virginia journalist Mary Hire was approached by the Men in Black, who asked her to stop reporting on Mothman, and then if you recall, just just uh, just gave up and left her alone when she said no. Uh, she said, yeah, I'm going to keep reporting. They're like, okay. And they just left. Uh, she, she said other locals were approached by the men in black. One uh, was the witness we just spoke of, Faye DeWitt LaPorte. Faye said that when her and her brother tried to return to the TNT area a few days after the sighting, it was blocked off by two men in black who would not let them enter. Uh, one of the four Mothman witnesses who really kicked off the news coverage of the Mothman back on November 15th, Linda Scarberry, who also claimed to have had uh, men in black encounters. She later said in an interview, the men in black wore black suits, black hats, sunglasses. They drove black cars, Cadillacs, I think. Looked like human beings, but their skin was somewhat the transparent. Hello you could see the there. veins in their hands uh -huh. very clearly. Their fingers doing were longer good. than their normal person's fingers as well. This is what Daddy I got so far. He said they were awkward and shaking hands. That's how you know. You got an alien. They don't know how to shake so hands. Got... Uh, they seem to know what to do. So I got but they this, seem to not uh, know what to do. Basically how to shake done. <laughs> That is kind of a funny detail. Uh, I just need to like, add the shading like and all that. Some is going to be smart Basically enough to travel around done. the galaxy and immediately get to uh, And now you know, I'm UFO working on this. And uh, everyone and is jealous of my uh, characters. Not figure out how to shake a uh, hair, hair game. Okay. Everyone she is secretly jealous of around. her hair there game. There were three men in the car. The men in black went so, so far. I mean, just look at that hair. We were afraid to turn around. Men, women, doesn't matter. Uh, within two weeks of the initial Secretly, publication of the first Mothman you sighting, are sighting jealous the paper off. of her hair. But it did steadily kind of pour in, uh, you know, for the next year until and she's, December of She's not even the main character. A steady by stream the way. of She's of not the main character. Birds, I mean, giant owl, character. The devil himself sitting next to one man in his bedroom at night. Lawrence Gray. Everybody's Point jealous. Uh, reported feeling something like that was in his house. Uh, looking all over in the middle of the night, not finding anything. But then when he uh, he laid back down in his bed, Right back down, rolled over. There was a there was a winged humanoid with red eyes sitting in his room, staring at him. He was paralyzed with fear, claims it was the devil himself. The sightings are still going on, right? People are claiming to see all kinds of monsters, even to see the devil. He, he said it dissipated and vanished into thin air. Uh, and then he woke his wife up, who agreed that it was the devil. This does not feel like a Mothman incident, but it's part of the lore. I, I love that his wife agreed that it was the devil he saw. It's just the devil, Larry. It's not <laughs> Mothman, it's just it's just Satan. And go back to bed. I'm sure he's moved on to some other sinner. Well, what have you been doing anyway? The devil come to our home, Larry. Have you been hanging around that corner tavern staring at these ass again? Uh, two women swore they saw a Mothman fly to meet a UFO, one of the most outlandish uh, sightings, on May 19, 1967. The flying creature with uh, glowing red eyes approached a hovering luminous object and then disappeared. So Brenda Stone thinks she, uh, thinks she saw. November 1967, four adult males claimed to have encountered a giant gray creature figure with red eyes while hunting. In Chief Cornstalk Park, West I'm not Virginia. secretly. So I'm openly. To raise the well, I'm just saying dog. every uh, uh, everybody 15, in this chat room. The Mothman sighting seemed to come to an end. Exactly 13 they months want, after the stories they began. They all want my characters here. 5, 5 p.m. local time that cold winter's Deep day. Down, the Silver Bridge that connecting Point Pleasant, you know, uh, West Virginia to Columbus, Ohio, it. collapses on the coldest day of the year. 46 people die. Nine more are injured. Two additional people disappear. It's the worst bridge accident in American history up until that point. For days, rescue workers pulled smash cars and bodies. I out may of the not have the most in interesting comment, but damn it, I will have the most interesting hair. 
I got the red in light. The comic. When it changed, I started going onto the bridge, and just about, about that time, slightly the bridge started exhausted while he is she not, heard loud uh, noise uh, is not a vehicle. hit the bridge underneath. She reversed her vehicle as the bridge began folding inward on itself with her tires stopped on the ledge where it broke off. Man, that'd be scary to come that close. The Department of Transportation conducted a detailed investigation of the collapse, found the cause to be a small uh, tenth of an inch, two and a half millimeter deep defect. If only on I had a good pun, uh, one. That was improperly manufactured. Unlucky come up. 13. A couple of sightings of Mothman were if said only. to have occurred near the bridge before the incident. If uh, only I had a pun. <laughs> Nothing that nothing that there are records not of names attached to, just whisperings. Rumors eventually spread that the bridge collapsed just was connected burnt. to Mothman in some way, and that Mothman could have been trying to warn people about the bridge collapse. Could have been some kind of dark premonition, some harbinger of doom, right? This is the beginning of that part of the lore. And and that, while it doesn't take us uh, out of the Mothman story, does take us out of today's Time Suck timeline. Whoops. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. <laughs> Sorry about the button mistakes. I got a little, I tried to get a little Just fancy. Just slightly tired. Yeah, sneak I around know. on the soundboard <laughs> and throw some James Brown into the story earlier. And I forgot that I had done that. And I left the wrong thing up. It's okay. It's okay. Jeez. It's okay. Right? So we still got out of the timeline. Okay, uh, while Mothman sightings of West Virginia have been rare since the collapse of the bridge in 1967, other sightings of winged humanoids have accompanied sure other disasters around the world, sense. adding to the Mothman legend mm -hmm. like the Black Bird of Chernobyl. Uh, the Black Bird of Chernobyl is an internet legend uh, about an allegedly seen creature in Ukraine uh, around the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. I had a weird plant, dream last night. Disaster, the Chernobyl disaster on uh, April 26, 1986. I mean, very similar one to of Mothman the parts creature. of the dream. Humanoid in appearance. I actually, uh, black, I, I feel like I know. Wings and glowing is, red eyes. Uh, by several I was talking to my mother. Uh, I was arguing uh, with, with the black my mother. Bird, the same and as the yeah, I was arguing with her ghost. Disaster. I know she isn't dead. Was, as some have suggested, it's just, was it a, just I know the reason why I was arguing with her ghost. Or entirely an internet legend. Story doesn't seem to appear that to be one isn't in any known that newspapers hard to realize, uh, or book publications. I was also you know, back around the time uh, of the disaster. It doesn't show up anywhere until about 15 years ago. I was also ago. in a giant the complex that also comes connects from a 2005 doors. post on AmericanMonster.com, uh, which said, beginning in April of 1986, a rumor reported like, the ranks of what was a little-known nuclear power plant me. located in the southern tier of Ukraine, Chernobyl. In the days preceding the tragic meltdown, four I don't know why. employees had reported seeing what they claimed was a large, dark, headless the tires man with gigantic uh, wings. Must be really nice. Eyes. Yes. Chernobyl employees began to yes. share unsettling and strangely similar experiences. I'm Some just, uh, had been having I'm horrifying nightmares, out. while others received threatening phone calls. According to the accounts, some of these employees even mentioned their bizarre experiences to their superiors at the facility. Sometimes when you without think evidence about or any it, clear-cut indication of what the problem up. would be, there was very little these officials could do. Uh, even had they been willing to take action. So, you know, and then there was just, you know, so there's a little bit more to the rumor is that a Soviet helicopter circled a smoldering plant, dropping over 500 pounds of clay, sand, lead, and other extinguishing chemicals on top of the flames. Some of the surviving workers who, at the sacrifice of their own lives, heroically struggled to prevent further destruction, claimed to have witnessed what has been described as a 20-foot bird gliding through the un undulating tentacles of ir irradiated smoke spewing from the re reactor when it melted down. Uh, Mothman is also tied to the collapse of the World Trade Center towers, towers excuse me, in New York City on 9-11. On Following the terrorist attacks, uh, rumors emerged that witnesses reported seeing a large crane-like figure in the vicinity of the towers five days prior to the attack. You know, it's been 31 years since any uh, such Mothman sighting in North America now. On the day of the horrific attack, Mothman was reported to have appeared again, some claiming they could see his face through clouds of smoke and debris. Two images said to have been taken by Steve Moran show what is thought to be Mothman in New York City on September 11, 2001. Um, yep. Mothman, uh, okay, so he says, I live in New York, and when I heard the Twin Towers were attacked, I immediately rushed to the scene to take photographs. First of all, I took pictures of medical workers who were providing assistance. Then I took pictures towards the site, uh, towards the south on Greenwich Street. When I got home, I realized there was an object that caught my camera. Steve went on, looks like an angel, was hovering above the ruins of the World Trade Center fractions. Maybe it's not a pigeon or a stork because of their large size. Moreover, we do have, we do not have the pelicans or bird carcasses. Oh, man. Okay. So How anyway, you been, he general? Did this picture, and uh, I've seen it. 
uh, you know, different versions of uh, of this this photo and stuff on the web. To me, it looks photoshopped. Looks very photoshopped. But you know, if you read the comments underneath the uh, the videos, like especially on YouTube, not everyone thinks so. And then in 2007, Mothman became associated with another bridge collapse. This time in Minnesota. I know the that I-35 you West are probably uh, bridge, sleepy. If you are sleepy, go to bed. Go to bed. I totally Steel understand it. Thank you for coming in. Uh, the Most people across get, Anthony Falls, get sleepy. The Interstate 35 West crossed St. Anthony Falls, Mississippi River, and Minneapolis, and I get Minnesota. It. On August so 1st, 2007, during rush hour. I'm just chilling right now while we'll talking with this uh, wonderful guy. Oh. Another, excuse me, 145. Oh, man, I wonder who you're talking to. Who's this wonderful people. girl? And a design flaw was also likely do, to cause Do I know them? Uh, the bridge was coincidentally built in 1967. Same year, the Silver Bridge collapsed in Point Pleasant. Do, Another weird do miracle I, do coincidence. Do I know them personally? Minnesota Bridge. I, I, I love meeting new goats. Silver Bridge was part of U.S. Highway 35. Not to mention that the death toll is number 13. He is the best. Recurring <laughs> number of the Mothman legend. Uh, George Nori, host of the Coast to Coast AM program we've talked about in a few alien-centric sites. Oh, various calls from individuals who reported many kinds of strange oh, creature sightings in the days after this collapse. Who's he talking about? People told their own eyewitness accounts for hours. Am I a good boy? Um, however, the, the, you know, these calls came in after the bridge collapsed, Am which is a, a good little boy. suspicious to me. But, again, still part of the Mothman lore now. And there's other random mm. encounters with winged humanoids at times of disaster. Uh, like the 2009 swine flu outbreak in Mexico, right? And on April 10th, 2009, residents of La Junta, or La Junta, excuse me, in the Mexican state of Chihuahua, began noticing a strange creature in their midst, very tall and hairy, with two expansive wings and wide bloodshot eyes. One young student reported that the creature chased him relentlessly. Uh, during this time, that uh, that the area began to see a rise in swine flu cases tied to this uh, ongoing 2009 outbreak. I know. I'm, uh, two I'm other being witnesses silly. claimed to have see, heard the creature in an apple orchard near a cemetery. So, like some people, you know, do believe this is part of the Mothman kind of lore. Uh, 1978, a group of miners in Freiburg, Germany, came face to face with a seemingly headless creature with glowing red eyes on its chest, blocking the mine's entrance. First, they thought it was a man in a trench coat. Quickly realized it was not a coat. Because then it unfurled huge black wings. The men remained. The men remained at the mine entrance, stunned and staring at the creature, until a blood-curdling screech sent the miners scrambling out. And then, about an hour later, they felt a seismic rumble and witnessed a plume of dust shoot from the mine as it collapsed. <clears throat> Excuse me. If the men had gone to their stations as usual, the majority would have died that day. So it appears that what, what has been dubbed the Freeburg Shrieker may have saved their lives. However, I cannot find again any original sources for that legend. And I, and I have a feeling, kind of like the uh, Chernobyl and 9/11, that this was manufactured on the web, kind of like that Russian sleep experiment. Uh, and then there's also the uh, Fukushima nuclear meltdown, where Marcus Pools, an American visiting Japan, was near the plant uh, in 2011 when he suddenly heard a loud whooshing sound and terrible screeching, and then he thinks he saw this, you know, creature with large black wings. So there's, there's, uh, you know, even other less cited and more obscure supposed legends. So what do I think about Mothman? What, what do I think uh, it or he is, if anything? We I will sum up my go. Mothman thoughts oh, right after you. we check in thank you. with the web thank you so on much. today's Thank you so much for the playing my game. You know what? I'll play that sound. You know what, you wonderful people? I'll play that sound. The right button that time. Because I want to hear it. Record. I want to put on my accuracy record. Nailed it. Today, uh, the first video is, is uh, looked at as the Mothman documentary. Just over a million views. Posted on November 25th, uh, 2015, by Top Fives. Funny dude Jake Jones brings up an excellent point, saying, maybe it's just a huge-ass moth. That'd be so creepy and great. If there was just some giant, man-sized moth. Thank you so much for playing in my uh, game. Uh, yeah. I would, I would uh, rather be attack attacked by a moth man, I think, than a yeah. giant moth. Terrifying. User Nina Morales makes an interesting uh, Project MK Ultra connection saying, this is a time when the CIA was experimenting with LSD, so maybe they were having a lot of fun, LOL, fucking with this town. Uh, Nina is correct about the timeline. I mean, the Point Pleasant Mothman sighting occurred in, what, December of, uh, of or excuse me, the Point yeah, the, the bridge collapse was 67, uh, you know, the, the occurrences were occurring mostly in the fall of 66, MK Ultra, the LSD experiments ran from 1953 until 73, they were headquartered, at least initially, in Camp Dietrich, now Fort Dietrich, Maryland. Point Pleasant, only about a five-hour drive west, excuse me, of Fort Dietrich. And if you recall from the MK Ultra Suck, the CIA did dose unsuspecting citizens with LSD. That happened for sure. 
Uh, the United States President's Commission on CIA Activities within the United States, set up under President Gerald Ford in 1975 to investigate the activities of the CIA and other agencies within the U.S., a uh, commission led by Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, sometimes referred to as the Rockefeller Commission, did uncover yep. all of this. MK Ultra might have uh, been, uh, might have been the Mothman. Knows that the Mothman is real. He's 100 percent sure. He sought it out, and he posts, "Mothman is real. I can't say for sure Yetis are real, but Mothman and El Chupacabra are real. Just because Mothman hasn't been seen doesn't mean it isn't there. As well, I think a Thunderbird is also possible, but I know scientifically highly unlikely." It's just hard for me to imagine every creature from the sea to the land and the sky have all been cartographed and on, or on some list. That's plain ridiculous. To sit here and say Mothman or the lesser known creatures besides yes, I love the goat. are not real is quite but I silly. say he is wonderful. A whole town uh, one. freaking said they saw, or saw something. So well, I'm just muscular is, surge. Do you uh, believe it was a Taking me a nice chillax in bird? time. Well, okay, had it's great to be it enjoys a few uh, vodka the new shots species are still uh, being for that nice, so enjoyable you claim time in the chill isn't real, doesn't make sense. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> Unless it's Bigfoot. Getting those that nice chill points. I question the existence of Thunderbirds. But Mothman? Chubacabra? And drinking responsibly. Of course they I just love, like, the strange lines he's drawn. You're right? It's like, Frankenstein's out of the whole well, fucking horse I'm glad that Dracula? you're enjoying your I, vodka, man. Fucking course it's real. I mean, werewolves? Yeah. For 100%. I just love that he is I, so sure that know, Yeti's Yeti. Hey, at here. least you're honest. Uh -uh. No, I don't fucking love the goat. Way. Mothman, but I do uh, enjoy yeah, uh, time hanging out with you him. You know that it's real. You know that's what a weird reality. That's man. honest, man. That, you I mean, know what? How is I love the honesty. I love the energy. Uh, for a second there, I thought I'd love to talk to him to find out, but I would. I hope I'd never talk to him. It'd be a terrible. I, I would hate to be cornered by that maniac. User I'm Shanti Game lie. is my spirit <laughs> animal in this thread. She posts, "Ha ha." I'm here to warn you of a disaster about to happen. I can somehow sense disasters before they come, but can't write a note, talk, or actually land on the bridge in public to bring attention to myself and the problem. I have to be cryptic, scare people in random areas, hoping they somehow get the message and maybe sneak onto the bridge for two seconds and fly away. If you can't tell, I find it hard to believe whatever was here wanted to bring knowledge of a coming disaster. I love it. Yeah, if Mothman is real, if there was a real cryptid creature, I don't believe for a second it's trying to warn people about anything. Like, what a shitty harbinger to do. Leave a fucking note already, you worthless moth creature. Stop attacking cars and scaring teenagers and just leave a note. Show up on the bridge. Wave, wave a note. Don't, it's going to crash now. I'm a, I'm a weird monster. You should listen to me. No, stop, stop, stop. Play a quick game of charade, something. It's the worst warning system in the history of disaster. A user Tanner Phoenix also brings up a great point, posting, wait, this thing showed itself to a woman and her baby. Follow people in their car. Peered in someone's front door window. But when the police arrive, this thing runs away. How does it know of the police? Exactly. It doesn't know how to warn us, uh, you know, but it does know what police are. A lot of logic holes, some of these sightings. User uh, Suhar Osman has a funny reply saying, I guess it had weed. Uh, couldn't take the risk. User Jack Pritchard posted a comment similar to so many others I saw in this long thread saying, a moth hit me when I was watching this. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> I want to make fun of this if I can see myself doing that same thing. Like, you know, just watching Mothman video after Mothman video alone at night. Videos with jump cuts and spooky and suspenseful soundtracks. Working yourself up and then suddenly a moth lands on you. I'd probably spook myself pretty good, too. I'd, uh, I, tried to, I tried to find some good wackadoodle video from someone who claims to have witnessed Mothman firsthand. And, uh... You know, there are all these, all these witnesses that seem to have one thing in common in addition to seeing Mothman. They have no idea how to record a decent video with solid audio. They, lo they love to record outside in the wind uh, or at the Mothman Festival with a classic rock band behind them, making it almost impossible to see, understand what they're saying. A good Mothman witness interview is almost as elusive as Mothman himself, or just painfully boring. But eventually, after a lot of digging, I found some clips from a destination, uh, destination America show called... Mountain moth monsters, yeah, mountain but monsters. I do have moth Whack creatures in my uh, in my mountain story. monsters is five of the most now, hillbilly looking. Where did Mothman touch you? Uh, going out in the woods looking for Bigfoot, uh, Mothman, other cryptoids. So I they are so deliciously can't wait to crazy. bring them in. There's Buck, Buck is, is an expert fun? caller who looks like Larry the Cable Guy's long lost little brother, a guy who'd like to get her done but has a has a hard time getting it started. 
Uh, there's Trapper John Tice, the team leader. Would you, who looks uh, like he, would you uh, ever do voice acting? He's not yeah, I mean, shot, yeah, I would. Once I get a warrior. decent microphone, Jeff, I think team I, researcher, I'd definitely like do Claus, some voice Santa acting. Left North Pole, I don't know what, uh, red and white what I could do, but I'd try. An abandoned Christmas to be a roadie for a I'd probably uh, lose the accent, then gain the accent, then lose the accent again mid-sentence, and then get it back. Ever. I How probably have to get an X acting trap coach your trap never to be sure. Looking for ever one time. Uh, he, he looks like an expert Mostly someone guy. to be like, like hey, go, uh, you, he you swapped red. out of that. And then there's my favorite. Now you get into that. The man who goes only by the name of Huckleberry. The radio is covering your like, voice like a bit, sort of so I say, uh, or Madonna. Uh, no, one uh, name uh, uh, He's head of team security. Uh, he in the woods after he escaped from a mental institution. <laughs> well, you are in luck. Claims to have been hypnotized All right. by a cryptid in the middle All of the night. All right, Keith, uh, Keystone. <laughs> there. The rest of the team decided to throw him in a river to All smack right. him out of it. So good. So good. Before we hear the clip, uh, let's let's listen to Huckleberry. I'm in Get luck. Feel for Huckleberry. I want you to listen to him uh, talking about a childhood encounter he supposedly had with Sasquatch. I'll tell you guys, it's bothered me for 46 years. It's hard to talk about. It is hard to talk Telling about. You guys, because we're friends, we're family, we've sweated together, we've bled together. Yeah. It's so dramatic. It started 46 years ago, 1969. Uh-huh. We have a garden back here on top of the hill. We drive out here a couple times a week, help Grandpa hoe, pick weed. Me and my brother, my mom, and my grandpa was back there. Back in the this garden. time we went back there on the hill of the garden, we are going to pick beans. Ah. We picked our bushel beans. I'm working on a show. Oh, the, only uh, the, the only difference, the only difference between a dream and reality is effort. Uh -huh. Fuck yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah, yeah bro. We nice. You're working on a show? And yeah. thank you so much for the follow. Keith Keystone. Thank you. You're working on a show? All of a sudden, something was taking these saplings like it was really pissed off oh, and it would just shit. beating these saplings back my before. goodness huh? you could see the tops of them just being fray laid well what's the show the by the way oh, hello goodness. mcchungus among us how are you Great big huge hand my show oh. but yes nice i'm up out of the top no. of them brush and oh. had a hold of this one tree right okay there. okay forearm on this thing was that big around Describe it twice as big as his arm. Uh, if this big, thing got a hold dude. of your head, there is no doubt in my mind it is in my mind. like a tomato. If it wanted to, I guess. Make Huckleberry it. doesn't impress easy. Uh -huh. For him to be impressed by this <laughs> Huckleberry do not yeah. impress easy. This thing must be massive. <laughs> it stepped up uh -huh. on this rock, and when it did, I got to see the shoulders. The shoulders was ever a bit this wide. Okay. We pounded feet out here. I mean, just as fast as we could run. Yep. There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever mm -hmm. that I seen a Bigfoot that day. My grandpa told me that we should never talk about it. Okay. <coughs> I wish to God I'd listen. Uh-oh. What happened? Help People have been just downright mean. I no. Mean, <laughs> it's, it's hard to talk about. Uh -huh. I've been ridiculed. What? Been thrown out of school. Thrown out of school? Damn. Some day people will laugh at you. This thing damn near ruined my life. Uh -huh. It ruined my brother. My, my brother will mm. not talk. But oh my god. About it's McChungus um, Among Us. <laughs> How shall we <laughs> learn <laughs> to live life. with the Maybe knowledge that Bigfoot might life. possibly be real? I mean, luckily, uh, I'm a now successful Mothman could be. hunter. Could be real. However, things could, could be, very could be credible. As My project is an original a story large, with themes about uh, evil and steampunk you know, vibes and a lot of crystal magic. Overall, what I can basically uh, tell you is it's a bunch of teenagers with godly weeks, weapons figuring out a lot of different forest, things and dealing with a lot more than uh, they should at their age. So and yes, there is a cursing. This is a PG-13 you know, uh, uh, to MA kind of series. And yes, there is romance and there is no pay for right now. Okay. Well, come back to me when you have a script. No one has ever been told I am school. not saying no. I would love to hear it, and I would love to Dan see what I would even... I don't even know well, what you would want me for. Talking about Bigfoot. That's why. 
That's why I tell you. Not I would love to. Uh, that it sounds well, like a great like said, pitch. Hey guys, I've seen no Bigfoot, and I've never. But to I would love to see the script uh, before agreeing to anything. Why are you so worried about? You know, just a few things of the script. Like you're just like a, a small <laughs> excerpt. If you have the script, just like light to see if I am worth the time. I'm still working on it. Okay. Well, keep me in mind. I will be here. I will keep doing my thing and streaming. So no pressure. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And if you're working on it, hell yeah. I would love to even see it. That sounds really cool. Radical, man. How long have you been working on it? Make your uh, make your dreams come true, man. I'm making my dreams come true. I'm making this fucking neck work. And an angle that actually fucking looks like a fucking neck. I'm just... Yeah, three years now. Shit, yeah, man. Heard some big things moving in the woods up here uh, before. Maybe it was just a bear or something. Nope. I think it was Bigfoot. McChungusmogus uh, don't... You don't know what, it, what it's been like being ridiculed. Of him getting tossed in the river. So I, was I can't get believe the river, they ridiculed the me. And then I realized, I'm like, well, that's not even a Mothman video. Because there's so many things that are titled Mothman. And there's, I thought maybe the Cherokee Devil was a title Mothman. No, this, sorry, set up the wrong thing. This video, these guys are just shining flashlights this time around out into the woods and hoping to attract Mothman. Hoping to hoping that their random flash, flashlights will see Mothman. What's that? What was that? Guys, if you believe in Mothman, good for you, bro. It's okay, go. We believe. <laughs> no, uh, it was a big gay uh, dragonborn. Oh, man, he's a big gay dragonborn. Oh, he's so cute. He's, he's so big and gay and cute. <laughs> He's a big gay dragon born. Guys, I don't know why you would put that in the description of me. But, but you're big and you're gay and you're a dragon born. You could just call me big and a dragon born. They think they see it, they don't see it again. I watched this video so much. No, but we gotta add the gay part. It's either they need to know. Or it's either two flashlights next to you, or it's just a car's headlight in the distance. They're like very parallel. It's just, but it's they need like to a, know. Uh, like Honey, you light. should accept yourself. There's, there's no it's, red. It's not a descriptor. And, and then in the comments underneath, uh, user uh, Kirigaya brings up an important question when it comes to hunting mice. <laughs> Actually, like, why don't they use night vision? Uh, yeah. There's cameras around the woods in the middle of the night, but they don't have night vision goggles. And then Froggo Logo says something along the lines of what I'd say. He goes, because if, if they did, you would see a truck. Exactly. Exactly. If Mothman's real, uh, I guess he's smart enough to make sure those idiots never find him. Oh, man. An elf and pansexual? Right, My goodness. Set up the wrong video there. Man, that other one was, was, uh, was funny to me. But then I was like, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with Mothman. It is very hard to find just decent stuff about Mothman. On the web, it's just, it's just the same. It's kind of totally like fine. Photoshop stuff. Uh, we're we're all accepting here. Audio quality. Okay, so let's, we're let's we're all I accepting here. I I, 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 haven't, I haven't. I haven't. I I think everybody bird. here is pretty lot, accepting you know, of bird. everybody else, owl, except big owl. except Bigfoot uh, enthusiasts. I think we're all pretty accepting. In December of 1966, a big ass owl, a barn owl, was killed just outside outside of Point Pleasant. Did make the local papers. I think we're all accepting. It did have a I don't know, but we go However, uh, to do something. So Wait, never mind. A two foot tall <laughs> and non binary. Is a uh, barn owl. So is my show. Okay. Have bodies more than 15 Fair in enough. And, uh, and they weigh Fair enough. generally less than two pounds. What? Shadow like, Stream supporty. Uh, two pounds is actually a very big barn owl. What? It's a rate of five. 
Hey, Hot damn, let's go. I mean, okay. Let's sure. go. Yeah, I mean, I guess it could be. Let's go. Oh, it's a raid. Hey, 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 I should really stop doing that voice. It's very annoying. How could anybody enjoy it? Come on. Hey, Luigi, what are you with the landing? Mass Bandit 236? Oh my gosh. A Mass Bandit arrives. I'm doing wonderful. Oh, let's go, Mamma Mia. Uh... I've never actually watched Mamma Mia. Oh my god, the uh, pizza <laughs> It's Tasty Pizza and Pasta. Oh my god. You know, Mothman could be Thunderbird in the sense that Mothman could be a fucking, you know, unicorn, leprechaun, or anything else that we don't know exists. We're just listening to a podcast about Mothman and how fucking crazy people are. The chemicals stored up in that TNT Also love Mothman, but... Not real. Uh, if you listen to the Chernobyl Shadow stream stuff, supporters you know, raid. The stream is around that nuclear meltdown site. Uh, uh, we're actually a Discord community a raiding our members usually, uh, but right mind, now we are looking for some chill people like you. Snakes, okay. Cool at all. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I do appreciate it. Thank you for the raid. Thank you for uh, checking me out. I'm not sure how uh, how chill I am. Even possible. Pretty sure I'm just me. Have you found that Mothman's an angel? Uh, I guess. We Actually, it's kind of warm in my room. Uh, some think it's a demon. So, I don't know how chill I am. I have the fan going. Didn't hurt anybody. So, like a strange, yeah. Unidentified flying machine? Could be chill. Like some kind of, uh, uh, it could you know, be colder. Government flying machine? That, that to me is the dumbest theory, probably. Like a um, suit back in I am off tomorrow, of so... Yeah, I got a little bit more steam, so uh, in the trunk. Exponential rate ever since then. Is that, what it, uh, is that a saying? Uh, I, I don't think that's a saying. I think I'm crazy in that uh, that regard. That Mothman, that's not a that's saying. A feral Polish person living in West Virginia uh, wilderness there. I, I, I know and I behaving that today. <laughs> like Chuck and Smokers, you don't have to behave. You can just be yourself. And thank you guys for the raid. I do appreciate it. What you guys? What were you guys playing anyway? Uh, because they've lived on sausages and sauerkraut and stuff like what that for so many what years. What were you guys doing? What was Shadow? Uh, what was Shadow Stream support he uh, so, you know, doing? Uh, what some Polish dude living out there in the TNT beforehand? Area, nothing but chemicals, whatever birds and owls and rats and feces he could get a hold of for years. What were they I doing? Mean, possible. I would. I would maybe. Even what were they doing? Probably. You know, Point Pleasant had a large influence. I've sent you stuff. an invite over in Whispers if you want to check it out later. Okay. Uh, they couldn't figure right, out how to do thank basic you. jobs like thank you. whiskey at bars without throwing people's faces and Let's see. Them. What were you, you know, guys up to? Uh, they couldn't figure out how to not grunt, and they just kept doing typical Polish stuff that infuriated other locals, like fucking them in the middle street or, you know, uh, shitting in the aisles of various businesses. Yeah. Just, eating just pets, the whole thing about kids on Halloween uh, supporting each other. Okay. Up, not look like monsters right. like one day. We're usually fire, using our Twitch stuff. channels for so events and uh, things like that. Oh, that's nice. Woods, where they I don't know what event you're and, uh, uh, doing, but hey, and, and heck yeah. Have sex with family, you know, for, for uh, you know, over 100 years before the Mothman legend showed up. So what kind of creature? Does Thank you for uh, no, coming into my fun. stream. So uh, I'm just working on my comic right now. I'm working. I'm working on page two right now. I'm just doing the line work. Jesus Christ! As of right now. Who knows what Mothman is, man? It's an interesting tale, if nothing else. I, I like and I gotta uh, fix this nose. God if damn it. it. I will say it's one that numerous people from different Come on. Different towns in the same Give me that good nose. Today, based on the We're having fun uh, around most times. Nice. What if just, you know, this one That's good. people did see, like, let's say a bird and work themselves up. That's those four people. Yeah. Those, those two young couples. What is Twitch if it isn't about having a lot, lots and lots of fun and enjoying the people you're around? And then it just took on this life of its own. Hysteria took over, and people started seeing what they wanted to see. Uh, you know, that, that, that to me is very possible. Um, I don't think it's a harbinger of doom, right? It was really bad at sending a, sending a warning. If that if that's what it was. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, maybe there really was some fucking humanoid. Who knows? 
It might be a sad story if that's true. What if there was some creature from another planet, another galaxy or dimension out there alone, stranded? Right? Well, what was it doing out there? How did it get there? What did it think of those who, who it saw? You know? Uh, where is it now? Can you imagine if you ended up stranded, like, in another realm or some other world somehow? Creatures just as strange to you as, as, as you are to them, trying to get a good look at you, trying to make contact with you, capture you, maybe hurt, you know, or, or kill you. That's terrible. You know, if that's the truth, it seems that Mothman did what I don't think I'd be able to do on some other world, you know? God damn. If he was a traveler from another land, I hope he made it back home. Go, to the I got distracted uh, uh, from my cleaning and did art and listening to you instead. Much better time. Yay! We believe those who may have I have succeeded in making uh, Haven like happy. Goddamn, Mr. Anderson. Goddamn. Most important point, I'll give one new piece of new information right now with today's Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Number one, while later supposed sightings have come in from supposed Mothman, Mr. Right Anderson, I to a winged monster in the sky above us for a solid minute with the four men I was working mm. outdoors with at the time, Duncan. Uh, the legend really got going on November 16th, 1966, when an article was printed in the local paper about two young Point Pleasant couples claiming to see Mothman the night before. I, I know that's not how he sounds. I just. Town. I I just think it would be very funny if he didn't have an impressive voice and wasn't also the leader of the elves. Winged avian humanoid. His coloration varies from black to gray to even brown or white. The harbingers of dooms are a dime a dozen these days. With a wingspan of about ten feet, plus the ability to fly over hundred miles an hour. Sometimes he's described as not having a head with two huge red eyes set in his chest. These eyes are reported to be glowing or at least reflective. Next to the wings, the he's got reflective the nipples. Uh, red eyes. That's what I'm thinking. The creature's most consistently uh, described physical feature. Number three, the vast majority of Mothman sightings occurred between mid-November 1966 and December 15, 1967, when the Silver Bridge that rose above the Ohio River and connected Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and Galapolis, Ohio, collapsed and took the lives of 46 people. Ever since, many Mothman believers believe that Mothman tried to warn people about that collapse. Number four, I believe in the possibility of Mothman being real more than I believe in the collective credibility of the entire cast of Destination America's Mountain Monsters. Unless your last name is Finn, I think it's super weird to go by the name of Huckleberry. Number five, new info. Seems that if Mothman is indeed real, he may have moved to Chicago recently. There were 55 reported Chicago area sightings of a flying humanoid. In just 2017 alone. Accounts have varied regarding what this creature looked like, ranging from a large, black, bat-like being with glowing red eyes to a big owl or something that resembled a gothic gargoyle or a mothman. Most eyewitnesses spotted the being in flight, but some particularly disturbing reports mm. detailed it dropping onto hoods of cars. Just saying, it'd be nice to outside. go a week without being doomed in some way or another. Uh, I know that when you play uh, Swindle Stones and uh, Sorcery, uh, the old man keeps saying fucking doomed every time you, uh, every time you uh, see it. I saw a plane flying, but also something moving really un moving awkwardly under it. It didn't look like a bat so much as what uh, illustrations of pterodactyls look like, with the slenderness of its head and its wing shape. I know what birds and what bats look like. This thing didn't have any feathers or fur, and it didn't fly like anything I've ever seen. And hmm. Toronto added that the thing he saw, which according to him had muscular legs, a jutting tailbone, and a human-like shape, flew in a strange swooping motion. Doomed. Every time you uh, play him, uh, he'll say doomed. I remember thinking, this thank you guys so much for the raid, and thank you guys so much for the uh, wonderful time. I do appreciate you guys. I really do. I, I do want to say that. I know that I say that all the time, but I mean it. I mean it every single time. A wizard did it. This sucks.
But I mean, I like the sorcery uh, so far. Uh, I'm on episode two uh, of it, and uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's stream worthy. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's stream worthy, because uh, for a game like that, I'm always trying to get uh, the best outcome. And that also means, like, I'm like, yeah, that choice shit, uh, was shitty. So I'll, uh, I'll just redo it. Oh, that choice was shitty, I'll do it again. Just saying it'd be nice to go without a week. Uh, was it did it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I read those messages. I was worried. I was like, what? What? Did I not read a message? Exactly. I love Thanksgiving. Me too. I don't, I don't care about anything except for the food. I know it is the best. It is the best comfort food. It is. It's so good. My perfect combination is turkey, mm -hmm. a little bit of stuffing, a little bit of cranberry, and a little bit of sweet potato, like all in one bite. Because as you know, I have to eat every bite like it's my last, mm -hmm. and I need the proportions to be just right. Ah, I like turkey with a little bit of gravy on it, mashed potatoes, gravy on it, uh, green oh, shit. Sauce, guys and uh, sweet potato casserole. Guys, with what? On top. That's my perfect plate, and I don't mix them. The mm. question other, other is: turkey and potatoes. I'll mix those together. Are this you guys I'm ready for Turkey Day? Are you guys ready for a little bit of Turkey Day? Are you ready for a nom nom eaty day? They're so trashy. Like, oh God, I'm getting hungry. No. potatoes. I gotta save my stomach stomach for Turkey Day. Potato chips on top. Hmm. They okay. are delicious. Okay. They sound delicious. Yep. So that's what I'm into. <laughs> Is uh, Castor considered a uh, derogatory term? Kind of I, was, I was thinking of more of those peripheral <laughs> relatives that uh, you know, sometimes you see them once a year. Oh, my and God. Yep. Uh, depends on uh, what you mean by uh, Caster. a lot to be thankful for. We are very thankful that you keep listening to the show. Completely. Magic production shows. Mm -hmm. A, uh, a while to our turkey day. Yes. Uh, we get Talk two turkey days. Hoodie, featuring what I can uh, best describe as a, uh, a broken soul. Oh. Actually, if you want to be technical, oh. we could make. Um, but not, not this one. But not this one. Uh, it's just a fun design for. Uh, what is it? Uh, and uh, the Bad Magic Productions Charity Month still on ABA, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Jesus Day. It's not Jesus Day. Uh, it's Jesus' birthday. What is it? So proud to it's uh, help Easter. Who help so many. That's amazing. Easter mm -hmm. Day. Uh, a, a lot of times my parents would uh, cook uh, like turkey quick, uh, on Easter Day. I do, I do. And as you guys know, we were But it was mostly like store bought so turkey. It wasn't like a big old tur turkey feast. It was just like uh, something like that, that will no longer be true. And, by the and then the sometimes we would have uh, turkey bacon uh, your name uh, for uh, what is it? Uh, what is that day? Uh, Mardi Gras. So like uh, Ash Wednesday, we would have uh, we would have a lovely little uh, pancake from last year. Uh, dinner, we have so far received which was very delicious, dollars worth of additional donations or something. Fans. That's amazing. It is amazing because it's like a fifteen dollars donation here, a twenty five dollar yep. donation here, and then there are some people who are fortunate enough. We had a couple five hundred dollar donations and a couple two hundred and fifty dollar donations. And several one hundred dollar donations, which is a hundred bucks, is like nothing to scoff at. And are donations still being accepted? Nope. No. Okay, no. So no. Because okay. we have to start shopping. Got and it. and the reason that we, by the time you hear this, the reason that we're not accepting donations anymore is because, as a company, we are not a nonprofit, so I cannot accept your money. I, that's, gotcha. We're not paying you for a service. We're not hiring you for a service. There cannot be an exchange. Gift cards are a different story. It's like a way to kind of sneak around it. Yeah. Because then we use those to buy the things so by the time you're hearing this we're already shopping and we need Got to know it. how much money we have to have decided how many families we can help so unfortunately no more yeah okay all right um but i, I guess if you're listening to this and you're desperate to help uh and you have a, a, an amount of money that you feel like you could shop for a family of a couple kids i could definitely go through the emails and somebody who wasn't able to get on the list of people that were chosen whose name didn't get drawn out of the hat uh, if you feel like you want to shop for a family, I'm sure we could figure that out. And where would they send that email? Fat Tuesday. Uh, you would yeah, Fat, Fat Tuesday. Oh, man. Oh, I love Fat Tuesday. It's my favorite. Oh, man. Like I have so many like fun holidays that okay. I just love to just gorge. 
uh how many stories do you have today because well, i don't you gorge know, you I usually have, i just I eat a very long time one but like on holidays you just oh, gorge cool. yeah it's been a while since mm -hmm. we've done that and shake it up shake it up uh, i have my normal two do you want to give any information about yours well, preview my, or, or yeah, mine's, about a, mine's about a lifelong haunting lifelong haunting okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think it's it has like a lot of like ups and downs and uh, it's a it's a really great tale every day is i knew it uh, I, I knew two. someone was um, gonna make that I, joke the first story is really oh uh, no along the same thing. okay I was like, right when it left my mouth, I was like, oh, god damn it. Oh, damn it. I looked at a haunted painting. You know, they've come up in like in a few stories where people get spooked by a painting. We don't put ourselves down. We only put ourselves up. But we haven't had like, um, you know, in the stories we've had, it's like, is the uh, haunted, is the painting haunted or is the home haunted? And the painting is in the home. This is a collection of, know. you know, paintings that move from... I mean, I could talk about uh, what videos I watched stuff. today, so this is a, a which wasn't many. Sure, uh, okay, yeah, and that's viable. I mean... Yeah, and the, and the next story... Remember uh, to say, go, yes, uh, uh, it's not a joke, it's Carolina's the truth. <laughs> <lights. laughs> <laughs> God damn it! Ball no! Lights, some other no! No! Or no. else okay. So we have a, a variety of mysteries to explore today. <laughs> uh, yeah, it sounds like a fun episode. Yeah. yeah. You're terrible, Ava. You're terrible. I'm terrible. Out of my socks, and I'm just going to say. You can't keep getting away with this. My journey, my hip is giving me a lot of trouble today. So if I randomly and She can't keep up, getting away with like this. I'm sitting and it's just been catching, and all of a sudden it's like that horrible feeling of like, if I don't move, I'm going to like spontaneously combust. <laughs> my son please stand up i'm sorry um look at these like sort of like retro these guys <laughs> those are fun they're like uh 70s style yeah, i bought them for myself nice very nice all right let's do it dan okay a little bit of setup but not much on this first story uh, and again we've talked about uh you know various haunted objects here on scared to death before haunted dolls the uh, it's mirror, your favorite haven hey, object like a ouija board that serves as a, a portal to some realm different than ours but uh, to my knowledge as we just talked about we've never talked about Haunting, haunted paintings, not like this. Uh, again, we've covered some paintings that, you know, hung in homes that their subjects used to live in that have definitely seemed to watch people or move even. But in, uh, you know, these cases, is the painting itself haunted or the location where the painting happens to be haunted? Today, we talked about works of art going from house to house, bringing some sort of curse or maybe dark paranormal energy of some Spooked. other kind with them. Yes. Time now for the tale of From Out of the Painting It Crawls. Ugh. Let's begin with a very well-known artist, but not a very well-known work. Uh, you're probably familiar with late 19th and early 20th century Norwegian artist Edvard Munch and his famous painting, The Scream. Yep. An abstract painting of a man with his mouth open, now considered a masterpiece. Even if you don't know it by name, you probably know it by sight. We'll throw up a pic at the end of the story. I know uh, The Scream. Like always also appear in the Scared to Death Facebook and Instagram feeds. Uh, we'll also throw in a picture of the dead mother. What's the fiercest weapon you uh, maybe haunted? You all have the ever wielded. Um, my tongue. Tragedy. The tragedy. My silver tongue. Works. He was a young boy. Most of much I'm just going to say hello and uh, to you. So hello. All right, bad. Thank you for the hello. Came as divine punishments for their sins. Hmm. Fathers. Doom and gloom, religious actually the fiercest weapon I've ever uh, held. Uh, my uh, bow and arrow is pretty fierce. Once wrote, my father was temperamentally nervous and obsessively religious to the point of psychoneurosis. From him, I inherited the seeds of madness. The angels of fear, sorrow, and death stood by my side since the day I was born. So clearly this affected him. Uh, the dead mother seems to echo a lot of that angst, despair, and insanity that Munch felt. It depicts a young girl with her back turned to a bed on which her dead mother lies as she holds her hands to her ears and displays a wide-eyed expression of disbelief. And some people think that this painting is somehow alive. Several previous owners claim that the girl's eyes have incessantly followed them, and not in a way that a lot of paintings seem to do. With this painting, some people have claimed to truly have watched its figures move. They say that they've witnessed the sheets on the mother's bed move and rustle. And that the girl's apparition has occasionally Aww, all together. Be great. How That's very sense. easy Imagine to do when I've got wonderful followers wall, like you. Bed, you look over Bowed, you're now awesome. Now Thank you for being awesome. I know that you that it's easy for you. Be if the mother left with her. 
I know it's very easy for you to be awesome. One of mallets, one of wait until mother finds you. So, thank you for being incredible. Kunstala, Bremen, Bremen, Germany. I thank you for users like you every day. Wandering off into anyone's home. You guys make my day better and better. A haunted painting of perhaps a haunted photo. One woman who goes by the name of Laura P for anonymity claims to have experienced more than just strange sightings. An allegedly accomplished painter, Laura wrote that she's sold many of her work to individuals and businesses all around the U.S. Chat. First off, photo, all answers are like welcome. Photographer, yes. Commercial photographer James Kidd on display. Yes. In Arizona, Give us your answers. What is the fiercest weapon you've right. ever held? The photo is of an old stagecoach stop. And wielded is what uh wagon in the i would say held is fine it had this picture developed yes he revealed something he did not expect I love your face Standing on a log thank the left you of the wagon is a figure he says was not there when he took the picture and seeing it i would say thank he, you so uh, much thank you so much for to playing my game man, his boots pants and coat dangling down thank you so much for to playing my game james kidd maintained that the photo had been examined no, go by, suck it. Has been examined by kodak and other experts my katana and, uh, sword he did not doctor it in any way laura asked him if she could do an oil painting of this photo my katana sword home in sierra vista Gah. arizona down by the US you're Mexico too border. slow i went into the sonic voice immediately photo, when i'm thinking of like a ultra nerd i'm thinking of warning. sonic voice uh, you're you're her, too slow really paint this what was so compelling about it should she finish it should she not finish it she brushed off this feeling thinking it was normal to have artistic doubts she told herself she needed to push through yeah. and complete it but then when she did complete it strange things began to happen around her home Things centered around this painting. They started small. She took the frame painting with some others to display at a local gallery. gallery. Three days later, an employee from this gallery's office called her and asked her to pick this painting up. Not the others, just the painting of the headless man. They wanted it out of the gallery. It was freaking the staff out. Every morning they claimed the painting would be found hung crooked. They would straighten it. The next morning it would be crooked all over again. And they just didn't like the way the painting was making them feel. And there have been a number of stranger occurrences uh, at the gallery recently. Papers going missing. A suddenly odd amount of accidents. Things being dropped. Appointments not showing up. Everything Does it have a name? The painting was hung, <laughs> and they wondered if the painting was somehow to blame. Thinking they were overreacting, Laura took her painting back, and then she'd soon come to regret it. Soon after the painting returned to her home, she began to hear strange bumps in the night. Does it? Like Haven. Rattling around, Does it have a name? Saw anything move. Well, what's the, we the, what's the fiercest weapon in your arsenal? Lord and her husband moved to a brand new home my, my, uh, my bow doesn't have a name, though. I'm not going to name my bow right now like there's no need to name it time, and even uh didn't really it needs like to it actually like uh when i think of a place. weapon i it's always think like found the, the actions the name it, it rained, more than anything else to come in and take a look but although the roofers came three times to repair it they never found the source of the leak the painting was hanging on the wall between the living room and the garage, right where the leak was. Like they the actions the of the, the uh, of like what you shoot Another with evening, it, and like what you you wield it with. An island before going to the door, calling her husband for dinner, letting him know the dinner was ready. When she got back to the bar, yeah, the salt I spilled all over it, and all I the want the, the, salt the weapon to give upright, itself a name, down. kind of thing. Another of like it, gate, it has to have like a thing. No apparent reason. All the hardware was completely intact. Like with fantasy time, stories, though, it's very easy to, to come up with a name night, of like a weapon. To the garage to rest. Laura's husband went inside to mix some drinks, returning like, to drink and oh, glasses with ice. This, uh, drink, I fought these another, monsters, now I call it this. Empty glasses. Laura then took one or two sips from her second drink when she looked down to see a large chunk of glass had been broken off from the top. The glass had been whole when she'd started to take her drink, at least she thought. Right away, she thought her husband maybe knocked it over or something, but he swore he didn't. They looked all over the floor of the wet bar for the piece of glass. They couldn't find anything, couldn't see anything on the floor in any part of the house. She poured the rest of the drink through a strainer to see if the chunk of glass had fallen in, but there was nothing. The missing piece was too large to swallow without her noticing it, so where did it go? They never found it. The painting hung directly over where Laura's husband apparently poured the drink. Maybe just a broken glass. Nothing more than that, but that's not what Laura believes. And then there's what her neighbor saw. A neighbor wanted to show his mother-in-law photos of Laura's paintings, took them home with him, 
He left the pictures laying on the table, started playing a three-handed card game, which a dummy hand must be dealt, like a game by himself. When he picked up the dummy hand, every card of the dummy hand was in one suit, and sequential, all hearts. Odd, but alone, maybe not that big of a deal. He dealt again, the dummy uh, three-card hand again, all sequential hearts. And then again, and again, and again. Now he started feeling spooked. Then he saw the hazy white figure of a person seemingly get up from a chair at the table he sat at and leave the room. He swears to this day that this figure had no head. He immediately returned the photos and said he never wanted to touch them again. Was he unknowingly playing a card game with a dead man? Laura claims that she still has this painting hanging in her house. Why? She just can't seem to part with it. She's claimed that recently some people have asked to buy it, but she won't sell it. She says she's afraid that someone else might have worse experiences with it than she's had. Is that really enjoy why she won't your let lurk. go of it? Or Thank it you. Kind of over her? All right, I'll be uh, idle now and uh, be active once thing. again in a few hours. So have a wonderful art chat. Thank you. Photos. He had no uh, idea that he was General, unleashing. I'll miss you. When the photo was taken, I'll miss you and your Mercs. Your wonderful Mercs. Please. And the family was staying at his grandmother's One day he will be back. Money. He will be back to murp at the crowds. He shall murp at all of them. All of them shall be murped at. It will be a wonderful sight. My greatest weapon is my mind. But for physical weapons, mine would be a set of black steel blades, double-edged, uh, symmetrical. They sing while iron, uh, called the hands resist him. Uh, like iron a somber pie, uh, pinions uh, in the wind. Oh, cool. Standing outside Sweet. Door, the girl looking like an Sweet. Or a child I ball. thought you were about to or say nunchucks, uh, which uh, I watched the, the argument video the on uh, nunchucks, and, now, since and uh, uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, three the argument with that nunchucks died. are a shitty so, so, uh, weapon, and they do suck. Bill sold uh, the painting in 1974. Uh, that you have to. to uh, famous for his role as the movie producer in The Godfather. The like, I think that nunchucks, if you're good with them, head in his bed. that's great. Uh, uh, you know what would be, would be, you would be better at using? Your fist. Um, I'm not going to lie. Who reviewed the I think that your fist would be way more effective than nunchucks ever will be. Again. Unbeknownst to him, it had been now, Michelangelo, now Michelangelo is a cartoon character, to an art space. and uh, the painting that's why he's so good at, with nunchucks. A terrifying description. When in real life we received this painting we thought it was really good art that shit is dangerous at the time we wondered a little why a seemingly perfectly fine painting would be discarded like that today we don't one morning our four and a half year old daughter claimed that the children in the picture were fighting and coming into the room uh, i don't know if you guys watch the uh, argument video of uh two huge weapon nerds arguing over uh over Numbchucks. Room. <gasps> oh. When he screamed, the boy thankfully disappeared. Which uh, I was very, uh, I enjoyed. Was viewed more than 30, times. But I am also a huge nerd, so nunchucks are inherently unpredictable. Uh, we're not all Bruce Lee. In fact, I would say Bruce Lee shouldn't have used them. That he became ill while viewing I would say he was actually at a disadvantage. Another reported hey, that something was taking control of him. After all that, I would say uh, Numchuck's art gallery may have put him at a disadvantage. It may Smith. When Kim uh, and could have killed him, him gotten him uh, killed in, her home. Her in that scene. Filled with prayers, quotes from scriptures, even advice on how to cleanse her residents of this evil thing from a shaman in Mississippi. Today, the painting sits in storage in Smith's gallery. And to this day, Bill Stoneham still receives a handful of messages each week from people terrified by the haunted eBay painting. Current owner, Kim Smith, still seems to be alive and well. Hopefully that continues to be the case. One, the Anguished Man. Ooh. The Anguished Man is a painting created by an unknown artist owned by Sean Robinson currently, who lives somewhere in England. According to Robinson, who claims to have inherited the painting from his grandmother, the artist who created the painting allegedly mixed his own blood into the paint Ew. and then died of suicide soon after finishing the work. 
Several paranormal TV series and investigation teams have studied this mysterious painting. <clears throat> it's been mentioned as one of the top five haunted items hug, in the world. Hug, 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 hug. More well-known items such as the Annabelle doll or Robert the doll. Uh, Robinson has been reported. Uh, Robinson has reported, excuse me, that he put the painting in his basement as soon as he got it. And almost immediately afterwards, various members of his family started waking up to the sight of the dark figure of a man standing at the foot of their beds. They also began hearing noises, specifically crying and moaning. They soon set up a camera in the basement to see what was going on with the painting, and the family recorded over three nights between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. The microphone they used picked up the sounds of crying and moaning each night. Also at approximately 3.25, uh, one night the painting suddenly fell over, and then just above it, they saw a small orb. There were no drafts in the room, nothing that would make the painting tip over by itself. The Robinson family was convinced the painting was haunted or cursed. Or mm. Not long after hanging the painting in the basement, the Robinson family also began to report witnessing a strange mist appear at the top of the basement stairs. So did they get rid of it? No. It allegedly remains hanging in their basement. Why Sean Robinson says he's committed to holding on to the painting until he figures out exactly what's going on. Is he another Darren? Has the dark man seen at the foot of those beds taken possession of him? Is it possible that this painting and others are all just examples of art doing the, the very thing they're supposed to do, fueling our imaginations? Perhaps. Or perhaps when they were being created, something other than paint was placed upon them, inside of them. Something else adhered itself to the canvas and is still stuck there now. Uh, what do you know about the paintings in your home? Could something be stuck inside any of them as well? And what will happen to you if it ever seeps out? Oh no, a panda bear could come out of our painting. <laughs> True, that one, or a little girl with a machine gun. I know, Little Red Riding Hood. She's got it. She's out for us. Oh no, <laughs> very ancient. It's panda. unlikely oh, he used them in an actual match. Oh, yeah, Bruce nice uh, was yeah. smarter than yeah. that. Yeah. Also, well, go. Uh, like may you talk? Uh, call win win. Uh, <laughs> you. Well, I mean, yeah. probably. Uh, yeah, that's all. Like, uh, probably sometime this really week. Really uh, mm-hmm. Probably after the, uh, Thanksgiving would be nice. We Darren. could oh, we could Linda? have a Laura? chat. Laura. Laura. Oh, yes, Laura. yes. And then uh, Sean. Come on. Laura won't get rid of it. Oh yeah, it was the I would not mind that. One you're thinking of? Yeah, there was the Bill Stoneham one. It was the third one. I yes. would not yeah. mind that. Yeah. At um, all. I want Laura to get rid of it. But yes, everything's been going well over here. Away. She doesn't understand why she's been so away. nice. Mm-hmm. Which is all the more reason to get I rid of it. I almost said it twice. I got raided, like, uh, which was nice. Really good. Uh, this first I got raided. Uh, uh, an most everybody has come over, photo. said hey, are and uh, you know. Oh, okay. It's and a, I totally understand if they if they need to go to bed. I understand that. That would be Van Gogh. Oh, Van Gogh. Sorry. That's I had a nice set of yeah, yeah, yeah. ball yeah, bearings and all. Uh, when I used I them, I missed the oh, old so training set. Uh, I was just two sorry. sticks and uh, right I know, some rope. I know, I know. Yeah. No. Like it's fucking. It's okay. Nunchucks are fucking dangerous. True. Uh, from the argument I heard, uh, from a weapons expert, I would call him a weapons expert. Uh, he's also a medieval fantasy uh, expert as well. But from what I have heard, uh, nunchucks are not only impractical, they're dangerous to use. And that anybody uses them uh, as a practical weapon instead of picking, you know, actually good weapons. Uh, You're probably uh, better off uh, not doing that. This next one, now this is that painting of the 1994 James Kidd photo, supposedly done by Laura, this anonymous painter. But uh, that's a choice. Everybody makes so decisions in life. As we're looking there, the left oh, of the wagon, yeah. you can see that person's uh, head. No head. And you also, kind of like, see him, quite frankly. Yeah, you have to really the argument yeah, that yeah, was given to be like, yeah, it you know, right it, right you can use okay. uh, nunchucks safely. This next guy, Bill Stone, uh, from what I, I saw really from it, he almost me. hits itself it's, uh, multiple know, fucking times when he's showing this reaction. And he's barely touching the the training dummy. You know, and, and then the, the now, reaction that video one, uh, that the uh, weapons guy does, uh, Shadowversity is his name. Uh, he's literally like, okay, one, uh, here's a nunchuck. I have a pair of my own. I literally have a pair of my own. And he shows like, yeah, hit, hit, hit. The training dummy is barely moving. And then he's like, all right, here's a fucking stick. 
a fucking big stick that I found, and he beats the shit out of a fucking uh, training dummy, and he's like, see, a regular fucking club, a stick, does more damage than that. And then he's like, okay, let me show you, uh, he gets his friend, who's a, a regular MMA fighter, he's like, okay, now let him show you what happens. He uses the nunchuck. The nunchuck like, uh, red, at full force bops the uh, the training dummy and, and slams back into the guy's and arm kind of red, and literally like hurts red, him while they're wearing uh, training gear. Out of the fire, it's, it's a fireplace? And he's like, okay, it's like covered just use your like, fucking like hand. Brush brush. And he uh, uses his hand, like and the training gum, dummy the goes down, and he's guy. not hurt at all. Oh, interesting. No, that's supposed to be like the mantle around the fireplace. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, and then this, everything this is, is more practical. Your man. fists are unknown, more practical than, uh, than nunchucks. Mm. And never use nunchucks. Yeah, yeah, it just, it's really, a that's little, really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, surrealistic. Uh, I've seen that. I've, I've come across that mm. picture before online. I just didn't know what it was. It looks very primitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I don't very, like it. very interesting work. That one, that one freaks me out the most. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, and that's Ooh, the, that's the like most that. famous as far as famous for being haunted. Ah. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> so again, you can just go to our Instagram or Facebook if you uh, you know are listening and want to be able to like follow along with uh, what we're talking about, want to see it. But or don't. yes, or those, don't. those are creepy. Mm -hmm. No thanks. I like a creepy painting. <laughs> I, well, I got you one, a creepy drawing. You still never even framed it. Just hang out in the studio. Uh, which one is that? It's it's you like get so many things. Well, I got it for you, so it's not like a fan sent it in. Uh, it's like the the woman coming over the top of the bed. Ah, uh, yes, I haven't seen that one in a while. We have so many things here. Mm, um, uh, now you have to point that out to me after the show. I, I need to see it again. I gave it to you. You opened it, and then you just set it aside. We have to... <laughs> oh, man, sorry. Uh, when did, where did you get it? Um, a fan of the show. I ordered it from her website. Okay, well, we got to get that. I know. We have, well, our house was redone and this, on and on, so many things. And we have, we ran out of wall space here. I know. I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, Dan would love this. I do. I do. I, I'm sure I did. I, I have to see it again now. <laughs> Sorry. I, it is, it is a feel, I, I feel like, Pedro Dick, we get so many amazing things sent constantly. Like, we kept, I, I do sometimes lose yeah, track of. Yeah, like, uh, the like, answer of, like. I know I have a, a thing from Logan to get from Bow Staff. I also need to hang. Two nunchucks. So pick no, uh, pick Bow uh, Staff. Are you ready to move on from supposedly haunted paintings? Now it's uh, my rock, head. I wish I could just stop two numchuck. So just to get that. Uh, pick I'll, oh, I'll, I'll check rock. It out. You'll march forward. Is the thing from uh, Logan the like, cypher thing? I, I literally I think a I water balloon would probably be better in a fight than a nunchuck. You, you have, but you forgot about it. I, I, I've shown it to you. Oh, because a water mm -hmm. balloon, well, you could that. fill that shit What's with piss. Wanted? Again, so many things. So many things. Bullets at, at uh, somebody. Uh, move on and, uh, and then move on really the mess them over. Sure. <laughs> That's a funny way to And then go in with yeah. your fist. Let's do it. A little bit of setup. Uh, again, not much on this one. The Brown Mountain Lights are a set of ghost lights seen a by a or a Jean. Brown Mountain, North Carolina. Let me look at these. Ghost lights, also called I, I am not. They are not coming to my mind. Yeah, it's the way the source uh, listed. I hadn't heard that um, before. Me either. Or Dow? ghost lights. Uh, or light or well. that appear without any known natural identifiable Ooh, so it's pretty. An orb of light. Yeah. It's curved blade. It's a very uh, pretty I, curved blade. I don't know any more than the information Jones? I'm giving you. I will yeah. stay on this story. John. Like Let's could see be. it. Yeah, just uh, Ooh, well, a. Ooh, a like straight sword. A Love it. Describing exactly what it is. It's okay. just like a. It's just like a light in the distance. It's a straight no, sword no, without no, a it's, big it's guard, okay. which is very. Uh, I'll go through a lot of sightings here. Like it, it comes uh, to a point, a very specific point, lights, which so a, a lot of European uh, blades uh, come to. But it also has uh, a few other things that make it independent, and it's also very short. It is at least the length of your arm. I love it. I think it's a really, really cool blade. There have been many false claims and sightings where a lot of those other blades can be way bigger. Unexplainable and mysterious incidents involving these lights. To this day, the Brown Mountain lights remain one of North Carolina's biggest mysteries. They've been covered numerous times by both the news and pop culture. The lights were even featured on an episode of X-Files, which uh, examined all different theories about what they could be. 
unless major advancements are made in science or paranormal investigations, we may never really know what these lights truly are. Time now for the tale of Brown Mountain's mysterious lights. In 1913, the first official reports of the lights were published in a local paper. This was around the same time that electricity became widespread in the area around Linville, North Carolina. So is that all it was? People seeing light bulbs in the distance for the first, first time? Doesn't seem so. Others have written about them, just not in the paper, for almost a century and a half already. Surveyors noted as early as 1770 some kind of luminous vapor in the area. And in 1771, some German scientists reported lights they described as nitrous vapors. Mm. On September 24th, 1913, <laughs> the Charlotte Daily Observer published an article titled Mysterious Lights Seen Just Above the Horizon Every Night. They report, uh, the report detailed red lights that appeared at 7.30 and 10 p.m. without fail every night. No one figured out what they were. In different reports from 1913 and since, uh, the lights have appeared as w uh, white, red, yellow, orange, blue, as large balls uh, of fire or small candle lights. It's just all different kinds of lights. I uh, would it ground, still argue that a sap is, ground, is more practical. Out. I'm uh, not saying it isn't. I'm um, saying, just, you know, straight out in the distance after the Charlotte Observer published their initial oh, I wasn't article, arguing Congressman E. Y. Webb. Or are you just saying I, I would love to pick up a Dower Jean, but a uh, staff is more practical than those weapons? The then I would Dean I Dean would have to Steric agree with you was dispatched to North Carolina on, on that first night. He determined that the headlights of local trains were visible from his hotel. Uh, Southern Railways had recently upgraded their headlamps to 600,000 candle power systems in 1909, which may have produced the floating lights people reported that year mm. and the years you know following. Uh, Linville residents accepted that the phenomenon was probably nothing more than train headlights until July of 1916. Flooding paused the train service to the mountain for several weeks, yet guests at Lovin's Hotel, they kept seeing the same lights every night. When skeptics contended that the lights must have been cars or campfires, locals were not sold. The sightings occurred in areas where there were no roads and where people were, it was highly unlikely that they were camping there. Mm -hmm. Now two senators requested that the U.S. Geological Survey send someone out again. 1922, the USGS sends George R. Mansfield, a Georgia scientist, to investigate these lights further. He uses a map and a telescope to view the lights with the Lovin family, since their hotel seemed to have the best lookout spot in the area and was where the majority of reported sightings occurred. He wrote that the lights seemed to move and flare in brightness. The lights were stationary throughout the night, as shown by repeated azimuth readings. However, when he plotted the approximate locations of the lights on a map, they matched the curve in the railway track, and the lights corresponded to the train schedule. So again, people think it's trains. Mansfield proves the lights were just trains, possibly brush fires, easing the public's concern about ghost lights, even though they've been witnessed when no trains had been running previously. Uh, for an alternative explanation, he proposed will-o'-wisps, or will-o'-the-wisps, an atmospheric ghost light seen by travelers at night, especially over bogs, swamps, or marshes, produced by uh, organic decay, described as bioluminescence produced by organic decay, like gases ah. going up into the air that have some kind of luminosity ah. to them. I was not familiar with this phenomenon before, but there is a natural phenomenon Stream, where you can see streamer fun, like a, like a firefly, slash like com, some kind of decay phenomenon. Slash CW. The Lovin family insisted that they still okay. saw true brown mountain lights that were Hello. not just bioluminescence. In the following years, local authors wrote more tales about the brown mountain lights. A 1936 article claimed the lights were the spirits of a woman and her baby once murdered on the mountain. Mm. 1938, the Asheville Citizen published an article claiming the lights had been witnessed for centuries before electricity, trains, cars, or any such thing. The story they published claimed that centuries earlier, a great battle was fought between the Cherokee and the Catawba peoples near Brown Mountain, and supposedly, according to local tribal legends, the lights were the spirits of maidens who used torches to search for their dead husbands following the battle. In the 1950s, when UFO fascination swept the nation, Ralph Lael through Brown Mountain into extraterrestrial lore. He self-published a novel about a trip he claimed to have taken with aliens. He claimed that in 1965, they kidnapped him on Brown Mountain and took him to their planet. Additional Brown Mountain sightings have been reported since June of 67. In 1961, I guess backing up a, a, a little bit here. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know why I put uh, 1967 there. <laughs> that might have been a, a, a previous Meow. example that I chose not to include there. So forget 1967. We're going to back up to 1965-1961 when Josiah Lafayette, known as Fate, Fate Wiseman, became the owner of 
uh, wide mm. view. It may be pronounced locally as with streamer fun uh, slash com uh, slash CW. Nineteen sixty one, a relative Scotty Wiseman. If wrote you're a there, a song about the life called Brown Mountain Lights. Please, their ancestor Josiah. Please do contact me. From report of the Brown Mountain Lights in eighteen ninety four. He was camping because if you're not, you might be a bot. Flash appeared at the same place and with a half hour of the same time every night. We're not a uh, we're not big fans of bots. Now Brown Mountain became part of the Pisgah National Forest. Visitors mm. uh, began to come to see the lights from the Blue Ridge Parkway overlook. The best time to see them historically has been in the early evening when there's a dramatic temperature change and before or after a storm. Daniel Tan. Director of Observatories for Appalachian State claims that people see the lights around dramatic temperature changes because they're seeing ball lightning. So ball lightning, another possible Good morning, just woke up. One of the Hello, how, how are you, Karam Serum? For a few seconds at a time, it can look like a sphere, or like uh, a sphere, excuse me, floating through the air. Bogs are sort Natural of a thing up here. Uh, don't uh, don't follow strange here, lights if you want to come back alive. Saint Hello. Fire, from sharp I think streamer fund uh, slash com slash CW is a bot. Can be explained by science. Local historian Mike I think they're a bot. His, I have no idea how to say his last name. <laughs> I have a, I have a suspicion that they're a bot. C H E S S E R. Fisher sir. Fisher Fisher sir. It's like a, I don't know. It's I don't know how the hell you say that. Uh, and it wasn't anywhere online in a in a in a like actual video or something or audio form. Fisher. So I'll say, I'll say, I'm just going to call him Mike. <laughs> Mike F. Mike F. And Daniel Catan did their best to get to the bottom of what these lights may be. I mean, I don't know what you guys think. I think, I think they're light. a bot. And while they're, while they were able to find rational reasons. Getting that bot vibe. Science, they found three I'm getting it too. Could not be I don't like, science. I don't like banning First, people. Told by someone who wanted to remain anonymous was two but, uh, reliable witnesses from Morganton. And it's not Morgantown. Morganton saw a bright light as bright as an ATV headlight coming down. All of a sudden, it crossed the uh, river toward the Weissman's View Overlook. It's Second streamer fund under, uh, under slash con under slash CW. So he looked over the edge, saw uh, what he thought was a you know ball lightning. I think that Covered that's a bot. Him. I don't know why we do this, but reached out, touched it, felt like he stuck his finger in a light socket, and he was not alone. Six eyewitnesses apparently saw him do this. Uh, if ball, sus, ball lightning, uh, so lightning, be it. Uh, yes. Lightning ball to A, hover that low. That is my air, thought. A, hover for so long in one place that he would have time to reach out and touch it. And C, not hurt him more seriously if he did touch it. Right. Uh, the third unexplained encounter, they discovered uh, the most famous. Hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, pushed up my uh, well, captured a stuff, which image of the brown means. Light. The path the light traveled made a sharp light, uh, let's, a shape let's like a save. question mark. Because of the time lapse uh, of the camera, save. I'll show this picture in a little bit here. He claims to have seen a uh, They followed, but didn't message. Uh, so it's sus. It is very sus. Uh, it says they followed, and uh, then uh, my follower count didn't go up at all. So let me double check. Appearing too close to the ground. Moving in ways that seem Might just be premature, but I think it's Some a bot. Claim the lights have followed them through the woods that they appear I think it's a bot because bots Paranormal follow then unfollow, which is just to get people to look at their uh, put him on the path their uh, stuff. Becoming a paranormal investigator, he said he saw balls of red light twinkling over him, then watched as the lights climbed through the trees and ascended into the sky. He since spent years researching possible scientific explanations for what he saw, and he can't find any answers. Burke County Travel and Tourism Director Ed Let's Phillips see. Let's double check. With these lights. It's One better to be safe than mountain. sorry. The pair sat on lawn chairs for 45 minutes, suddenly saw a light appear in front of them at eye level, hovered in the air, unmoving for mm. several moments, and then they both said they saw uh, the same thing at the same time and then just shot out and just disappeared. Hmm. Ed Phillips held two symposia in 2012, where various experts discussed their theories about the lights and saw and some Forest Service officers shared some of their previously publicly untold stories. Retired U.S. Forest Service officers Les Burrell mm. and C.W. Smith later spoke about their encounters as part of a TV special on the Brown Mountain Lights, stories they originally shared at this uh, these symposia. C.W. said, I wasn't really interested that much in the Brown Mountain Lights. We were there responding to a call. I never really looked for the Brown Mountain Lights, and all of a sudden, Les and I 
uh, at approximately the same time saw a light. I said, you see that light over there? He said, yes. Left, I saw an actual light come up about 30 minutes off the outcropping, and it just illuminated right there, CW. A few seconds later, there was another one, and he said, that can't be anybody. And then Les said, and it looked like an indistinct candle, and then it just diminished all the way down and went out. And CW says, it just kind of catches know. you by surprise, and you just think, well, I don't know anything about it. Because Les is going to think better I'm safe not. than sorry, go. This shit it has been so an issue for recent months. Oh, I like know. Several other officers, one incident, I the know. Lights passed directly over his car. Uh, he thought they were a shooting star or a meteor shower, but then realized lights weren't far above him. They were close. It says they and followed. They to his car for an extended period of time. It says in, in my followers list so that they're there. Uh, in July I don't know. I just Daniel Katana, I'm getting a seeking suspicion. Just don't click on their name. Local news outlets. This is the first time Just in case, don't protection. click on their name. Both cameras. Mm. Uh, it was something out if, there. If you're Came real, on, went back off, you can let us know. Four times over several minutes. We've eliminated all the things that are likely man-made natural sources, so we're left with no real explanation other than it's whatever the lights may actually be. Second time he encountered the lights happened when Daniel was returning from Asheville for a project. An object appeared before him brighter than Venus and remained still for a long period of time, possibly up to 20 minutes. Daniel Catan still doesn't fully understand what true brown mountain lights are, he says. He's determined to get to the bottom of it, supernatural or not. While most of the encounters can be explained by naturally occurring scientific phenomena, some still cannot be explained. So what are they? Unusual they time for you to go high. Hey, oh, heart. Upstate North Carolina. How weird. Just one after another. Mm -hmm. But one uh, after another. I'm going to have you cover for me. I did drink a bunch of water. What do you mean? <laughs> I know. You're... <clears throat> Um, what do you yeah, mean so unusual time to go uh, live? Did it say I went live over again? Over and that no one's gotten to the bottom of it. Which I've like been live this whole time. Sort of I haven't. My stream hasn't no dropped at all. Explanation for it. By this, at this point, we would have it. Don't you think? Yeah, I, it, it's just weird. It, this was a hard story to kind of Ooh, put into a good. Loving the colors, uh, like, Haven. Loving the no colors. Narration in this story. It's just a series. There's just so many little like. I don't know what this light was. Mm -hmm. I think this light followed me. And then it's like, and, and the pictures are kind of all over the map. It just, I can't think of like coming across a similar story like that, where like the the accounts of the lights aren't consistent. Sometimes they move. It sometimes says I went move. live twice. Sometimes it's so sometimes weird. Red, sometimes they're blue. It's just, it's just weird. I wonder if it's like an alien hotspot. Hmm. I mean, if I had to pick like one UFO, thing. That, that seems like the most probable yeah ever? out of, out of, out of hmm. possible paranormal explanations it seems like you, unless UFO they speak up it is know. us it's so weird. i just it's uh just got another uh notification you were live the train i was like oh yeah of course what the train. Of course the train it's so weird i have been live this whole morning. time and the stream did on. not drop i guess aliens maybe that would make sense like maybe they'd be following the string didn't drop at all quiet right mm -hmm. like, okay, i don't get well, it let's see if i'm from another planet i'm trying to learn what people on this planet do and i guess it would make sense that they would zoom down and then oh look at those train tracks it's like, you know, like, i don't know i don't know because it was going in that direction i don't know it's weird i'll show, I'll show uh, you a few pictures okay and i know that wasn't the i guess story, twitch is sometimes just, um, like that yeah yeah just to kind of show what I, I, I like stories sometimes that are about possibilities of other things that might be out there and just those well, I, I think it's introducing a different concept mm -hmm. right because it's like no one no one says it is, yeah. or is it, to me i don't hear anybody saying oh i definitely think it's this it just sounds like everyone keeps going i don't know well yeah and some of them people do throw explanations they're like uh it could be these bioluminescence you know organic compounds decaying which could describe like a, some kind of life but you wouldn't necessarily but you wouldn't see that kind of light far off in the distance yeah. as a clear shape right i don't well, know i don't know i i took that also to sound like it would be more over when you were saying something about decay mm -hmm. is that i'm like well then that would imply that there was something dead in that area yeah but and and, and, and it, it doesn't sound like anybody's like digging around looking to see like okay are there like animals or something animal carcasses or, or trees or, oh, i guess trees yeah i didn't think about that i, mean, I was thinking of like a, a yeah animal. no uh, oh, yeah. uh and, and plants can that. also have it's decay like, okay, all well, the time that's happening there and also in bogs so, that no uh, that about, normally like, happens dying in this area than dying i can actually see it happen so if there's uh, lots of light sightings because of that phenomena there, 
it would uh, make sense to me that there would be. They talked about the these ghost lights a lot. And in fact, uh, no, ghost lights are I mean, also in, in the Lord of the Rings yeah. uh, thing so of like, like, don't follow it in bogs and stuff like that. That's a well known right, right. phenomenon. Right. Yeah. People are like, well, we don't know what it, what's happening. It's like, it's okay. probably yeah. just yeah. fucking yeah. decay. Yeah. Makes sense. It's like, I just can't uh, believe it's decay. It's like, like yeah, okay, you don't believe and, science uh, is happening. All right, like a, fair enough. Kind of a popular photo of just, you know, some of those, obviously, are stars above. Yeah. Hope you're doing well, heart. Distance, mm -hmm. But people to say that, uh, you know, some of those a little bit lower. The Hope everything's going well for you. Houses. I uh, uh, am on yeah, page two. So just an Hooray. example of lightning. Hooray. Lightning strike. It's just that, um. I guess sometimes people will say it'll just kind of like stay lit up like that. That's so pretty. It kind of yeah, looks like a, like a like uh, a like a planet, mm -hmm. if you right, or you like, like Saturn. The heavens opening up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't exactly. believe the science. Don't really believe bad. the science. Cool. Oh, you remind me of those. Do you remember those um, electricity balls? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's put your what hands on. Up. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And then this last one is that. Charles Hope you're Rock, doing good Brown today. Rose, famous Brown Mountain Lights photo. This is that one of like the question mark shape. Hope yeah. you're feeling like good. Time lapse photo where he said this little thing was kind of like moving through the air and just moving in oh my in gosh. unique ways. It looks. So I am good. Had fun at mm -hmm. karaoke. Nice. So and I'm back, falling, kind of. You know, like That's okay, Floof. Nice. Thank you for being back. Be Thank you for coming back, back like for that. just a minute. I, that, that I understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you for so, just hanging out with us no, when you can. Um, I was excited when you said Kataba. Yeah. Because so far, you Grove and Cleveland, if you it's live looking Cleveland, good, you go looking nice. Well, like, it's like coming together. And it's just like, uh, it's just a Make that part. into a Basically. shadow, going it's into it, and place. stuff like that. Uh, yeah, like, how would I explain it? It's a little town or Of like, place? bam, bam, bam. Problem. I haven't been to Sandusky. Out, so it's in Sandusky. Of like, and all the shapes and there. stuff like that. Is that a town? Yeah. Okay. It's like where Cedar Point is. Okay. Where I took Monroe. Right, it's, it's like it's like park, Cleveland, yeah. Sandusky, Cincinnati. Okay, okay. Sandusky is a city. Um, but I haven't been to Catawba since I was like sixteen or seventeen, and the last time I was there was the first time I ever. Yeah, a bit hangry. And it did not. Oh go well. no! Uh -huh. uh, but I not feeling. Uh, not neighbor, feeling eating. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh -huh. and, if you're hangry, uh, you're, you're not you like, when you're hangry. So I'm trying to remember, like, oh, you're yeah, not you like, when you're hungry. Campgrounds, but not tent camping. Maybe like maybe there were RVs, and then also like stationary. Um, That's what I always say. You're not you, you when know you're those hangry. Home parks would they, but they're yes. stationary, like they're just like the long houses. I I don't know what you're trying to say. You don't um, know? Do you not know what I'm talking about? I, you're talking about campers. I understand what like a camper right. is. I, I said okay. So sometimes at a campground, yeah, you pull in and there's kind of like two parts to it. There's the part where people come and go. There, uh, if you're traveling in your RV, yeah, okay, so that's like one side of the park, okay, <laughs> okay, and then and <laughs> I, I, I don't, I didn't grow up around these same kind of campgrounds, so that might be part of it, so oh, I'm yeah. a little confused. Yeah, you're what, looking at me like I'm talking about something that doesn't exist. I, I, yeah, I, I can't understand, okay, well, let me, just because I'm you want explaining me to. it to you. Yeah. I don't, I'm just telling you what it is. Yeah, I'm yeah, not I'm asking trying. you I'm if trying. it's a thing, I'm telling you it is a thing. I know, I'm listening. okay, so that's one side <laughs> of it, and so then the other side of it is like, um, if you sort of think about like a, um, a, a prefab home, yes, but they're. And, so, and then they're like on the other side, but they're not like high up. They're not built on basements. They're just kind of thrown down on a slab. Huh, okay. So it's, it would just be like, um, it's very much like they have these in Florida. where just people spend some time there. It's not their forever home. So Catawba, put in bay it's just hmm. like this like little like party island yeah. thing. And you would just go up there. And the point of it is to go up there and just drink and be fucked up all summer long. That's what people would do. Oh, and so you just rent one of those little things for the summer? Yeah, you could, oh, yeah, I'm sure you could own one as well. Oh, okay. And so I yeah, think yeah, like yeah. some people would, uh, like I said, I mean. Don't I'm, follow the lights. I'm almost. They are fell and maybe even I like, couldn't save you there. Yeah. 20 years ago. Uh, if I'm not me, I, when I'm ha hangry, like, who am I? I should ask my buddy you know, that's no uh, that's a question that uh, the that the Stickers commercials oh, yeah. never uh, bring up. That's where you go. A lot of Who am I? Happen out there. Uh, yeah, you you could get jet skis. You go out on the lake. I mean, I guess you're you're around. angry person okay. or something like that. Like that. Excited when you said that. Because how was the place? Sometimes you, uh, you could be one of those yeah, like it, the stickers okay, commercial well, people. No, I want to hear, okay. hear this longer. I would love it if they went story. full crazy. Because I, I think they, I they grab a lot of uh, famous actors well, like and actresses. Oh, okay. So my so thought is, 
Okay, what if they so went be full many, nutso you know, and like got an actual like right serial death, killer as one of their? It's like ah, soothing. It's like oh yeah. man, and also, you're not you when you're hungry. Is, oh, like just go really good, full crazy. Chakra, which is like what makes you feel uh, oh dear, makes you feel grounded. You uh huh. Mm -hmm. It's the foundation for life. Okay. Red jasper can like. Give you some sense of protection. It can help like tap into your dreams. Um, it can help with your sexual vibrancy. Wow, who knew that rock could do so much? It's not a rock, is, isn't it? Crystal. Because a lot of those commercials are kind of like fever dreams. Does sound nicer. Yeah, that's why I like it. <laughs> do you want to borrow it? So no? why not actually have a murdering <laughs> sociopath uh, uh, as one of the people? Uh, like, the, um, oh yeah. Damn, uh, Jim. Black Layla. Black Layla Jim, you're not like you when you're hungry. So. Mm. A, a very cool and he's got like a co-ed and he, he's strangling like, her and then it's like he eyes, gets a Snickers and, and he's like, oh, I'm, black, I'm so black, sorry black, about that. And he heart? just walks mm -hmm. away. Does it, does it smell? No, that's very yeah, dark. So that's a very uh, dark uh, imagery, uh, but it's very funny to me. Yes. Oh, man. He doesn't even know what she smells like anymore. Um, see, we haven't, I, every once in a while, we'll do, like, just one big, long story on my side. Mm -hmm. Love um, that one with Robin so Williams. Yeah. And oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, go down, yeah. And, uh, go down the rabbit hole with this person. And, uh, you know, his, uh, I wonder if his daughter Zelda ever yeah, actually, uh, corroborated in, in different places at different times in his life. Which I if really uh, she actually like, oh, okay. uh, became an actress, he wasn't like oh he was just a kid, he was just having nightmares or like I don't think oh, uh, I wouldn't think she like, would just, just because of like, like how famous her father was. Too. Oh, okay, that's a, yeah, that always um, adds to the credibility of these stories. I wouldn't yeah, blame her either. Like I would think that if I. If, Just if like Will house, Smith uh, pushing like, his family to towards it, we it's obviously house, not healthy. House. Yeah. Generally speaking, you're not going to think it's you. You're right, going to think right. it's the place that you're at. And then if you left and you went somewhere else, and maybe you're living there for like a year, and it's like, ah, oh, everything's fine. And then it comes back. Yeah, that's always the, the worst. You're like, oh, shit, it is me. <laughs> right, the attachments. Yeah. You feel like you can't get away from it. Oh, my God. I feel like I would end up moving a few it's times before I really believe it was me. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think if I went to the next place, I'm like, well, okay, if we're experiencing the same thing in another place, not that, you know, d outside of just the first place, it's us. Yeah. What if it's, what if something's happening, but it's diff a different kind of thing that's happening? Would you still think it's you or would you think it's the place? I guess you just think it's like really bad luck. Like, mm. dang it, you got two places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would really not want it to be me. So I think I would just keep yeah, yeah. moving I see that. and searching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Greetings to the hosts of my brand new favorite podcast. Oh, thank you. I know, so nice. I thought it was really great that you guys take in stories from people who have had their own strange occurrences. This really inspired me to share some of my own. I'm not sure if it'll turn out to be a great story in the usual sense, having a beginning, middle, and end, because these events have been happening consistently and spread out over more than a decade. Wow. Well, anyways, here we go. About uh, When I was about 15 years old, my brother, mother, and I moved in with my grandparents. My uncle and his two children were also living there. In total, there were eight of us living in a small three-bedroom, one-bath ranch-style home. Ugh. My grandparents had their own room. My uncle and his, had his own. My brother, cousin Alex, and I shared one small bedroom, and my mother and cousin Erica had beds in the basement. Needless to say, it was pretty tight living conditions. My brother and cousin shared bunk Pretty beds, tight. and I slept on a trundle mattress, which we could slide beneath the bunk beds during the day. It was at this house that I became tormented by some kind of entity. It started off slow, as these things usually do. Generally, it was just a sense of someone being with you, even if there was no one else in the room. I had to set up. I had set up my Xbox in the basement. How's mother? Good. Uh, she is time. recovering quite uh, fast. One day, while I was mindlessly playing. I felt three very firm taps on my shoulder, thinking that maybe my brother had come down while I was zoned out into the game. I she is said, yeah. uh, doing a lot better Except than what she was, was uh, which was uh, horrible. Truly anyone was uh, there. See anyone. Hopefully I she is getting out my game down and this week. Hopefully uh, the schedule keeps on rolling and she gets out Sometimes this week. I wake up at night 
and sensed that someone was pacing around in our small bedroom, and on more than one occasion, I would see the silhouette of someone at the foot of my bed. I was afraid of sounding crazy, but the fear got to a point where I felt as though I had to mention it to my family. One night at dinner, I did just that. Very casually, I asked if anyone... Yeah, my brother's seeing her today, so hopefully that's good. I figured Zelda oh, probably uh, wants to be her own I thing, wouldn't you? Yeah. Seeing and feeling, and she told good me to hear. Yeah, it's always good to hear. She would occasionally see a always good to know loved ones are uh, being taken care of. It was almost always out of the corner of her vision, but she had seen it enough times and in enough locations down there to suspect that it wasn't just a trick of the light. My uncle chimed in that he had been hearing someone walking through the house in the middle of the night. Hearing this from them both terrified me and put me at ease all at the same time. On the one hand, I wasn't crazy. Other people were experiencing similar things as me. But then on the other hand, this meant that there really was something in the house and I seemed to be its favorite. The entity only became more aggressive from there. Sometimes I would be walking through the kitchen and I would feel this incredible force rush up behind me and I would visibly flinch expecting to be tackled to the ground or attacked in some way. The more my fear grew, the more oppressive it became. One night, I went into the bathroom to take a shower, and as I began to undress, I heard the high-pitched sound of a woman laughing. I thought maybe my cousin was playing a trick on me, and then suddenly the shower curtain was forcefully thrown aside, revealing no one in the shower. I grabbed my things and uh, I grabbed I grabbed my things to get dressed and ran from the bathroom. My brother, mother, and I eventually moved out of my grandparents' house and into our own apartment. I was so incredibly relieved to be leaving there. I loved my grandparents, and I intended to keep going back to visit them, but knowing I was free to leave there whenever I chose felt so comforting. After Nip on blade! I decided to ask my grandparents how things had been going. Hello, travelers. Let me tell life. you a tale about an uh, oh-so-brave warrior, Goat Chimera the Brave. No, she lost her father as uh, much as... Left. I look Whenever up to Robin. That's not fair to her as a person. It is not. She is a wonderful. If it wasn't attached to that, he was a wonderful actor who brought uh, laughter and joy to ev a lot of people's lives. I had another experience. I'm embarrassed to admit that I'm a terrible. Oh no 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 no! We were just uh, we were just talking about uh, the Snickers commercial. Several items were strewn across. It was a tangent. You're fine, Nate. Uh, Napalm. Uh, Napalm Blade. And it was about Robin Williams and his Snickers commercial. There was a street light almost directly next to my window, and I kept the shades open at night to illuminate my room. I didn't care how bright it got. I was not comfortable with the darkness. With this light beaming through my window, six, I could clearly see that there was no one in my room. The sounds still continued, however. I could hear the items on my floor being shuffled be as if right someone were walking here. through my room, and the sounds were getting closer. Whatever it was was walking towards my bed. I stared wide-eyed, trying to get a sense of what was happening when the noises stopped, and, and the right at the foot of my bed, suddenly the corner sagged down as if someone had sat on it. I could barely breathe. I was in such horror. I never took my eyes off the corner of that bed as I slowly pulled my feet in closer to me and wedged myself into the corner as tight as I could. The corner of the bed stayed sagged down, but even with my fright, sleep eventually won out. I woke up that morning still wedged into the corner and immediately looked over at the corner of my bed where something had been sitting. It was no longer sagging down. Fast forward several years. I'm dating this woman, and we were staying at her parents' house for a little bit. They have a beautiful finished basement with a pull-out couch where we slept at night. One night, after we'd gone to bed, I abruptly awoke. I wasn't in bed. Oh, Robin Williams? Yes, blankets, yes, yes. But instead, I was standing on the side yes, yes, of yes. the bed. I was incredibly confused and began looking around the basement, trying to figure out why I would have gotten out of bed. Nothing seemed to be out of place, so I turned to go back into bed and suddenly froze. There was someone in my spot. It wasn't just anyone, though. It was me. I was standing next to the mm. bed, looking down at myself, sleeping. Uh. As my mind struggled to comprehend what the hell was happening, I saw movement on the other side of the pull-out couch. Peering through the dimly lit darkness, I realized there was a man crouching down and attempting to hide behind the couch. Ice raced through my veins, and every hair on my body stood up. Suddenly, I was awake and in bed, throwing the blankets off of me so I could get up and defend us from that strange man that I had seen. 
It was still dimly lit, but I could see that no one was there. I still ran over and flicked on all of the lights just to double check that we were truly alone down there. This obviously panicked my girlfriend, but I couldn't really explain what had just happened, and I didn't want to freak her Thank out. Thank you. Nice job on the perspective like, in the uh, uh, cobblestone. Hatman alert. I know. Fucking Hatman. Hatman gets you every fucking time. Watch the out. They had collected all of the you bet. Oh, watch out. I could carry the enormous basket of clothes downstairs. Space I made my way downstairs. As I was nearing the bottom step, I saw Little movement out of the corner of my space. eyes and instinctively turned in that Don't direction. Don't mess around Floating with there, the space ball. Was a ball of blue light. Well, this was new. I stood there for a few seconds, just watching it to see what it was I noticed that although it appeared to be a ball of light, if you're living in a bubble and, and you haven't got a other kid, experiences, this didn't da -da -da -da. It floated there for maybe da -da -da -da. 10 seconds or so and then slowly collapsed in on itself. We're gonna until it was destroy a little bit of it. We were gonna get a little bit of basket down on the ground and ran back up the stairs. We will win. We just got it. What we need to know, we do it. So we did. They came downstairs with me, determined to debunk my experience, but were unable to find anything that could have generated a floating ball of blue light. We didn't stay at her parents' house for much longer after that, and I returned to my apartment. This was where I was to meet the most aggressive entity to date. As I lie in bed one night, I again woke up abruptly and found myself standing next to my bed. Recognizing that this had happened before, trying to make down, a sure a enough, bit of a interesting like beginning. Previously, when this had happened, I had seen a man crouching behind the couch in my girlfriend's parents' house. So, with that in mind, I was a little on edge as to what I might see this time. I stood there next to my bed and listened as intently as I could as I scanned the room. Again, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I was still incredibly fearful of the dark. And at this time, I would use the screensaver on my laptop to illuminate my room at night. It wasn't exceptionally bright, but bright enough for me to mm -hmm. see. I noticed that all of the dark patches within my room, the corner at the far end, appeared to be abysmally dark. I miss him too. It bothers me that he went out uh, that light. way, but Even it was his choice. Watch out, there are two legged way. animals walking about. It, There's space spells! When suddenly, a face Watch emerged out. from the darkness. Oh my god. It was a sickly pale color with a large bulging forehead, absolutely no nose, and it was um, smiling at me. I couldn't move. I mean, I as far as I heard, he was. His smile widened, and I knew you know, that he saw me. He was in a lot of pain, and him. like uh, from what the they found uh, in his brain, uh, brain bed, stuff, and all that. You know, the frightening face you know, the inky blackness that he had emerged from. I spent it was a lot of stuff on after that. Just like the experience, it was a I lot of um, like quickly. It suddenly did a lot of things that were going on, and we just didn't know. Whatever it was, you know, from the foot of my bed to the side of my bed, its presence was so overpowering. I could tell exactly where it was as it moved about. Many times, I would make up in the middle of the night, and again, I would hear something whisper from that same corner. My fear continued to grow. And I mean, he wasn't as far as I, uh, from the uh, from the timeline uh, that was uh, brought out, you know, what happened to him, he just deteriorated and, you know, his brain, he was going through a very, like, thing that, you know, a lot of people don't go through. When she stayed over that night, I let her have the side closest to the wall, hoping to shield her in case the entity made any moves. We had just settled into bed when I heard that same whisper from the corner. I chose not to acknowledge it or even ask my girlfriend if she heard it. I really didn't want to scare her. Suddenly, I could feel the presence at the side of the bed again as it began to pace back and forth. Yeah. I continued to I mean, ignore it, but for some reason, I don't even think it was that. I, I felt someone. We have to listen to the time suck feet. on it because I there is a time suck on it. In any way, I could even feel it smiling at me as it knew it was scaring oh, me. Fucking hat enjoyment. man! I don't know how, but fuck I you, hat sleep. man! The next morning, we woke up early, even though I hadn't slept particularly well. We made breakfast and coffee and sat down to eat. My girlfriend looked like she had something on her mind, and so I asked if she was okay. She looked a little embarrassed and said, okay, I was probably dreaming, and I don't want to freak you out. This is a very weird perspective, but I like it. Night? 
all of the hairs in my body stood up, and as calmly as possible, I asked her to describe what she heard. I'm not entirely sure. I was just about to fall asleep, and I swear I heard someone say, Psst, <laughs> hey, or something like that, she said. I could have cried right there. Just like at my grandparents' house, having someone else that had experienced what I had been hearing made me feel like I wasn't crazy after all. I felt validated. I told her about everything I had been seeing and hearing and feeling, even describing the sensations of being poked and, cra and grabbed that previous night. She didn't have much to say, which isn't surprising. I mean, what do you say to that? Don't take this the wrong way, she did say, but I'm probably not going to stay over here for a while. I didn't blame her. She was scared, and so was I. Unlike me, she had the option of leaving while I was stuck there. Things, be things came to a head there soon after. I was in my room folding clothes and putting them away when the pressure in the room became overwhelming and intense. It was there for me. I could feel it. I continued to go about my routine even as I felt it standing next to me. It was so close to me. I could feel it just inches away moving with me as I moved, its face inches from the side of my face. The pressure was tremendous, and I know it was smiling again. I don't know how I could feel it smiling, but I knew it was. I couldn't take it anymore. I jumped on my bed and huddled into the corner. It began to pace up and down the side of my bed quickly and impatiently. Something in my brain finally snapped at that point, and instead of fear, all I felt was rage. This was my home. I was entitled to feel safe here. The thing, whatever uh, time it was, suck. was yeah. an intruder. I intended to kick it out. Stop it. I'm not aware of this phrase. Perspective. Uh, some of the funniest Stop. people I've ever this known have led tragic lives. Yeah, from what I've heard, it wasn't the best. His uh, beginning life was not the best. But, um, uh, Time Suck is what we listen to all the time. It's the, uh, the radio I've been listening to. This is Bad Magic Productions, uh, Scared to Death. But he also does a thing of time suck where uh, literally he uh, goes through a timeline and figures fig we figure it out together. This was the last major incident I'd had. It's been five or six years now, and I've moved just as many times. I'm clear across the country now, far, far away from all of those frightening memories. In all of the places I've lived since, there have always been some kind of activities, but generally the passive kind. Something will somehow tip over or move out of the blue on its own. The sense that I'm not quite alone will occasionally happen, but never in an oppressive way. It's much more peaceful now, but I do worry about the next time things begin to escalate. Sincerely yours, John. Wow. That is a crazy tale. <laughs> Isn't it, though? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a bunch of thoughts. I made a bunch of little notes but one thing i was thinking there towards the end is how great it would be if just you could just yell at stuff and it would just listen to you and go away but but you can mm, not i mean there's been no there's been plenty of stories where that doesn't work <laughs> plenty of stories there's a whole like bunch of exorcisms and everything where they have to get people to come over and all that stuff and they're yelling like go away and get out right and but it sometimes stays. it does work right but what i was gonna say is it would be nice if every time oh, i see yeah 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 that worked where just where was that easy you know right, you're having right. some crazy affliction you're just like get out of here and the thing was just like, oh, all right. I wish you could just put a sign up on your door like, no demons welcome here. <laughs> right, so right. You're like, oh, dang it. Let's yep. try the neighbor. Like if it was that easy. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. That's a, he's lucky it worked for him. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then just like that crazy thing. I mean, it was like corroborated, but that just looked like the weird whisper. I know. Just that, Psh, hey. Hey. <laughs> Can you imagine? No. And then like coming out of that like darker area than the surrounding lights. But it did. I had a weird thought with that where – um. You know, we tend to get like kind of like binary thinking, I think, with um, spirits where it's like it's malevolent and it's like the most evil and dark mm -hmm. and, you know, wh horrifying or it's totally good mm -hmm. and harmless and almost like a like a just a, you know, the ghost of a lost little boy mm -hmm. or, or, or whatever or a relative. And then there's like this whole middle ground of it can be like kind of a dick, but not totally a dick. Like, <laughs> like, like or what if they're just like weird and quirky? Yeah. yeah. Like, I just pictured like, you know, like what if it's playing a practical joke? Yeah, and just a nut. Like, there's plenty of nutty, weird people where it's like maybe you work in an office, right. which, you know, Ted is just an odd guy. Right. Cool name. Has uh, need 10,000 more points to get this sketch. Oh, man. Floofy Stone. You, you gotta be so here more. You, or you, find you gotta like get that sketch. Only makes sense to him. <laughs> And, you know, Are you describing our son? Get that sketch. 
I don't know <laughs> how many are like, even yeah. close to a but sketch. Like, I know Haven and, like, and Nix are uh, in sketch, uh, know, sketch yeah. sketch yeah. zone. So of, like, They're person in choosing to save their like points. A weird nut who shows right. up like, hey, hey, come here. But they don't have like a follow They're choosing to save right, their right. points like, uh, this, for this uh, weird, not sketch. You know what? I don't like this head right there. I'm going to get rid of it. But I'm like, why is it? Why is it whispering? Or why is it doing? They're uh, they're right in. Well, I think it, they're in me, land of at, sketch, just, but they uh, are going to uh, choose not like to sketch. Stuff, is that oftentimes, if you don't, there is a theory that if you don't acknowledge it, mm -hmm. it it will go away on its own because yeah. you're giving energy to it. So if you don't feed into it, it's not getting what it needs from you or wants from you, and it will move on. Yeah. So. If someone is trying to get your attention um, because that's what they just need, putting a lot of right. shit on the walls of like what people would have at a like, see you, little uh, a literal bar in the, bar in the, in the middle of nowhere yeah. like yeah. what uh, would be I mean, if it was like that's been following him his whole life it's like at this point it's, it's also a place where they put their storage and shit like that yeah but he's like like garbage I, I just, hose I just like, I mean, and stuff have, like um, that obviously wanted attention or, or taking energy or however you want to phrase it but i just this is the first one that i can think of mm -hmm. where we've, we've heard probably like, also going to use this wall like, I, I just, multiple like, times like, that part is super funny to me i mean yeah. i know it was not funny for john oh yeah i'm sure it wouldn't be funny if it happened to you but i just now I just yeah i need so uh, uh yeah like, uh, i need like to be here entity in the background mm, it's yeah. there will be this, more uh, than a uh a sketch and I just, it just uh, there is like almost like being uh, you don't immediately acknowledge it or you don't there is more than a right sketch but it's just sitting there it's just like come on, there is <laughs> come on, come uh, on. And then he just gets tired of waiting he's like just, hey I'm a scary thing. Let's come see. On, where is it? Where is, uh, oh, how man. many points if is only, it? If only it felt like that. I, the it's, uh, part me give me a name and is up and uh, what, what it's called. In his own bed. Mm, yeah, that. That reminded me of a... Oh, buddy, I did not care for that. That's like, to me, that's like a weird, like, out-of-body doppelganger situation. Yeah, well, there's that phenomenon that some people believe in called astral projection. Oh, yeah. And that would, and that could, it could be this. I mean, that's yeah. what they say is like that, you know, you're, I mean, essentially, without like, you know, going way into it, I mean, people, some people believe that you're, basically your soul, your essence can come out of your physical body. So, and nice it's and where like, people it's like a, almost like can literally give me a name, dream, but your dream is you, you know, for this world, comic, that, like, you know, hey, you we know, named a character after you, or we named a, a yeah, town. Has powers he's unaware of. <laughs> Insidious. Antlers, is, uh, fish you know, mantle, uh, weapon projection. bottles hanging from the ceiling, the holes in the wall, yeah. pictures yeah. of previous yeah. owners. Yeah, that's where I'm. Uh, that's where I'm going. So scary. Yeah. That I don't want to. So like, let my brain go there too much. Yeah, I don't want to spoil it for those who haven't seen it. Like dishes and other things like that. Like old. Like dishes and other things. Close your ears for ten seconds. Yeah. Because this is but, I mean, this is a, a is hobble in, in the middle of nowhere. Astral projecting at night, and when he's gone, mm -hmm. that allows something else to come into the his body. Like yeah. if he doesn't get back in time, like it's opening up. He he he. Uh, yeah, I, I can. Yeah, I, okay. I know what you're uh, um, I've seen it. This is a mining um, town. Is, is like this, it's. I don't know if you know this about astral projection because I don't really know a lot about it. Is the theory that when you leave your body, that always leaves it open for something else to come in, or is that would, just the premise of that movie? I think that's just the premise of that. Movie. The only okay. antlers okay. I would I, put in would be like. About astral projection. I get the. the definitely process, something like I don't this. Want to dive into because then I feel like. I'm either going to go down this, like, nerdy wormhole, and there's yeah. going to be a lot of science stuff, and I'm going to be like, wait, what's that no. word mean? Like, I'm going to lose a lot of my, yeah. you know, like, along the way. And then also, it's just like, if it little is, hobble. I know there are loads of people who oh, it. Oh, uh, like, beards on the wall. Um, beards. But I just also, like, if that is a thing, 99 beards on the wall, 99 bottles of beards. Well, there's no agreed upon, I mean, because it is that paranormal, mm -hmm. you know, uh, part of the paranormal world. There is no science behind astral projection that uh, actually hold the structure like, together. Right. So, like, like, or like no, it's, it's if you want to be a part of this, uh, a uh, 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 part of the comic, you works, you you look at ten I say you if you guys stay mm -hmm. in yeah, this like in this cool chat room this for be. long yeah. enough to be in to get enough points to name something in the comic, you you fucking deserve it at that point. Like you literally deserve it at that point. 
He's got a yeah. doppelganger, and like he's waking up and seeing his doppelganger lying. You you right. spent right. long enough yeah. to be here, like, and you deserve dead, to be an like, awesome person that keeps coming in. Like if you combine those uh, no, there's right? not going to be <laughs> bottles of Capri Sun. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Do like, apologize. Ah, I just could have gone sideways real fast. <laughs> Uh, while I, while I'm thinking of movies, I I did finish. I think I mentioned on the previous episode the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix. It's been Holy, uh, oh, forty yeah, thousand more for me to go. And just and you know, um, confirm for uh, Chimera for first. Okay. It's not that scary. I mean, if you want to put a Napalm like, Blade, we'll talk about it. But it's not supposed. We shall talk about it. I'm not gonna rule it out. Okay. It, but, it, like, I I if you want to put like, your um, shit like in here, go for it. Vibe. If you oh, want to yeah, name a character, go people. for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. just, just, just a little bit more adult. Like, I'm not stopping you. Okay. Not much. That, any like, you like deserve to be a part of this project uh, just as much as anybody else. sexual scenes, no nudity or anything like that, but it's like... Innuendo? Not more than innuendo. It's uh, some people having sex. We don't, you don't see anything. Okay. But, but other than that, you know, that you've even uh, put in the time and effort again, to be just, uh, here, I like the, that. The that's really more well than that's enough nice. to uh, be a part of this uh, universe, this lived-in universe. A true American crime So like Napalm Blade. Impeachment. The the blade of Nepal. No, I, I said, yeah, well, it's a different kind of. <laughs> no, I want you to I, put I, a I, single I, I, red I, dead <laughs> pixel somewhere. Let's um, go. <laughs> you want me to put a single pixel like of red dead <laughs> in there? I would like to thank the following Annabelles for helping. Uh, I'm gonna say <laughs> that uh, no. To How about that? I, would like to I only have uh, 690. Davis, well, Napalm. Deadman, Rick better get a saving. Shayla Rivis. The deals and savings Emily are Peterson, now. Sarah Nieto, Megan Olufsen, Betsy Southall, Mark Lucas, Sarah Hughes, Jake Boss, Josh Mellinger, Sydney Spring, Dolan. All right. I'm going to say no on the uh, on that one. Few for, uh, few for me. I mean, I'm not putting a red dead pixel. I'm not putting a pixel of red dead in my in my thing. But I've been going at, uh, down for five hours, man. I've got page one done. Uh, all I need to do is sh the shading. Uh, and I've got, uh, and I'm already working on this. Looks pretty darn good so far. So it goes from this, this, bit, bit. Uh, I'm gonna sell NFTs on my MySpace. Dang. Damn, 56 hours. I know, right? <laughs> 56 hours, damn. How the time has flown. Man, you guys. Oh, man. Who needs enemies when I have friends like these? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, we got a few people that I can raid. Um, let's see, Raiden time, you have been busy go today, yes I have, who are we gonna raid? We got small town spells, we got enigmatism, what you guys feeling tonight? Or morning or whatever time it is for you guys. Come on, let me know. You're too damn talented, my boy. Oh, thank you. Uh it's it's morning. It's six uh thirty in the morning, yes. So let's go over here. 
Jordan. Jordan? McChungus Among Us. What? Annie? Napalm Blade. Uh, Raid. Raid Shadow Legends. Guys, thank you guys so much for being amazing. Jordan? Is that a person? I don't know why it didn't, uh, didn't make a sound. My face when go go. <laughs> Uh, time is a construct from my perspective. McChunkus Among Us, I don't, I don't know what you mean by Jordan. You just said Jordan, and I'm like, what? There is no Jordan. There is only Zool. Guys, gotta pick one so that I can, uh, I can end the stream, guys. <laughs> Come on. You can't just have... You can't just have silence. My face with Jordan. No! Stop it! You people are mean to me. So mean to me. I'll pick a person anyway. Alright. Small town spells it is. Bob, maybe? Well, McChunk and Smug is, uh, literally gave me money as, like, Jordan. Uh, I'm like, who's Jordan? And it's like, I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, 23 was Michael Jordan, Jersey number. Fucking Christ, I knew that was what you were going for. Jesus. I literally, I was like, he's not talking about Michael Jordan. He's not talking about Michael Jordan. He he is fucking talking about Michael Jordan. <sighs> anyway, thank you guys for coming in so much. You guys are incredible and amazing. I do appreciate you guys. LeBron's age? <laughs> huh? LeBron is like 30, isn't he? LeBron was like a big, uh, was... no, he's got to be like 40 because he was uh, popular when I was like young, right? Good night, good morning. I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of the answer that I have right now. I don't know. Stay amazing and awesome. The other greatest of all time. Yeah. Step Curry. Magic jo Johnson. <laughs> stay amazing. Stay positive. Stay awesome. You guys are all amazing. I will see you next time. Bye bye. I'm going to bed.